Your East West Highway, Maryland 410, the southbound lanes are closed. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or a stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and riding on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor the transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Due to an accident on 16th Street and East West Highway, Maryland 410, the southbound lanes are closed. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 
777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Due to an accident on 16th Street and East West Highway, Maryland 410, the southbound lanes are closed. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Due to an accident on 16th Street and East West Highway, Maryland 410, the southbound lanes are closed. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. 
Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should, che should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up to date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Due to an accident on 16th Street and East West Highway, Maryland 410, the southbound lanes are closed. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 AM, the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ, 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Watch for an accident on northbound Georgia Avenue, Maryland 97, past Bellabry Road, blocking two right lanes. Due to an accident, Warring Station Road is closed in both directions at Stony Bottom Road. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m.,
the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should, che should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and riding on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up to date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Watch for an accident on Northbound Georgia Avenue, Maryland 97, past Belbury Road, blocking two right lanes. Due to an accident, Warring Station Road is closed in both directions at Stony Bottom Road. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or a stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240 777 
We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Watch for an accident on northbound Georgia Avenue, Maryland 97, past Belbury Road, blocking two right lanes. Due to an accident, Warring Station Road is closed in both directions at Stony Bottom Road. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin and John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Watch for an accident on northbound Georgia Avenue, Maryland 97, past Belbury Road, blocking two right lanes. Due to an accident, Warring Station Road is closed in both directions at Stony Bottom Road. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. 
the new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. Seven four. Welcome to County Report this week. I'm Michael Bruin. Thank you for watching. As the outbreak of COVID-19 continued to evolve here in Montgomery County, County Executive Mark Elridge and the Council immediately held a press conference to present information and advice to county residents. As this thing develops, it's going to continue to evolve. And my experience over the last week or so is that things change every day and sometimes they change multiple times a day. And so people are going to have to expect uh, both the changing situation and an alteration of responses based on how the situation changes. I wanted to call this press conference because I want people to know that we're taking every precaution we can take to make the people of Montgomery County as safe as possible. Today on the press conference, it was confirmed that Montgomery County Public Schools will be closed for a two-week period beginning March 16th through March 27th. Over that two-week period, we are going to focus on providing extensive cleaning in all of our schools and facilities so that when we are disinfecting and cleaning the areas in which our students have used and preparing those areas for their return after March 27th. I'd also like to share that we've been collaborating with our county partners and community advocates to make necessities such as meals available for our students who are in need. We are coupling our current structures that we use in uh, cases like inclement weather and summer meals program and combining them with county resources to determine the best way to serve our students during this time. So those conversations are happening and we are preparing for that. We will share with our community and students the plan for educational activities and resources to utilize over the two week period that school is closed. We have planned to provide resources that are created specifically for elementary, middle and high school students. So we'll be sharing through our various communication methods exactly what those resources will be and how they will be accessed by all of our students. One of the things that was said in the press conference by the governor's office was that well you could use spring break to make up the days. We need to understand that we will figure that out with our associations, with our community, all of those things. We have days printed on our calendar that we use as makeup, and there's a whole system that we know well about how that works. So I just want people not to cancel any plans right now. We'll be back in touch with you soon, but just let us think through this and figure out what makes the most sense given where we are right now today, because as Mr. Elrich said, everything has been changing hourly. The county also created a special web page at montgomerycountymd.gov slash coronavirus to provide a number of resources including frequently asked questions, downloadable infographics, and videos from Montgomery County's health officer, Dr. Travis Gales. Overall, there's a host of recommendations that we have for folks. The biggest thing is washing hands, and I cannot underscore how important it is to wash your hands and practice good hand hygiene making sure you also wash surfaces that you come into contact with to minimize your exposure to germs, to minimize other folks' exposure to potential germs. Um, and what's interesting is the coronavirus, COVID-19, is highly susceptible to soap and water and standard you know, household cleaners. So cleaning those surfaces is important. If you are symptomatic, whether it's with coronavirus or some other illness, it's important to make sure that you seek your necessary medical care and get the treatment that you need so that you get better. But in that time that you're symptomatic and not feeling well, we do encourage you to minimize your exposure to other folks. And that could mean staying home from school, staying home from work, um, because that cuts down and prevents the spread of whatever you have to other folks. 
Uh, in addition, we also make sure that people understand, um, again, the risk factors associated <laughs> with it, you know, travel histories, those kinds of things, and certainly minimizing your contact with other people should they be symptomatic um, to cut down on your risk of exposure as well. Stay informed by using trusted sources for up-to-date information. And again, go to the county's webpage at montgomerycountymd.gov slash coronavirus to find out information on prevention techniques as well as links to the CDC and other resources. County Executive Mark Elrich says it's important people pay attention to the coronavirus without panicking. Elrich also said that there have been many issues with people being wary of their Asian American neighbors. But a disease doesn't care what your nationality is, and everyone is fighting this together. You know, I think it's really important that, that people pay attention to this. I mean, there's, um, we don't want people panicking. We don't want people, you know, feeling, you know, we've had issues with people thinking they don't want to be near their Asian neighbors and stuff like that. It's like really not necessary, and it's really not the source of the problem, and it's got a multinational you know, national dimension now. It's a disease, and once it's out there and people catch it, it doesn't care what your nationality is or where you came from. Uh, we're kind of all in this together. Coming up on County Report this week, the census is finally here. We'll tell you how to respond. And you've seen electric scooters around the county, and the council is now addressing some safety issues. Stay with us. County Report this week. We'll be right back. My grandma always says everyone counts. And everyone who lives with us is special. Like my aunt, who took me on my first bus ride to the library. Or my older cousin, who walked me to my first day of school. Even my mom's friend and her baby, who lived with us. The census informs funding for schools, roads, health care, and more. So count everyone in your home, including all children, on the 2020 census. It's your chance to help them for the next 10 years. You can respond online, by phone, or by mail. Shape your future. Start here. Learn more at 2020census.gov. Welcome back to County Report This Week. I'm Michael Bruin. All households should now start receiving an invitation to participate in the 2020 Census in the mail. So be on the lookout. We need all county residents to participate in the Census. The Census directly impacts how much federal funding the state of Maryland will receive over the next 10 years. And every Marylander not counted costs the state just over $18,000 per person over 10 years. Completing the Census is safe, private, and secure and a complete and accurate way of counting everyone living in your home can prevent Maryland losing millions of dollars in federal funding that supports programs that benefit our county. Funding to support programs such as Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program for Women, Infants, and Children, Medicaid, Children's Health Insurance Program, and Highway and Transportation Projects. The census can be completed online, by mail, or by phone. And I'm asking you for your support in fulfilling this important task so that we'll be better positioned to bring you the support and other services you need. Thank you. For more information and to complete the questionnaire, visit 2020census.gov. This week on the County Spanish Language Radio Show, we talked with the Census Lead Specialist for Montgomery County who encouraged people to respond to the Census. What people have been waiting for is finally here, 2020 census. So they're going to get their invitation this week. We are hoping, and I'm sure they are going to, open that letter and go online and complete the census form. And if they don't feel like doing it online, please then just give us a call and provide the information over the phone. But it's important that they do it because this county needs you to go online and complete the census form. We're excited. Our community are excited. It's excited. Uh, our leaders are excited. The county executive is excited. All of us are excited about the 2020 census, and we know that Montgomery County is going to have great numbers. You can respond to the questionnaire online by visiting my2020census.gov, over the phone, or by paper through the mail. If you want to respond online but you don't have a computer, smartphone, or an internet subscription at home, all Montgomery County Library branches will offer access to public computers and free internet access to help you make sure you're counted. There will be trained staff members at each library to answer your questions. For more information, visit montgomerycountymd.gov slash census or 2020census.gov. The 2020 census is approaching and Rockville 11's Craig Buchanan fills you in on how Rockville is offering a helping hand to fill out your questionnaire. 
Census Day is Wednesday, April 1st, and the city of Rockville is here to help. By then, every home in the city will receive an invitation to participate in the 2020 Census. You can still answer by mail or phone, but what's new this year, you can also respond for your home online. So the city is opening its doors to residents at four of its community center locations, Lincoln Park, Thomas Farm, Twinbrook, and the Rockville Senior Center from March 9th to April 5th and April 14th to April 26th. Trained staff will be on hand in the computer labs to help community members complete their census questionnaire online and answer any questions that you may have. The census happens every 10 years. It's very important for every person who lives in Rockville to get counted right and once. That's the reason why we have decided to open our community centers to help those who don't have access to technology to complete the census in a timely fashion. City residents age 60 and older can also inquire at the Rockville Senior Center about getting discounted taxi rides to and from the center at the front desk or by calling 240-314-8810. To learn more about the city's efforts to ensure a complete count in Rockville, head to rockvillemd.gov slash rockvillecounts. For County Report This Week, I'm Craig Buchanan. In 1987, the National Woman's History Project requested that Congress establish March as Women's History Month. And recently, County Executive Elrich and Councilmember Navarro presented proclamations to a number of women and women's organizations that have contributed to the history, innovation, and culture of Montgomery County. You know, I think it's critically important in a society to acknowledge the full citizenship and rights of every member of society and not just half the members or, or somewhat half the members. I'm never sure whether we're 49% or 51%, but it's close and it's basically half. Um, women play an amazing role in this county. I have uh, many women in my, in my upper leadership. Uh, they play a really important role. They, they bring a different you know, sensibility and I think uh, sense of urgency to some issues. And I've always found that the council of uh, the women leadership in this county, your presence, uh, your activities politically, socially, uh, make it urgent for anybody who's thinking about making public policy to understand they have to listen to the voices of women in this community. Um, you're here to be a part and you're here to lead. We have great examples of leadership and women here and we're going to keep having that example and I just want to say that uh, we'll support this as you know as, as county executive on my side of the street and I know that it's supported on this side of the street and we're going to send a message to the residents of the county that we value this we understand the importance of Women's History Month. A new bill that would add age and speed restrictions to the county's e-scooter program has been introduced at the county council. The measure is sponsored by Council President Sidney Katz and co-sponsored by Council Member Gabe Albernoz. Council President Sidney Katz has introduced a bill that would tighten up regulations on e-scooters. This micro-mobility trend has taken off in popularity across the country. Last spring, the county rolled out a pilot e-scooter program that's been a success. This new measure provides operating expectations for e-scooter users. We felt and we talked with the, uh, with the police department and, and others and said, you know, is, should there be an age limit? And, there, and in, in this legislation, it would be someone under the age of 14 could not ride one. That anyone from the age of 14 to 18 must wear a helmet which you know, anybody, everybody should we wear a helmet, but, but this legislation would be only for someone under the age of 18 to 14 that they would have to wear a helmet. They can't go faster than 15 miles an hour. I mean, all of this is common sense, but many times we don't always do use common sense. The e-scooters are designed to make it easier to get around traffic and take cars off the road. However, as more riders use this mode of transportation, the chance of injury grows. The bill also addresses where the scooters can and can't be parked. Officials have received complaints about the e-scooters cluttering sidewalks and wheelchair ramps. Katz says this new measure is all about safety. We understand this is a form of transportation. Not everybody takes this form of transportation, but when they do, it should be safe for everyone involved. The council will hold a public hearing on the bill March 24th. Reporting from Rockville, I'm Susan Kennedy. Now it's time to meet our pet of the week. This week we want to introduce you to Sonny. This 10-year-old boy matches the super affectionate orange tabby stereotype to a T. 
Sonny loves people and other pets. Sonny is diabetic, but that doesn't stop him from enjoying every minute of the day or affect his long-term health or his life expectancy. He'll just need an owner that is willing to tend to his care and needs. Sonny's adoption fee is 100% sponsored by our nonprofit partner, McPaw. If you're interested in adopting, you can visit the shelter's website at montgomerycountymd.gov ASD to learn about the adoption process. And don't forget to follow Montgomery County Animal Services and Adoption Center on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at MCASAC. With that, we close this edition of County Report this week. Remember, you can find more information about Montgomery County at montgomerycountymd.gov or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Join us again at this time every week for a look at what's going on inside Montgomery County. I'm Michael Bruin. Thank you for watching. Home front on County Cable Montgomery. I'm Mike Subin representing the County's Commission on Veterans Affairs. Home front takes you inside the stories of Montgomery County's veterans. Today we have a special edition of Home Front. John McCain, the man, a true American hero. I'm honored today to have a very special guest, retired Navy Commander Everett Alvarez Jr. On August 5, 1964, in the aftermath of the Tonkin Belt incident, Commander Alvarez, then a lieutenant junior grade, was piloting an A-4 Skyhawk off the USS Constellation while participating in Operation Pierce Arrow. He became the first American pilot shot down in the Vietnam War and was incarcerated by the North Vietnamese as a prisoner of war for eight and a half long years and became the second longest held U.S. prisoner of that war. For much of the time, he was in what became known as the Hanoi Hilton. A federal prisoner of war held there was John McCain, then a lieutenant. On a personal note, as a young officer candidate and ensign, Commander Alvarez and Captain McCain were held out as our models of patriotism, bravery, loyalty, and dedication and endurance. They were our heroes. Commander Alvarez, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure being here. Just as a note, this is like at least the third time you've been here. You were a guest speaker when we dedicated the Memorial Plaza mm -hmm. uh, right next to the Executive Office building, and then our guest speaker again at the dedication of our uh, Vietnam yes. Memorial Wall. Right. Uh, and we were have been three times honored by you. Well, thank you. Uh, Commander, could you briefly describe John McCain, the man? John McCain uh, was a unique person. Uh, he had a very, I would say, illustrious career. Uh, he, uh, as a young man, uh, he was known amongst his peers as a maverick. In a, in a way, and that, which is something, it's a brand that stuck with him all his life. And we'll but cover the, that later, too. But in those, in those days, uh, John was really rebelling against uh, what he knew uh, and what his place would be in life, ha having to do with his lineage. His father, his grandfather were Navy admirals, and he was expected to follow suit. And for some reason, you know, as a young man in high school at the academy, he really rebelled against that. Uh, to, just to give you an example, uh, he graduated from the Naval Academy uh, as near the bottom of the class as you can get without being thrown out. Uh, you know, this was by design. There was a lot of stories about John as a, as a young man, and if you read some of his books, some of his antics, but this was before Vietnam, before he was shot down. Uh, he would do things that would uh, go against uh, norms, especially Navy custom <laughs> and what have you. I mean, it was just one story after another. Uh, but when he was shot down and went through the experience he did and came out, he really, he, he still remained a maverick in essence, 
but it was in a different sense altogether because John, as he used to say, recognized that he fell in love with his country while he was at the Hanoi Hill. A lot of us experienced the same thing. And so when he came out, it was with a different goal in life. He had a purpose. But, and as he expressed many times, it was uh, to serve a cause greater than himself. And so I would say that that, would, that was his hallmark throughout his career. But I can cite you many examples of, as a young ensign, Lieutenant J.G., and the antics he would pull. And then, of course, as I got to know him better at post-Vietnam, uh, of, the, of this, the, the causes and the battles that he fought for what he thought was not only right, but causes that were in the best interest of his country. Reminds me that when we were ensigns, we probably did a lot of those same things. Uh, I, I can't say. <laughs> I won't tell the stories, no. but we'll leave it at that. Uh, after your release and repatriation, did you develop a personal relationship with Senator McCain? I did. I did. I didn't really get to know John uh, that well. While a POW, uh, Mike, I really met John towards the end of the war when uh, they, uh, Vietnamese put us in uh, a large uh, group uh, where we occupied a large portion of what was known for the Hanoi Hilton. And we got to mix, and, and uh, the barriers between the cells came down. And so there was a lot of free movement and what have you. And I remember, uh, you know, we had heard a lot about, as we, as we did other prisoners of wars through our covert uh, communication system, we kept taps with what was going on uh, throughout the camps. We knew who was going, uh, uh, who was being hauled off to interrogation. Uh, who uh, was ill, uh, and everything that was happening because of, of our really good communication system. Uh, <clears throat> so we knew, even though I hadn't met John, I knew what he had uh, been through, who he was, and what have you. Uh, and I remember distinctly one day as uh, we're f mixing in the large grounds, and I'm at one end, and I look across, and here was this fellow that was standing in a doorway of one of the big cells and everybody that was coming in and out he was shaking their hand he was patting them on the back he was very animated uh, and, my friend, and I, I said to the fellow next to me I said who's that who's that fellow standing there they said oh that's Johnny McCain they called him Johnny McCain and I looked at that and I said you know that guy's going to be a politician someday <laughs> and call that one right yeah Sure, sure did. The rest is history. But I did get to know John uh, a lot better, especially, especially when I came back to Washington. I retired from the Navy here in Washington, D.C., and then I was uh, asked to join the Reagan administration. That's about the time John was starting to get into his political phase of his life. And so we happened to, to you know, share a lot of, uh, a lot of the stage of, uh, at events and what was happening. And and I, re I remember at one point we were both co-chairs for George W. Bush. Uh, for uh, uh, we were co-chairs of the Veterans uh, Coalition for uh, George H. Uh, w. Bush, the father. And then, and then from then on, it was just a lot of activity and working closely with him. And when he decided to run for president uh, later on, uh, I was one of the very few that. Uh, uh, that uh, started to travel with him. I was able to do that. Uh, just to go as he started uh, trucking across the country, raising funds, getting, getting on, uh, on the media, <coughs> and, and making his candidacy known. <coughs> so we were very involved with the first campaign I was, and of course the second campaign too. So over the years, I would say that, yeah, we, we always uh, developed, a, we had developed a close bond. Didn't your bond with him and your families become so close that that you served as a pallbearer yeah. at his burial at the Naval Academy. Yeah. Well, by that time, when he was ill, uh, he uh, uh, started to, you know, as he was undergoing treatment at the end here. Uh, it, it was uh, it was sad because we know that the 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 illness that he had was uh, was really fatal. It was just a matter of time. 
And uh, I recall the last conversation I had with John uh, in where I had, uh, I had called his office to see how he was doing, and that evening he called me back. And we had a, we had a, a good chat. And I remember distinctly the, the, that his, his comment was that, uh, you know, Everett, you and I, we've been through a lot together. And uh, he, he was, it was at that point that his voice started to crack and he couldn't talk. And it was more emotional than anything else. And that was hard for me. That was hard. That was about four months, four or five months before he actually passed away. Uh, and then beginning of May this year, I got a call uh, from Mark Salter, who worked very close with him, was his co-author, co-author of his books, and and said and said that John would uh, has asked if you that I be a, a pallbearer at his funeral, and I immediately said yes, I would I would be there. It was a it was a very emotional day for for all of us that uh, you know who were included in, in that. Uh, at that event, uh, it was a very hot day. <laughs> you know, it's a mile, almost a mile mm -hmm. walk from the chapel at the Naval Academy to the cemetery. And there's no <laughs> shade. Well, uh, there's shade at the beginning, but it was hot and sultry. And uh, it, anyway, there's no way I was going to let the others show me up, and uh, I was not going to jump in a car. I, I imagine it's still <laughs> very emotional, and that'll never go away. It, it, it was quite an event, particularly because of, uh, of, of the outpouring, the national outpouring of gratitude and of the, that uh, he received from the nation, starting with the ceremony in Arizona and then at the National Cathedral and, and what have you. The, the feelings of people and the commentaries that I've had ever since of, uh, you know, Condolences for my friend that hadn't passed away. I mean, I, I've just received so many. It, it's, but it's indicative of something that was really unique. You, you know, presidents don't get this kind of a send-off. John did, and he was a senator. But he was a, he was a figure. He was a, a very unique um, individual. He had a personality, uh, and uh, that uh, was very ingratiating. Um, and, and again, he always, he worked hard, he worked very hard, and, but generally speaking, he worked hard because he felt he wanted to do this uh, uh, for his country. You know, you bring that up about how he was regarded, mm -hmm. ran twice for president, mm -hmm. lost twice, um, but yet he was still treated around the nation as right. if he had, and that was people of both parties, Republicans and Democrats. Right. What do you think were the tributes coming from? What, it came from all quarters, Mike. Um, you know, his quest uh, in, in terms of service uh, to a cause greater than, than uh, oneself uh, was, uh, uh, it reverberated uh, positively to the American people, and they wanted to see. They want to see our leaders who can work mm -hmm. together and get things done. And, and he was always uh, looking for opportunities to do that, uh, both at the, in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. Uh, so I think that the, that, that in itself was uh, symbolized the, uh, the gratitude that, uh, that uh, the nation uh, uh, demonstrated in, in his uh, it, at the ceremonies at the at the, at the at the academy, but primarily at the national cathedral, thousands. And I, he was uh, he he was a leader. He was some that a model that people could look up to in terms of how leaders should be, how leaders should act, how leaders should work. And uh, hopefully, maybe we'll see start to see more of that. Well, we're going to cover that more later in the show, but right now we'll be back after we take a short break. Did you know there are more than 10,000 county government phone numbers? 
but there's only one number you need to remember for non-emergency calls, 311. MC311 is Montgomery County government's online telephone information system. Need information? Have a problem or complaint? Trying to locate a county government facility? Call 311. The call center is open Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The website is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. and high school students drop out every school day. That's a line of desks more than four miles long. We can keep students in school. Visit BoostUp.org. Welcome back to Homefront on County Cable Montgomery. I'm Mike Subin. I'm here with special guest, retired Navy Commander, Everett Alvarez. Hello and welcome to another edition of Mosaic, an African-American perspective. I'm your host, Deborah Milo. On today's show, we'll talk about Montgomery County's upcoming primary election, which takes place on June 26th. My guests today are from Montgomery County's Board of Elections. Jessica White is the Voter Services Manager, and Leslie Woods is the Election Worker Program Coordinator. Jessica and Leslie, thank you so much for joining me on today's show. Thank you for having us. Not a problem at all. It's good to see you again, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, before we get started, I always like to ask my guests a little bit about how they came to be in a public of, you know, a public service career, but specifically yours is very interesting. I'll start with, with you. I'm curious as to how you got started, especially when the Board of Elections. Well, I have to say that uh, elections is typically not a career. People say, you know, when I'm 10, I want to be an elections administrator. Right, right. So <laughs> I actually started out in human resources and uh, for the Board of Elections mm -hmm. and sort of caught the bug on voting. And it's sort of my way of supporting mm -hmm. voting without getting into the highly political aspect of it. Oh, you so, want to avoid that. Yes. You want to avoid that. No, that's, so, that's uh, you know, human resources, uh, okay. administration, mm -hmm. um, and it sort of blossoms. So now I do recruiting and training. So. And you enjoy it, don't you? I do. I do. That's really, that's why it's done well, because you enjoy well, it. Well, thank you. Good for you. <laughs> and how about you? So my career in elections actually started in another state. Really? Um, I really started off in the Midwest, and like Leslie, I started off in an effort, another section of county government. Okay. Found my way into the election office um, doing the business end um, mm -hmm. functions, and from there, that's where I kind of uh, got pulled into other areas, and like Leslie, it's kind of infectious. You kind of find your place there, and that's how my career started. And then two years ago, I relocated out here and found a job at the Board of Elections, and been working been ever, ever since. since. Hmm. Well, that's why we know that your functions are done well as <laughs> also. <laughs> Jessica, I want to start with you and talk a little bit about what the requirements are to register and vote in the primary election. So for the primary election, um, voters have to register um, prior to 21 days before the election. Mm -hmm. um, and they miss the deadline for that registration period, though. We now have um, same-day registration during our early voting period which runs for eight days before the election. Now, is that a new concept? So it was introduced um, in the legislation and passed, and we implemented in 2016. Mm -hmm. So this will be the second election cycle that this will be an option for voters. Um, it also can be used for voters who are already registered but mm -hmm. need address change. That's interesting. How long does it take to become a registered voter? Um, it's really pretty simple. Voters can either go online and do an application or they can fill out a paper form, submit it to our office. We process it within a few days and then a card's mailed out to them that's a voter notification. Kind of giving them just the background of where their polling place is mm -hmm. and letting them know an acknowledgement that they are registered to vote. So now, how, how, say again how, how citizens are notified 
as to where they're supposed to vote? So when a voter first registers to vote, um, they receive the voter notification card, which gives them their polling location. Um, before every election, though, we send out a sample ballot to every registered voter that tells them um, more information about the different ways they can vote. It gives them their polling place location, and it also is a copy of the ballot that they'll see at the polls, so they have an opportunity to review it before they vote. So what are some of the methods that are used? So voters have um, several options to vote starting 21 days before the election. They can vote in-person absentee at our office. Mm -hmm. They can vote absentee by mail. Um, which they can go online to request or call our office to get an application. They can go to early voting and vote in person in that eight-day period, mm -hmm. or they can also vote at their po assigned polling place on Election Day. We were talking earlier in the green room, and Leslie brought up an interesting uh, topic about the closed primary. I'd like to kind of ask you to expound upon that a little bit. So the primary system in the state of Maryland is it really a party primary. Mm -hmm. So the parties are the ones um, and in Maryland, it's the major parties, so the Republican Party and mm -hmm. the Democratic Party are nominating members to or candidates to go on to the general election. Mm -hmm. um, so in order to participate in the partisan primary, you have to be a member of either the Democratic Party right. or the Republican Party. Voters who choose not to affiliate with a party and are unaffiliated um, can participate in the school board races. Um, but they will not be able to participate in one of the major parties' primary unless they change their party uh, affiliation. I see. And that has to be done 21 days before the election. That's not something that can be done during early voting period. Or, or at elec on election or day. Or on election day, correct. Or on it election day. It has to be day. done in, in advance. Uh, and the deadline is June the 5th. Okay, so the deadline for that is June the yes. 5th. Yes, So now, is that a new concept also? No, that's been the long-standing rule. So that is a long-standing rule? But it does differ from state to state, so sometimes that's really confusing for voters. But in the state of Maryland, it is a closed primary, and they do have to be um, whatever party they want to participate with by June 5th. Mm -hmm. I'm interested also, and I'm sure our viewers are as well, is that there's always outreach that needs to be done You know, when it comes to voting. Can you talk a little bit about the types of um, outreach and empowerment that you've done? you know, within the past year or a couple of years to really get folks to encourage them to vote? Well, I would say that it really in a, we have an outreach coordinator at our office who helps arrange all the outreach activities, um, and we go out to hundreds of community-based events. We go out to high schools. Um, my team is also leveraged as well as Leslie's team um, of recruiters and um, you know, voter registration mm -hmm. staff to go out and help register voters, recruit election judges. Mm -hmm. but we also demonstrate the voting system so that when the voters come to the polling place on election day, they have some familiarity for what their, you know, the voting system looks like, right. how to use it. So we try to get out to lots of events, and we're always um, willing to come out um, on an invitation to community-based events. Now, during the 18th century, when I was in high school, <laughs> um, I remember that we actually had folks coming to our high school, and they would, uh, from the Board of Elections, handing out leaflets, handing out pamphlets about especially coming to work as an election judge. And Leslie, let's transition and talk about that a little bit, especially about the election workers. Can you talk a little bit about how important the election workers are? The, uh, our election workers are, are the... Lifeblood? Lifeblood, <laughs> that's a good, good word. They actually conduct the okay. election in 250 polling places. We have teams of eight to 15 individuals. Um, they sign up, they go through training, mm -hmm. and then they come together as a team Monday night. They set up the precinct, and they're there on election day. They're there to assist voters. They take them through the process. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important. We have a very small staff of 28. Uh, oh there's no way we can <laughs> oh, yeah. We can do this on our own. Right. So uh, the election workers are that um, really key piece in providing that service to voters. Now, I have a, I'm curious, were either of you ever an election worker in your, let's just say, formative years? <laughs> <laughs> I was not. My mother was. And so was so, mine. Yes, yeah. yes. So you get that experience of, mm -hmm. of going uh, with a parent to the polling place oh, and, yeah. and sort of see what's going on. And yeah. it, it was, you know, quite a while ago when we, you know, had the lever machines and the curtain, right. which as a child was very uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the Wizard of Oz, what's behind the curtain? What's behind the curtain? <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. So. Jessica, how about you? Have you ever had the experience before you came employed at the Board of Elections? So I was never an election judge before I became employed, but in my previous capacity, before I really was in the 
you know, the mix of the actual carrying out the election, yes. I did have the opportunity to get to go and serve at the polls to kind of have that experience, which is very different for us from being on the back end. So True. it's interesting. Imagine. Yeah. So, Leslie, what kinds of positions are there for the election workers, and also, what are some of the tasks? Uh, they are working in a, in a team mm -hmm. with other individuals, and mm -hmm. we have positions. So, our voting operations judges uh, the position that most people know about. Um, that's mm -hmm. the individual when you go to vote is going to help. Uh, they're going to check you in, issue your ballot, kind of um, navigate you, navigate you through right, the process. Right. Uh, we also have chief judges who are responsible for sort of managing the polling place, mm -hmm. um, handling any issues that may arise. We have uh, closing judges now that are sort of part-time. They okay. come in the evening at 6.30 and mm -hmm. help close down. Now, is that new? Uh, it's that actually not new. We've had it since 2008, and it's just really worked very well for I us. Um, it's an appealing position for individuals that work but right. still want to serve. Mm -hmm. They can come after work and, <clears throat> excuse me, sort of help us in the, the evening rush and oh, help yes. us close down. Um, for the 2016 cycle, we actually uh, split our main position, mm -hmm. uh, the voting operations judge. Uh, so that is also, people can do that part time. So rather okay. than a 15 hour day, right. mm -hmm. they can split Ooh. that day. <laughs> right. Excuse me. Sure. And and that's been very popular too. Um, individuals they they want to participate. They they want to serve, but maybe you don't have the whole day to give. So you can do the morning oh, yeah. shift, or you can do the afternoon into the evening shift. Um, and so they they come in as a team. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they they set up the precinct. They get it ready Monday night, mm -hmm. and then they're there on Tuesday to to really assist voters. Most of our voters are, are familiar with the process. Oh, of course. Um, we, we do have individuals on hand for new voters uh, if they have any questions or any anxiety um, about what do I do, what do I do, particularly if you come from a different state where the processes oh, may sure. be oh, different. Yeah, definitely. So they're there to, to provide that help. Um, you mentioned high schools. Right. I wanted to kind of revisit that. So uh, we have been working very hard to up our high school participation. So we've been doing monthly outreach to all of our high schools. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they changed the law last year saying 16 year olds can now. Oh, so that's lo no longer 18 year olds. No, it's, it's 16. 16. They have to be registered, right. which you can do at 16. Mm -hmm. um, and they can work as full fledged election judges and either be paid or earn SSL credits. Right. It's, it's their preference. So uh, we're really looking forward to that. In 2016, we had about 650 high school students that participated. My goodness. And we're hoping to double that number this time. You know, that's so positive to hear that because typically when you think about young people, of course you think, especially when it comes to voting and the importance of voting, you think, oh, maybe they won't be so interested, but it's so positive to hear that. So now, do you do you have a recruitment process where you go to schools? Yes. Oh, that's yes. wonderful. Yes. Okay, then. Yes. I'm Every, th actually, this week we're at Seneca Valley, Richard Montgomery, Albert mm -hmm. Einstein. So we have a schedule, and we 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 typically go out lunch periods. Yeah. And they can sign up uh, to be an election judge if they're already registered, mm -hmm. or they can register to vote and sign up. Uh, many of our high school students uh, register when they get their um, driver's license. Their driver's license. Right. But there are some, you know, who maybe haven't gotten to that point yet. Right. And so we're able to go in and, and do both. You know, that's incredible. It and really, they're really very, is. very excited about having the opportunity to serve. I know that when I've had, when, it, when I voted before and I've seen the students, it's so wonderful to see them because they're eager, they're yeah. excited about what they're doing, and they're learning that civic participation is really, really vital. Yes. You know? Yes, and so we, we want to start them young. Oh, thank you for saying that. Understanding, you know, the, the civic uh, responsibility. Uh, of course. And uh, that this is the way that they, they can exercise their voice and, and representation. And uh, we actually start with our Future Vote program um, okay. that brings in uh, students in the 6th to 12th grades. They can work and get SSL credits. And see, having the chance to start them that young is vital. Yes. Well, we're going to talk more about that when we come from our break. Okay. 
County friends, if you've just tuned in, you're watching Mosaic, an African-American perspective. I'm your host, Deborah Milo, and I'm talking to Jessica White and Leslie Woods from the Montgomery County Board of Elections. Now, after a short break, we'll be back with more about voter registration and election judge opportunities. So stay with us. All right, give me a spot. You know my motto, safety first. They could be dangerous. I think we should call animal control. Animal control? To be safe. Don't worry. Just... I got this. It's a new motto. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Welcome back to Mosaic, an African-American perspective. I'm here with Jessica White and Leslie Woods from the Montgomery County Board of Elections, and we're talking about upcoming primary elections on June 26th. Ladies, we were talking earlier before we went to break about the actual training and compensation for the election workers. Leslie, can you kind of talk about certainly, that a little bit? Certainly. We provide training. Mm -hmm. um, it's one four-hour class, and we teach voting regulations and policies, and the main thing is how to use the voting equipment and the, yeah. pro the proper way to assist voters. Right. So <laughs> right, right. Every, everyone has to go to training by state law. Okay. Um, we also pay. Uh, we do have individuals who volunteer their time, mm -hmm. um, but we, we do pay a stipend, mm -hmm. um, and it ranges from 130 to $250. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a small remuneration, but it is just to you know, something to cover meals and transportation of coming to training say, and going to the of polling course, place. Of so it's it's something that we do offer. Students have the option of either being paid or getting SSL credits. Mm -hmm. Which SSL credits actually are payment within themselves. They are. So to speak. They are. And you know, it does look good on the yes, uh, it does. college applications. <laughs> yes it does. Yes it does. It really so does. So it's 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 important to um, you know, to recognize the mm -hmm. contributions mm -hmm. of our election workers. I'm glad to hear that because that's something that young people, you know, back again in our day, that was something that you really did get engaged with because it was civic duty. Yes. You know, civic yes. duty. We even had civics classes from what I can remember, but that's going back quite a ways. <laughs> so, you know, you know, that's would true. you say that uh, good communication skills are important in this role? Definitely. The right. other is I think they need to be, you know, people, people. You, you really yes. not need to like working with people, um, answering questions, um, sort of having that supportive role without, you know, right. uh, sort of being too, too overpowering. As I said, most voters are familiar. They come in and they go through the process. Mm -hmm. Some are very anxious. Um, they may be new citizens, you know. The f this is their first opportunity to mm -hmm. vote. Even some of our high school students, mm -hmm. you know, this is their, their first time voting. Mm -hmm. They're anxious about it, and they really need somebody who's going to guide them through and make it a positive experience. So we're looking at people who have really good communication, interpersonal skills, are good at organization. Um, oh, I would Because, think so. you know, we have paperwork that needs to be of filled course. out. You know, you've got to add your numbers and make sure right. you've ticked all the boxes. Right. Uh, we have a lot of checks and balances for security. So you've got to verify that everything is, is sealed correctly. And, and so we, you certainly need that strong organizational skills too. You know, that's something a lot of people, when you enter the polling place, a lot of citizens like, like ourselves don't really think about those intricate details that are so important to running a successful election process. You know, so you've done very well at explaining that. Yeah. You know, it's really behind behind the scenes for the voter, I'm and, sure. it, and it yes. and it should be. You know, mm -hmm. they're they're our front end customers. We're serving them. Absolutely. But yes, we got a lot of work on the backside that we're doing <laughs> to make sure that it, it goes correctly. I can understand that, Jessica. You were mentioning earlier about the both of you actually were mentioning earlier about the voting, the initiative that's out there now that you're working in. Uh, the Future Voting Future Initiative. Voting. Mm -hmm. yes. Talk a little bit about that. Yes. Expand on that for me a bit. 
Well, the Future Vote Initiative is a um, program to get the sixth graders through 12th grade involved in civic duty getting mm -hmm. them involved in working in the polling places, but they also have a program where they hold registration drives within the school. They're the connector who go to the administration. They get the you know, location and the time scheduled. Mm -hmm. They make posters, they advertise it, and they even have a competition among the schools to see who can get the most people registered to vote. That's pretty cool. So, and that's, you know, and what few people know is that um, students as young as 16, like Leslie said, can register to vote, um, but students who will be 18 by the general election can vote in the primary election even if they're still 17. Now that's interesting. So that gives them a whole different perspective then. Yes, and so it's important they know they're eligible as long as they'll be 18 by that general date, which is November 6th right. this year. Speaking of eligibility, talk a little bit about the eligibility requirements. So the general eligibility requirements to register to vote is you have to be a Maryland resident, mm -hmm. you have to be a U.S. citizen, um, you have to be at least 16 years of age, mm -hmm. but like I said, you have to be 18 by the general to vote, but you can still pre-register if you're 16. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a few other requirements that are um, you know, can't be convicted of buying or selling boats. Um, you can't be convicted. Yeah, that's kind of important. Yes, that was important. <laughs> you cannot be um, convicted of a felony and currently be serving a sentence of imprisonment. Now, do if I want to stop you there, if I remember correctly, wasn't there something about the law that they were trying to amend it or ch make changes to it to give people who had already? Um, had their records expunged? I'm not, don't have all the details. So in 2016, the law was changed, and previously you had to have completed probation or parole. Oh, I see. Now okay. that's no longer necessary. So as long as you have been released and you've completed your sentence of imprisonment, you're welcome to register to vote and vote in every election. That's, a, that's definitely something that's significant and a freedom. Yes, yes. It, is. it really is. So I want to understand a little bit more also when it comes to the day of. You know, I can imagine, again, that your schedules right now must be just beyond hectic, but every day that there are there are stressors in life. Can you talk a little bit about some of the interesting or unique situations that you've run into on the day of? Leslie, on, that's probably... On, on election day? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> because there's stress in everyday life, that, you know, working every day, taking care of our families and ourselves. But of course, I'm always curious to see when we walk into that, that polling place, everything looks so smooth and everything looks so well done, which it is. But to your point, there's a backstory behind that. Definitely. What's the most unique situation you may have witnessed on voting day? We have uh, many things happen on, on election day that no one is really aware. Of. Right. Um, I think the one of the biggest stressors is that morning, that opening. Oh, I can our imagine. Our polls open at 7. Mm -hmm. uh, the staff start at 5. Our election workers start at 6. And everybody is really worked up about, you know, getting open at 7 and making sure that everything oh, yeah. is ready. Um, we've had building service managers who are perhaps not used to our schedule, oversleep. Mm -hmm. You oh know, dear. and our election <laughs> workers are standing at the door calling in, we can't get in, we can't get in. Um, <laughs> and, and usually it's like right at the deadline. Of course you know? it is. Of course <laughs> it is. <laughs> you, know, uh, the, you know, the facility person come running in, and, and the good thing is that we set up the night before. Yes. And so, uh, which can take about an hour, hour and a half. That's so, it? Yes. Now, for some reason, let me just stop you there. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I don't know why, but this is in my head which we all know is a very scary place. But for some reason, I actually, I thought that it took the entire night. No. I don't know why I thought no, that. No, Interesting. Most okay. of the time, it's about two hours oh, from the setup. Bad. Uh, they usually have a half hour meeting with the team. Right. And just to, you know, talk about positions, meet each other, mm -hmm. uh, figure out meals. You know, are they going to oh, do a potluck or, right. you know, if people have special dietary, they may bring their own food. Of course. Um, some order out or, or different different things. So they mm -hmm. have a half hour meeting. And then mm -hmm. uh, they set up the polling place. So it's about an hour and a half. But you can't do that the morning of. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I want to see no. that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, when they're just when they have those sort of mishaps of getting in late, right? Um, you know, they're they're usually able to get set up and going okay. in about twenty minutes, mm -hmm. but it certainly adds to the stress. Uh, yeah, you know, and they you know got to put on their game face. You know, when the voters start coming in at mm -hmm. seven, you know, we we have um, you know things happen. You know, people Life. may get sick. 
Oh, yeah. um, we, we, you know, um, we've had people uh, go into labor and, and need to leave. Go into labor? Yes, yes. Now, I've heard um, of civic responsibility. Yeah. That's really <laughs> taking it to the extreme. <laughs> Voting is very important. Voting is very, very important. Very important. Yes, it so, is. You know, those types of uh, human things happen. Of course, of you know, course. But the, everybody comes together. I find it amazing that, uh, you know, you can take 15 people who have never met each other mm -hmm. and put them together mm -hmm. uh, as a team, and they do just excellent work. Well, that I comes mean, from good leadership. Oh, well. No, it really does. Well, you know, we know what that's like. Yes, but I, I attribute it to really our election workers that are willing to give of themselves. Um, they come to training. Uh, they they learn about something they've never done before. In, oh, I'm sure. In a four-hour class, um, they take their book home and they read it and they come back in. We offer a, a sort of a walk-in lab mm -hmm. the weekend before the right. election for additional training. They they come in for that and you know they've got questions and you know can I practice checking in you know a couple more times. So they're you know, eager. So they're they're confident and mm -hmm. comfortable with the process uh, because they want to do a good job. Of course. Um, and that means a lot. That really means a lot. Uh, I think for us and also for the voters, I think they need to know the, um, the strong responsibility oh, and course. the strong passion right. that these individuals have to make sure that we have a um, secure, fair that's right. uh, election process in the county. See, that's good. That's good to hear. That's really good to hear. You know, before we wrap up today's show, I kind of want to um, ask, is there a website that our viewers can visit to get all information about whatever they need to do, whether it's to register to vote or to, you know, want to become an election judge or any position? Is there a website that you can give our viewers? So our website is www.777vote.org. Okay. Oh, that's really simple. <laughs> that's really, really simple. And that's simple. also our phone number, 240-777-VOTE. Okay. So Good if they have any know. questions, they can call as well. Mm -hmm. Are there any last uh, nuggets of wisdom or pearls of wisdom that you want to leave with our viewers so that they'll be encouraged and empowered to really get out there and vote and to also help out? I would encourage the voters to visit our website and mm -hmm. use the voter lookup tool to make sure they know what their party affiliation is, to make sure that they are registered at the proper address. Um, if their address is current, to make sure their polling place assignment is correct. That's, yes, that that's will prevent good. them from voting provisionally on Election Day. <laughs> and also for any other options about um, voting ahead of time, by mail, absentee. Okay, then Leslie, anything that you want to add? I would love to have as many people who are able to sign yes. up and uh, serve as election workers. I think it's a good way to learn mm -hmm. about elections, to learn about the process. Mm -hmm. I think there's, um, unfortunately, um, you know, the social media, sometimes mm -hmm. we have little, <coughs> excuse me, nuggets of information. Right. We have little rumors and myths. I think by working and seeing what really happens, they have a better understanding mm -hmm. of how the process works, mm -hmm. the safeguards that we have in place. And that's um, important. That it is a secure process. Right. Um, and it's open and available to everyone. Hmm. Good to know. Ladies, I can't thank you enough for coming on today's show and taking spending some of your valuable time. You're very welcome. Great Thanks opportunity. For us. My pleasure. Well, unfortunately, that's about all we have time for today. I'd like to thank my guests, Jessica White and Leslie Woods from Montgomery County's Board of Elections. And county friends, I encourage you to register to vote if you haven't done so already. And also consider serving as an election judge. I'm Deborah Milo. Please join us again next time for another edition of Mosaic an African-American perspective. Till next time, make it a great day. Did you know that African-Americans have disproportionately high rates of heart disease and diabetes? Diabetes is the eighth leading cause of death among Montgomery County residents and is a frequent cause of hospital visits among residents. Heart disease is the number one killer of all Americans. African-Americans have high rates of high blood pressure and obesity, which often lead to heart disease. The good news is there's a lot we can do to reduce our risk for heart disease and diabetes, such as eating a healthy diet, 
exercising, not smoking, and adopting an overall healthy lifestyle. The African American Health Program provides resources and services that can help people do just that. Learn how you can prevent and manage chronic conditions like heart disease and diabetes at AAHP's Diabetes Education Classes and Heart Health Classes. Consider AAHP your partner in health. Learn more about AAHP and our programs and services on our website, www.aahpmontgomerycounty.org. I love taking care of my mom. It wasn't easy at first. She learned how to better communicate her needs. And you learned how to not ignore yours. I discovered how to make healthier meals. And I discovered how much I enjoyed them. Becoming a caregiver is a learning experience for everyone. Find articles, tips, and tools from experts and others who have been in your place. The Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision making. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Y a partir de este momento, Montgomery al Día. Un programa presentado por el Condado de Montgomery con el objetivo de mantener a la población latina informada sobre todo lo que acontece en nuestro condado. Un espacio informativo para que usted obtenga acceso directo a los servicios de su gobierno local. Aquí da inicio, Montgomery al Día. Queda con ustedes la presentadora de este programa y portavoz hispana del condado de Montgomery, Lorna Virgilí. Muy buenas tardes, queridos amigos. Bienvenidos una vez más a casa. Montgomery al día, su programa oficial del gobierno del condado de Montgomery, galardonado a nivel nacional. Y como cada martes, acá su presentadora y portavoz hispana de este condado, Lorna Virgilí. Gracias por esa sintonía. Y bueno, damas y caballeros, llegó la semana, llegó el censo. Vamos a hablar del censo 2020. De eso es lo que queremos hablar una vez más acá en los estudios, porque obviamente, pues esta semana vamos a recibir oficialmente la invitación por parte del Buró del Censo para completar el cuestionario. Acá en el estudio tengo a Daniel Jones, a Daniel Jones, el dominicano más guapo del DMV. ¡Wow! Una gracias, gracias. ¡Uy, que me oiga Alejandro Oye, Carrasco! No, 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 problema, no problema. Voy a tener tremendo problemita, pero bueno, eh, como ustedes saben, pues um, acá Daniel es, eh, ok, el partnership, el líder, ¿cómo, ¿cómo es el título tuyo que se me olvidó en español? Partnership, specialist. Exacto. Estrategia, qué sé yo. Todo Estrategia, eso. hacer las asociaciones, sobre todo él es el enlace nuestro entre el condado de Montgomery y el Buró del Censo a nivel nacional. Y por supuesto, gracias a Dios que es bilingüe. Así que vamos a estar conversando con Daniel acá en el estudio. Y en la vía telefónica vamos a tener también presente a Jesse Mejía, que ustedes la conocen. Jesse es nuestro Latino Liaison, nuestro enlace latino del condado de Montgomery en la comunidad. Jesse, ¿estás por ahí? Aquí estoy. Buenas tardes. Bueno, te tengo que tirar un elogio a ti también, la salvadoreña más guapa del GNB. <risa> bueno, gracias. Ya lo sabíamos. ¿no? Exacto. Ya eso, eso es noticia vieja. <risa> bueno, chicos, mucha alegría, mucha alegría acá porque finalmente ya eh, estamos oficializados. El día de pasado mañana, 12 de marzo, invitación para contestar al censo. Daniel, dale, adelante, envíe a la gente. Bueno, Lorna, en primer lugar, gracias por la oportunidad y por me, permitirme estar acá. Y gracias por, ¿verdad?, uh, decir que soy el chico más guapo dominicano. ¿Es solamente dominicano o, o todo? Entre paréntesis, dominicano. Ah, hombre. No me gusta el paréntesis, Vamos, pero está bien. Y, y eso que no hizo un age group, una categoría de edad. <risa> gracias, bueno, gracias. Tu programa obviamente es un, un, un programa excelente, bellísimo. Uh, gracias por el trabajo que tú has estado haciendo. Gracias por el apoyo que le está dando al censo. 
muchísimas gracias, te merece un tremendo galardón por todo lo que haces, ¿no? Pues a lo mejor me lo dan, vamos a ver, después te hablo de galardones, sigue. <risa> bueno, pero sí, como acabas de decir, bueno, el censo ya llegó, ¿verdad? Hemos estado trabajando por tanto tiempo con los grupos comunitarios aquí en el condado, la oficina del Ejecutivo del Condado, tu oficina, ¿no? Y entonces, pues ya estamos listos. Esta semana es la hora cero, es la hora donde verdaderamente nuestra comunidad comenzará a recibir esos, no iba a decir formulario, pero no formularios, sino una invitación. Nuestra comunidad recibirá esa invitación para ir al internet y completar el formulario del censo. Y estoy seguro que nuestra comunidad va a correr y lo va a hacer, porque ahora es el momento. Y quiero indicar, es, decirle a nuestra es. gente lo fácil que es hacerlo, ¿no? Espérame, ah. espérame, espérame. Eh, Jesse, okay. eh, sí, no te quiero dejar abandonada. Estoy pensando aquí como que estás al lado mío, aunque no lo estás. Quiero mirarte, pero no estás. Eh, a nivel comunitario nuestro del condado de Montgomery, sabemos uh -huh. que eh, lo que es toda la concientización sobre el okay. tema del censo, pues eh, la maneja primordialmente nuestra oficina de relaciones comunitarias del condado. En esta recta final, hora cero, pues uh, nos puedes delinear algunas de las cosas que nosotros a nivel del condado de Montgomery, pues hemos estado llevando a cabo, implementando, de manera que todos nuestros residentes participen. Ya vengo para ti, no te desesperes. <risa> <risa> Jesse, eh, de última hora más o menos, ¿qué estamos haciendo nosotros para dar un empuje inicial durante durante esta semana, que obviamente eh, los hogares van a recibir la invitación. Bueno, mira, de parte del condado uh, venimos ya implementando uh, esta campaña sobre el censo. Uh, por los últimos meses, ya a esta hora, estamos listos para implementar uh, lo que es la fase más activa de, de, todo, de todo esto. Lo que significa, uh, ya estamos listas en nuestros... Uh, en todas las librerías públicas del condado para asistir a, cualquiera, a cualquier persona que necesite ayuda en su idioma, no solo habrá en español, habrá uh, en vietnamita, en, 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 en varios otros eh, 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 lenguajes que la comunidad de Montgomery County eh, tenemos uh, suficientes personas para uh, poder ayudar. Eh, también cuando dices en las bibliotecas, perdona que te interrumpa, Jessy, cuando dices en las bibliotecas públicas, es quizás para aquellas personas que quieran hacerlo por Internet y que no tengan la tecnología en el hogar, que puedan utilizar las computadoras de la biblioteca, ¿es eso? Es eso, okay. pero también pueden hacerlo por teléfono en, en la biblioteca. Eh. Sí, habrá un, una persona que ya, está, ya ha sido capacitada para ayudar a nuestra gente eh, están tomándose turnos en cada librería, perdón, en cada biblioteca uh, para hacer esto. Así que si no, si por alguna razón hay dificultad por internet, uh, se puede hacer por, por teléfono. Uh, recuerde que nada más necesita su teléfono, uh, llevar su teléfono y nada más. Si no tiene computadora, también tenemos eh, computadoras ahí para ayudar. Eh, también habrá diferentes lugares donde puede ir a, a recibir esta ayuda, no solo en las bibliotecas. En este momento estamos todavía uh, poniendo junto el, el listado de todos esos lugares, pero eh, van a poder ir a diferentes, eh, a, habrán escuelas, habrán universidades. Yo sé que Montgomery College también ya está en esto. Así que a nivel regional estamos en todas las áreas del condado. Uh, y también tenemos eh, la línea que va a estar que, que va a estar abierta para ayudar con esto también creo que eh, Montgomery County eh, bueno perdón no debería eh, va, van a haber líneas para diferentes eh, cosas pero eh, estamos ya en lo último eh, y también ya al final de este mes también tendremos uh, eventos alrededor del condado para también seguir la concientización así que estamos preparados y eh, trabajando de lado a lado con uh, los representantes, así como Daniel, para poder ayudar. Para poder eh, eh, promover la participación nuestra civil acá en el condado de Montgomery. Sí. El censo, el censo Daniel, eh, vamos a hablarnos de las opciones que tienen las personas para, para contestar. Sabemos que en este momento tenemos que abordar el tema, pues... Eh, 
Y tenemos la situación de que se están suscitando estos casos del coronavirus en el estado de Maryland, eh, con un par de casos registrados acá en el condado de Montgomery, cuatro de ellos en Montgomery hasta ahorita, que estamos llevando a cabo esta grabación, y dos en el vecino condado de Prince George's, también en, en Washington D.C., en Howard, y esto es una situación que, bueno, durante los próximos días se continúa monitoreando, investigando, y pues seguimos en esto, y hay un poco de eh, preocupación ¿no? por parte de la comunidad. Las personas ahora están más enfocadas en el coronavirus. Me acuerdo que el censo del 2010 fue H1N1. Fue el censo del 2010 y fue la gripe porcina. Ahora tenemos el censo del 2020 y el COVID-19. ¿Qué quieres tú decir con eso? Que cada vez que hay un censo tiene que venir. ¿no? Yo no sé qué decirte, pero, pero sí sé que a nivel de mensaje a la población hemos tenido que estar dividiendo el mensaje. Uno, la, los temas que son relacionados ¿no? con estos virus y ahora y con el censo. Así que estamos precisamente eh, en, en esta temporada arrancando el censo, arrancando con los primeros casos reportados acá en el estado de Maryland con el tema del coronavirus. Entonces, eh, a la población, el mensaje de la población, sabemos que hay preocupación, hay cierto nivel de alarma, hay cierto, cierto nivel de consternación dentro de la comunidad, eh, las personas preparándose eh, para cualquier tipo de cuarentena, de emergencia, etcétera. Entonces, lo mejor que tiene el censo es que es por internet también en este momento y se puede hacer del teléfono celular también, ¿correcto? Correcto. De un smart device. Entonces, háblanos sobre esa esa eh, eh, esa opción, que no hay que ir ni siquiera al correo a depositar el cuestionario. No, sí, es interesante. Bueno, en primer lugar, quiero que nuestra comunidad sepa que el uh -huh. censo, ¿verdad?, Departamento de Comercio, siempre se prepara para este tipo de asuntos, ¿no? Nosotros, uh, sea que hagan tormentas, desastres naturales, siempre hay un plan para tratar esas de emergencia, cosas. De, de, emergencia. de emergencia. Siempre emergencia. tenemos un plan en, 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 y desarrollamos un plan para esas cosas, o sí estamos preparados, ¿no? Pero es importante la coincidencia y lo, lo, lo chévere, si podemos decir eso esta vez es que aunque tenemos este asunto de coronavirus que está pasando no eh, usted puede completar su formulario del censo por el internet tremenda coincidencia pero el timing es perfecto no so, así que no tiene que salir de su casa si no quiere hacerlo uh -huh. um, puede hacerlo por internet tranquilo pero recuerde que en el censo, para el censo del, del 2020, tiene más de una opción para hacerlo, uh -huh. que es muy importante. Aunque nosotros siempre estamos promoviendo eh, que lo haga por el Internet. Siempre promovemos porque, como sabes, no porque es que eso, mucho dinero. También eso es ahorro de dinero porque uh -huh. eh, si la población content, contesta pues electrónicamente, obviamente no tiene que llegar el censista, el enumerador a tocar puerta y eso es plata que se ahorra el buro del censo. De eso estamos más que claros. <risa> gracias, pues, gracias, estamos bien claros. Pues. Gracias, Lorna. Okay. Gracias. Sí, por eso eres, 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 eres tan bella. Tú eres Miss Universo alguna vez. ¿no? <risa> ¿No? Oye, déjalo, dejemos los piropos porque la gente aquí se va, se va a empezar a pensar que hay romance y no hay romance. Hay censo. Censo. <risa> so, bueno, bien. Esta, Después empiezan los otros rumores. No queremos más chismes, rumores. ¿no? Okay. Uh, so, regresemos entonces al tema. Okay. So, el censo, ¿no? Entonces, tienes la oportunidad de, de hacerlo por internet, mm -hmm. muy, no ahorrar dinero, pero también debemos de nuestra comunidad, muchos ya saben, que también pueden usar su teléfono, ¿verdad? Para llamar y hablar con alguien en su idioma y completar el formulario del censo por teléfono, que es muy importante. Ahora, ¿puede usted hacer el censo por papel? ¿Usar el formulario como lo hicimos en el, en el 2010? Sí, también tenemos, tienes esa oportunidad, porque lo creas uh -huh. o no, Lorna, hay personas que, que lo no, van a recibir en papel, porque eso no que lo que no, solamente que lo van a recibir, que lo quieren hacer por papel, que no yo quieren hacer Yo soy antigua, en, antiguo, en Chapada la Antigua, yo lo quiero en papel. Bueno, ¿sabes que Te vamos a dar papel, Lorda. Ok, ¿eh? yo lo y, quiero en papel. Y sí, sí, la colocamos para que nuestra gente, nuestra comunidad sepa, ¿verdad? aquellos que no saben, sé que muchos están muy informados, gracias a ti, y, y, y lo que, y no, Jesse y toda la gente en, en el condado que ha estado promoviendo el censo, uh, recuerde que todos van a recibir uh, dos invitaciones, uh -huh. en, por primero, ¿no? Comenzando este 12 de marzo, ¿no? Esta semana. Esta semana. Y entonces, entonces, si usted no la ha completado para ese tiempo, durante las dos primeras invitaciones, habrá una tercera invitación que va a ir para esas personas que todavía no han completado el censo por el internet o por teléfono, ¿no? Y entonces, si no, para esas personas, después de eso habrá una cuarta carta. Con la cuarta carta es que usted va a recibir el formulario en inglés del censo 
para completarlo. En inglés. ¿no? Ese es en inglés. Ese es en inglés. Uh -huh. Ahora, ya que mencionaste el idiomas, ¿no? Algo que vamos a estar haciendo con el censo es que para aquellos lugares, o sea, census tracts, que son, un, un, digamos, un área designada por el censo, que tiene entre 2.000 a 8.500 personas, uh -huh. si una de esas áreas tiene por lo menos un, un 20% de la gente que vive en esa área, o más, o más, perdón, hablan español, le vamos a enviar un formulario en español con la primera carta. La de esta semana. Exactamente, con la primera semana. carta. Eh, eh, son lugares que van a recibir el formulario en español desde el principio. Ahora, Después que te enviamos el, con la cuarta carta del formulario, tienes una oportunidad más para completar el censo, ¿verdad? Antes que enviemos agentes a, o representantes del censo, trabajadores, a tu casa a tomar la información. Exacto. Que... Sí, 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 sí. No, van a haber cinco invitaciones, cinco recordatorios en total recordatorios. Eh, para que las personas puedan eh, ingresar, llamar por teléfono a contestar el cuestionario del censo. Ahora, el cuestionario, hablemos un poquito del tema del, del cuestionario en sí. Cuando usted reciba la carta, va a haber un localizador de la propiedad en la carta, que es el número de identificación de la propiedad, no de usted, señor, ni señora que me está escuchando, de la propiedad. Porque la carta no viene dirigida a Lornita, y la carta no viene dirigida <risa> tampoco a Danielito, la carta viene dirigida a la propiedad. Es un localizador de la infraestructura, del apartamento, del condominio, del townhouse, de donde usted vive. Y todas las personas que viven bajo el mismo techo, pues obviamente cuentan para el censo. Usted tiene que contar a todas las personas que vienen. Si usted está, digamos, en la consulta del doctor, ¿verdad?, y está sentada ahí esperando el doctor, o está en algún otro lugar que está esperando, quizás está en el autobús. Eh, ay, quiero contestar el censo ahora. Ay, no tengo el localizador, el número que me mandaron para identificar mi propiedad. Aún así, las personas pueden ingresar eh, con la dirección, ¿verdad? Gracias, la dirección de la casa. Gracias, Lorna, por traer okay. ese punto, que es muy, muy importante, importantísimo. Eh, es cierto, si usted por casualidad quiere estar en, en la oficina del doctor, saca su teléfono y quiere completar el formulario por internet, pero no se le olvidó la carta o no sabe su número que identifica su vivienda, no hay problema. Puede hacerlo de todas formas, ¿no? Se acuerde, el censo, hemos hecho esto tan fácil para el 2020. A mí, no hay excusa para que nuestra comunidad no complete el formulario. No hay ninguna excusa, porque tiene tres formas de hacerlo y donde quiera que usted esté con su teléfono puede completar ese formulario. Definitivamente. Eh, una cosa, Jessy, que qu quisiera que tú recalques, en el año 2020, nosotros acá en el condado de Montgomery, esto yo lo conversaba en la mañana en la radio, en los segmentos matutinos con Alejandro, el tema de que nosotros, pues, el response rate, como respondimos acá en el condado de Montgomery, fue el 80% de la uh -huh. población respondió. Pero ese 20% que no respondió, en la última década, básicamente, el impacto económico que tuvo ese 20% que no se hizo contar fue de más de 3.600 millones de dólares en una década que el condado de Montgomery perdió, se desapareció, nunca llegaron dinero que pudiera haber sido invertido en programas y en servicios precisamente para nosotros, las personas que vivimos acá. Eh, Jesse, recalcar el tema de que todo el mundo cuenta. Todo el mundo cuenta, estamos eh, eh, y eso es correcto, eso fue en el 2010. Uh, este año, 10 uh, años después, Estamos contando con todo el mundo porque eh, en ese momento estamos hablando de dos mil, uh, un poco me, parece que un, un, casi dos mil dólares por persona eh, por cada año que no están, eh, que no, que están en el condado pero que no se han hecho contar. Entonces imagínate, eh, estamos, eh, queremos mantener el, el, la calidad y la cualidad de servicios que, que perdón, la, la calidad y la cantidad de servicios que tenemos en el condado para nuestros uh, nuestros vecinos, para nuestra gente. Entonces necesitamos que cada cada persona se cuente en, todos los, en, en todas las casas, en todos los apartamentos eh, donde usted viva, para que así podamos contar con ese dinero del gobierno federal que al final viene siendo nuestros propios eh, no la plática puesto. que le pagamos a, a, a Uncle Sam ahorita. Está, sí, yo siempre digo, ah, estamos en plena temporada de taxes. Si usted no ha pagado sí, impuestos, ya los va a pagar. Y sí, estamos en el momento ya alistándonos para hacer nuestros uh, nuestros impuestos. Y uh, de la misma manera hay que hacer nuestros impuestos, pero primero hay que contarse para que esos impuestos re puedan regresar a nuestras comunidades para poder uh, pagar por más clínicas médicas, 
más transporte público, eh, almuerzos en las escuelas, los programas después de las escuelas, eh, de lo que necesita nuestra gente, eh, necesitamos esa plata y por eso es que todo el mundo puede ayudarnos para hacer que eso regrese aquí a Montgomery County. Sabes que me, lo que me gustaría también decir es que um, para que nuestra comunidad sepa que el censo es algo, es algo normal, ¿no? En nuestros mm -hmm. países... Se, toma, se hace un censo, se Exacto, toma un censo. en so, otros países se hace censo. Y censo en Canadá y en Inglaterra, tengo entendido que el cuestionario tiene casi 50 preguntas. Y aquí solamente tenemos nueve preguntas uh -huh. en los Estados Unidos. So, uh -huh. lo que quiero, so, en otras comunidades tienen que entender que es algo que tal vez ellos ya han hecho, ¿no? So, a veces cuando hablamos del censo, nuestra comunidad como que se preocupa. Uh -huh. Le digo, si no, 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 no hay que preocuparse, ¿no? Número uno, porque es algo normal, es como contamos a la población. Esa es la forma como nos enteramos cuántas personas viven en los Estados Unidos, número uno. Pero también mantengamos presente, creo que nuestra comunidad sepa que su información es protegida. Es, es protegida por ley, es confidencial. Por 72 años, nadie, absolutamente nadie, ni usted mismo o misma, puede, tiene acceso a esa información. Número dos, esa información no la compartimos con otras agencias de gobierno. En otras palabras, la información que usted nos da, absolutamente nadie, aparte del censo, puede ver esa información. ¿okay? Es interesantísimo. Se, se acuerde, 72 años, nadie tiene acceso a su información. So, por favor, con confianza, complete el formulario. La información que nosotros compartimos con todos los Estados Unidos solamente son números. ¿Sí? Números estadísticas, solamente, es estadísticas, puras cifras. Solo cifras, no compartimos nombres, ni número de teléfono, nada de eso. El formulario del censo no le pregunta a usted por su número de seguro social o su número de identificación. No, no le número de pasaporte, nada de eso. Número de pasaporte, no le preguntan tampoco uh, por su cuenta de banco, tampoco le preguntan por su afiliación política, nada de esas cosas. Y tampoco le vamos a enviar un correo electrónico pidiendo la información. Eso no lo hacemos. So, es importantísimo que entendamos que es algo muy fácil de hacer, Seguro de hacer, muy sencillo de hacer, pero que usted va a beneficiar a su comunidad por 10 años. Recuerde, una vez que tomamos el censo, ya terminó. Por 10 años, esos datos son vigentes y están buenos. Y con, basado en esos datos... Es que se va a distribuir los fondos federales. Y estamos hablando de que, eh, de acuerdo a las respuestas nuestras ¿no? al cuestionario del censo, pues es obviamente los fondos que vamos a estar recibiendo la próxima década, los próximos 10 años, porque el próximo... Censo no será hasta el 2030. Eh, pero, 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 ¿cómo benefician? Porque nuestra gente que nos está escuchando va a decir, está bien, eso suena muy interesante. ¿Cómo, pero ¿cómo, ¿cómo me beneficio ¿cómo yo? ¿Cómo beneficio yo personalmente <risa> con completar el formulario del censo? ¿no? Y ese es un puntito que tenemos brevemente y Jesse puede you know, también comentar sobre esto. Uh, pero en primer lugar, sus niños, si usted tiene niños, por ejemplo, que van a la escuela, um, la, la, la forma en cómo nuevas escuelas son edificadas son basados en estos números de construcción, censo. Es construcción es de la, el, la, el, el tema de la sobrepoblación estudiantil en muchos planteles es precisamente eso, porque todos los años ingresan más niños a los colegios, niños que quizás no se hicieron contar anteriormente, en años anteriores, o niños que vienen de otros lugares, pero sí. ya están acá, sí. y ya están punto, acá. Y el punto sobre esto es que, por eso es que tomamos, la, igual dar otros ejemplos, pero quiero enfatizar el hecho de que por eso es que tomamos la información. No es para buscarte a ti más tarde o tocar tu puerta más tarde y saber dónde está y qué estás haciendo. De la es única para manera que me van a tocar la puerta es si no contesto. ¿Y eso? ¿Y tú qué tocar en la puerta? Yo, fíjate que, eh, después hablamos de eso, pero... <risa> Pero bueno, no, sí. obviamente no, obviamente, si se hace tan fácil electrónicamente, si se hace tan fácil electrónicamente, pues eh, básicamente eh, lo vamos a hacer a, a, así. Okay. Eh, También, y quiero seguir con los beneficios, y disculpa que te interrumpa. Uh, so, si hablamos de, de, de almuerzo gratis, si sus niños, por ejemplo, reciben almuerzo gratis en la escuela, no, de la forma de la, la forma que ellos pueden, reciben ese almuerzo gratis es basado en los números de censo. ¿no? Es muy importantísimo. Uh, so cuando usted comienza a pensar de esos beneficios que ven, lo benefician a usted y a su familia, si usted tiene servicio de salud, ¿verdad? Como Medicaid o Medicare, también eso está basado en el número del censo. Y eso es el punto no, pero que fíjate, que algo, sepa. Exactamente. Algo que te quería mencionar es, eh, por ejemplo, eh, yo, ¿no? Si tú me preguntas salud, eh, esto, lo otro, yo te voy a decir no, no. No, yo no utilizo ninguno de esos servicios porque, y lo, y lo digo y lo recalco, mi hijo ya no va al colegio, no va a escuela pública, etcétera. Pero esto es para los próximos 10 años. ¿Qué tal si en los próximos 10 años soy abuela? 
Y entonces ya tengo un nieto o nieta que va a la escuela pública. De eso se trata, por eso me tengo que hacer contar en el día de hoy, porque es para el futuro, no es para ahorita, no es en este momento, es para la, la, los años venideros. Tenemos en la línea ya uh, de MC311 a Hilda. Hola Hilda, buenas tardes, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo tú estás? Adelante. Hola. ¿Cómo estás, dona? ¿Todo bien aquí? Ay, qué bueno, me alegro. Nosotros acá hablando del censo 2020. Exacto, exacto. sí. Nosotros aquí también para decirles que estamos listos para tomar sus llamadas referente al censo. Um, el último censo en el 2010, nuestro centro de servicio al cliente acababa de comenzar, así es que no tuvimos muchas llamaditas, pero desde entonces hemos tenido más de 200 mil llamadas en, de nuestros um, residentes que hablan español y um, como les dije, estamos listos para a tomar cualquier llamada que tengan sobre acceso a información o ya sea por internet o por en línea o cómo participar en el censo del 2020 información sobre preguntas que, que sean frecuentes que o quieran um, respuestas y estamos aquí de lunes a viernes de 7 de la mañana a 7 de la noche Perfecto, pues nada, me imagino que ya están listos porque sé que ustedes estaban llevando a cabo el esfuerzo de coordinación ¿no? con nuestra oficina de relaciones comunitarias, también, bueno, ustedes son parte de información pública, eh, de manera de que ustedes mismos pues tengan todo lo que es la base de datos actualizada precisamente para asistir a nuestros residentes, sobre todo los que hablan español, que pueden eh, no, no, no lo vamos a decir que no llamen al buró del censo, porque obviamente al buró del censo lo pueden llamar, aquí está Daniel mirándome como que, ah, al buró del censo lo pueden llamar con preguntas y también para la línea de español, pero si las personas necesitan información y quieren llamar a nivel local, pues tienen la confianza de que tienen a nuestro centro de MC311 con nuestras operadoras, le digo yo, pero son eh, representantes de servicio al cliente de MC311 que hablan español, que son bilingües y que les puede dirigir específicamente con estos temas. Así que ya you guys ready, les llegó coronavirus y el censo 2020 la misma semana a MC311. ¿Qué tal? Okay, perfecto, muchísimas gracias. Gracias, gracias a ti, Hilda, gracias. Saludos, Saludo. muchísimas gracias por sintonizar y llamarnos en el día de hoy. Eh, para recapitular un momentito, porque quedan unos cuatro minutos, siempre esta media hora se va volando, eh, vamos a recordarle, eh, comenzando pasado mañana, día 12 de marzo, van a recibir la primera carta, la carta no, no viene a nombre suyo, viene, no, viene dirigida a la propiedad, eh, con la invitación a participar. El sitio web me dicen que es My Census My 2020 Census uh, My 2020 Census uh, .gov. Yeah. Ok. My, la palabra My 2020 Census .gov va a ser el sitio donde todos vamos a poder ingresar a partir del próximo jueves eh, para contestar el, el cuestionario del censo. Si usted quiere asistencia en español, eh, puede llamar al número 1-800 que va a estar en esa carta para contestarlo vía telefónica o pedir el formulario en español. Si usted no contesta, eh, de ahorita a finales de este mes de marzo va a recibir dos notificaciones adicionales y después dos más en el mes de abril. La cuarta viene con el cuestionario en inglés. Si usted es una de esas personas que a partir de esta semana recibe el cuestionario de papel en español, pues le exhortamos contestarlo lo antes posible. La importancia del Censo 2020 es algo que estamos recalcando, no solamente a nivel de nuestro condado de Montgomery, sino a nivel nacional y sobre todo acá en nuestra zona metropolitana, todas las jurisdicciones adyacentes a nosotros, al condado de Montgomery. Pero acá queremos que todos cuenten en Montgomery. Y con esto quiero finalizar. ¿Tienes el mensaje de nuestro ejecutivo por ahí, Patricia? ¿Listo? ¿Ready to go? Ok. Un último mensajito rápido, Jesse, antes de poner el mensaje del ejecutivo. Eh, que todo el mundo cuenta, como lo dirá uh, Mark Elbert, el ejecutivo. Gracias por estar en sintonía con nosotros también vía telefónica, Jesse. Jesse Mejía, nuestro enlace latino acá en el condado de Montgomery. Acá nuestro ejecutivo Mark Elrich en nuestro idioma, recordándonos que esta semana es de suma importancia acá. Y si usted no contesta, pues ahí le tocarán la puerta. Saludos. Les habla Mark Elrich, ejecutivo de condado Montgomery. Le pido a todas las personas que viven en Montgomery tomar unos minutos y contestar el censo. La información que usted comparte con el censo es privada, confidencial y no es compartida con otras agencias. De su colaboración 
depende los fondos que recibimos por parte del gobierno federal y estatal. Dinero que utilizamos para los servicios y programas que benefician a nuestros residentes. Les pido que se animen a contestar el censo y contar a todas las personas que viven en sus casas. Todos contamos en Montgomery. Y bueno, ahí lo escucharon. ¿Qué te pareció? Ninguna otra jurisdicción de esta zona, nadie hace mensaje en español del Ejecutivo. Un tremendo aplauso al Ejecutivo de Condado, muy trabajo. Ah, ¿qué, ¿Qué tal? Esa fue ¿Qué tal? Tu idea, ¿verdad? ¿Eh? No, 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 esa no fue mi idea. Ok, eh, bueno, muchísimas gracias por esa sintonía. Ya saben, eh, en cuanto al tema del censo, para más información, pueden visitar nuestro sitio web, montgomerycountymd.gov, diagonal censos, llamar a nuestras operadoras al 311, o por supuesto, esto visitar el sitio web 2020census.gov diagonal es que es oficial la página en español del buro del censo gracias por esa sintonía en el tema del coronavirus eh, quería finalizar el programa dejándole saber a nuestros residentes del condado que una vez más manténganse informados de fuentes fidedignas eh, información que sea sólida y por supuesto nuestro sitio web del condado montgomerycountymd.gov es el sitio formal eh, del gobierno del condado de Montgomery, también nuestras redes sociales en Facebook somos Montgomery County Government para que se pueda mantener informado de los acontecimientos acá en eh, la jurisdicción local pues estamos colaborando ahorita con el estado de Maryland que es el que lleva el liderazgo en cuanto a los casos que se están suscitando en nuestro estado de Maryland Montgomery County MD punto GOV. gracias y buenas tardes gracias Daniel gracias a ti y hasta aquí su espacio Montgomery al día gracias por su amable sintonía y será entonces la gente cree que soy basura pero están equivocados hoy soy una lata de aluminio pero algún día podría ser un estadio I'm Amy Harbison. Welcome to Seniors Today, a monthly program produced by the Commission on Aging. I'm talking with Mickey Gordon, Assistant CEO for the Jewish Council for the Aging, about how they've adapted their employment services during COVID-19 and the employment resources available to 50 plus job seekers. Hi, Mickey, how are you? Good, thank you for having me today. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our so pleasure. You have been known each year um, in the 50 plus market as doing these wonderful expos and COVID struck and you had to adapt. So tell us what you've been doing uh, while COVID's been uh, with us. Well, you're absolutely right. And thanks to Montgomery County, we were able to transition to virtual 50 plus employment expos. And instead of just doing one, which was always very well received in the spring, usually during um, you know, May, we are doing one a month and these are all virtual. And I know that you're gonna be putting the link online so that people can see the, um, the web address. But we had our first one, November 17th, we had 892 people who registered We had two workshops, which are on the link on the website that people can download. We list all of the employers and the community resources, and we will be ongoing. So as we do each month, we won't be taking anyone off. We leave it all up there so that anyone who may not have been able to attend or for whatever reason missed something will always have these resources. The next one is December 15th, and we will have two different new workshops one on LinkedIn, a, beginning, a beginner's guide to LinkedIn, and the other one is going to um, help you with resources to re-enter the job market. 
And after each expo, as I said earlier, we will be leaving the presentations on the website for everyone to be able to see. What we do is during the time when each of the employers make their presentations, in the chat room, people are able to ask questions, and we're, we really were able to answer almost everything and um, assist people with re-entering the job market. That's so, right. What do you find people need most? What are the services they're most craving right now? As far as employment? Yes. Oh, okay, so we did do a survey because I wanted to have feedback from all of those who participated. And most people are looking for remote, which isn't a surprise, remote employment. Um, a lot of the people told us they were completely unemployed. They were looking for part-time, not necessarily full-time, but remote um, jobs that could assist them. And we tell this to each of the employers, and then they were able to, to relate to the, um, the job seekers what jobs were available. Now, understandably, not every company is hiring, just like they did pre-COVID, and this is such this is so in flux that it changes almost on a dime. So jobs that could be available today may not be available in a week, but that's why we leave all of these contact informations on the website so people can continuously check and see what's available. That's good. Mm -hmm. You also have, besides these expos, you have ongoing programs to support people. One of them is called the Career Gateway. Can you tell us a little bit about that program? Yes, the Career Gateway program is a job search training program for people who are 50 plus, and this is also um, done uh, remotely, you know, visual. We did it online. We were able to transition that program, and it is, it helps you search for employment. It assists you with not only having a mentor to help you search and resume reviewing and talking about, you know, it's a new world, interviewing with people on Zoom. So um, not sure what my background looks like here, but telling you how to approach it, what kind of Zoom etiquette you need, you know, what kind of connectivity you need. It is a 30 hour class with a small group of people that's very interactive so that people get to know each other. And that website is also, um, should be posted, so that the Career Gateway Manager is Jody Rash. All of this information not only um, will be posted today for you, but it's also on the JCA website, www.accessjca.org. And there are different sessions all throughout the year. We have one going on, the next one will be in January, and then March, then April, then June. And we thank the county for being so kind to us to allow us to to keep, continue this almost, you know, year round. So people should just really be checking your website regularly. Correct. So they can not only tap into the next dates, but the resources that you're keeping online. And it sounds like you're offering great opportunities, especially for those who are currently unemployed to just hone their skills, continuing to develop their skills, to look at their resume several times over, to look at their LinkedIn in a new way and get themselves to really be competitive. So that's great. Um, and this is a wonderful way of networking. And because each individual in the Career Gateway class is given a mentor, you know, it's, it's very different now the way somebody is doing a resume and presenting themselves and branding themselves. And so we try to give as many, as you said, resources and to hone their skills. Sometimes just your volunteer skills are really needed now in a remote paid employment. Yeah, it's a brand new world. It's really a brand new world. So let's make sure that we're giving everybody the website and a phone number, any, any direct lines as quickly as we can so that they can tap into your resources and uh, make sure they're keeping up with your next training sessions. Well, everything, as I said, is on our website, www.accessjca.org. And then if you look under news and events and under employment, there's specific sites for each one for the expos. And each time people need to register for each expo. And for Career Gateway, we also have a CSEP program, Senior Community Service Employment Program. This is for seniors in Montgomery County and Frederick County who are at 125% of poverty level. 
and it, it's a three-pronged program. We help these interns get jobs, and we place them in nonprofits and government agencies. Wonderful. Vicki, you are a font of information. I wish we had more time, but uh, thank you so much for letting us know about the amazing services you're providing during COVID for those 50 plus looking for employment and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. You are loved. You are valued. You are resilient. <laughs> you got this. You are there for them. We are here for you. Find free care guides at aarp.org slash caregiving. Hmm, maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made her college years happen. Watch out. Opening that education savings account when she was little. Spearheading a campus tour. And another, and another, and another, and another. Bam! Deciphering financial aid. She was like, what? Well, now she's like, yeah! you waste planning for college. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Home fire drills give your family a plan of action. In a home fire, you may have less than two minutes to get out. So when you drill, show everyone two ways out of the house, pick a safe meeting spot, and get there in under two minutes. Then practice home fire drills at least twice a year. You can even make them fun. So everyone knows the sound and exactly what to do when they hear a smoke alarm. Go to ready.gov slash fire drill and learn how to prepare your family for home fires. At any age, a medical crisis could leave you too ill to make your own health care decisions. Advanced care planning offers the gift of peace of mind for you and your loved ones when critical decisions must be made and you can't speak for yourself. Here to talk about why every adult should have the conversation is advanced care planning expert, Jane Markley. Hi, Jane. Thanks for joining us today. Good, good morning. Thank you for having me. Well, I would imagine that with COVID, there's even more urgency than ever for people to be taking care of advanced directives. You're absolutely right, Amy. The COVID has, has increased people's awareness as to the importance of having their advanced directives and identifying what it is that's important to them so that if they should get COVID and end up in a hospital, they have an advanced directive that they can share with the healthcare team at the hospital. And, uh, and their, their families will also know what it is that they want so that although they can't be with them, they can communicate to the um, healthcare workers what kind of care uh, that they would have wanted. And it's showing that, you know, I think a lot of people think advanced directives are only for older adults, but really mm -hmm. this is proving that this is for, everyone needs to be thinking about this. Sure, an advanced directive is something that everyone age 18 and above should have. They should have that conversation with their loved ones about what's important to them. What kind of care would they want to receive? And what, what kind of values and beliefs do they have that may, portend what kind of care they would want. And let's talk about advanced directives. What does that even mean? What are people what needing to do, fill out? Okay, it's not just a document. It's the conversation along with the document. And that's important for people to know. For many years, people have just checked boxes and said, oh, I got the document done. I never have to deal with this ever again. And that's not the case. This is an ongoing activity. This is something that you need to build into your communications with your loved ones. What's important to you? Yes, an advanced directive is the document and it's the way we can pass the information along to others. But an advanced directive includes two things. One, it includes the well, really three things. First, it includes that conversation that I'm talking about where you talk with your loved ones about what's important. And then it is your living will, i.e. what kind of care you would like to receive. And most importantly is the durable power of attorney for health care as different from the durable 
power of attorney for finance, where you name your healthcare agent, who is the person who will be able to speak for you legally if you can no longer speak for yourself. And tell us a little bit about that conversation. What might it look like? Because I'm sure many people are uncomfortable having the conversation. A lot of people are uncomfortable. That's usually the, the sticking point of doing this. But it's conversations can be brought up under a lot of terms. Um, we, we watch famous people who die or get ill and don't have any advanced directive and we hear about it and we see it, it's a perfect opportunity to bring it up in your family to say, well, gee, you know, they didn't have it and it really caused a lot of problems. How are we going to deal with this? What is it we're going to do? Once you as an individual have decided that you want to do your advanced directive, it's great to bring your family in and talk to them. Uh, you need their help. You want, go to them and say, I really could use your help in talking through this. Uh, and I, you need to know what is important to me so that if for some reason I end up in the hospital, and you're right, it's not just for seniors, it's not just for people with horrible diseases, it's for every one of us. Anyone who goes out on the roadways in this day and age takes the risk of not coming home that night and needing health care somewhere outside of the home. And so it's important that everyone have this. It's particularly important for the 18-year-old group, too. Um, so if folks have got children and grandchildren, having their plans in place and shared with the rest of the family can be extremely important. And I, you've said something that really has stuck with me, uh, which is not today, but I think a previous conversation, I really stuck with me that you, for those of us who are over 55 plus, <laughs> um, that you're saying that it's as much for our children as it is for us, and maybe even more so. Say a little bit more about why it's so important for them. Well, it, it's so important because Americans used to talk about this over the dinner table because we used to, people used to die at home. People used to die and then be laid out in the parlor for everyone to come around for a wake or whatever. And we don't do that anymore. We've pushed it away into hospitals and nursing homes and places where people don't have the opportunity to, to talk to their loved ones and be around their loved ones. So having that conversation is, um, is, is not that easy to start sometimes because it isn't familiar to us. Um, but having that conversation with the younger population is, is important because nowadays, because people are aging and living so long, they are surviving longer sometimes than their own children. Mm. And that's where it becomes extremely important because if you've not had the conversation, you don't know what kind of care that they would want towards the end or if something untoward occurred to them, what we call the crisis occurs. And I would also imagine that it's just important, you're making it easier for your children by not in the middle of a crisis, having them have to first think about these things. Like you're taking a big burden off of them. Absolutely. And in fact, that burden we have um, been researching for over 20 years now. And those people who die, the family members of the people who die without an advanced directive, in other words, the family had to guess what to do and hope they were doing the right thing for mom or dad, those people, 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, are still having psychological problems related to the fact that they didn't know. And they didn't, weren't able to say, yes, this is what mom wanted, so let's go down this path. They were guessing. And the problem is they will never know if they did the right thing because it's too late. It isn't too late until it is. And when it is, it really is too late. So it's important that the conversations occur early and often. That's great. Is there a good resource for people to find out more information if from this conversation, they're eager to have the conversation, begin a conversation, and also see what they need to fill out. Yes, there, there are numbers of uh, resources out there. I think the probably the prime one I refer most people to is what's called The Conversation Project. And that's one place. Other, you can go to my website and, and find all these resources as well. 
uh, and I'm more than happy to help anybody um, work through the process of facilitating those conversations with they and their loved ones. What's that, what's that address? My website is www.mjmarkley.com, just my name. And that will bring you up to, uh, to my website where you'll get more information there. Perfect. That's great. Well, Jane, thank you so much for coming on today to talk about this really important, critically important, really timely topic. And um, we look forward to speaking with you again under better circumstances, for sure. Absolutely. My mother was always very familiar with her neighborhood, but one day she stopped at the stop sign for much longer than usual, and uh, she didn't know whether she should go forward or, or turn, and she wasn't even really sure where she was at. It was very unsettling for her. I felt so much better after my son told me, Mom, I don't want you to worry or be afraid. I'll be there for you, and we'll figure it out. I first saw a turtle, my heart was full. Not anything but lonely. We had this like deep connection, this heart connection. He just wants to be close to you and part of your life. Every day with turtle is a perfect day. When I'm holding her, it makes me feel calmer. I think everything he does shows how much he loves us. When we adopt a shelter pet, we discover they're a little bit of a lot of things. But they're all pure, pure love. 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 The pandemic has made it very challenging for those financially burdened older adults who are renting in Montgomery County. Today we welcome Frank DeMarais, Deputy Director, Affordable Housing for the Department of Housing and Community Affairs, who will share some of the challenges, but also some of the available resources to older adults who are renting in the county. Thank you so much for joining us today, Frank. Well, thank you, Amy. So, what are the most immediate issues and concerns for older renters, particularly low-income older renters? Concerns are the shared concerns of all of our rental community, which is that with the pandemic, with the income loss and the higher costs that people have experienced, they're having trouble maintaining their rent. And we believe that as many as 20,000 county residents are having trouble maintaining or behind on their rent and that we need uh, to continue to support them, understanding what their options are, um, and helping them to avoid uh, falling further behind uh, and uh, facing eviction. And it's particularly bad during this COVID crisis. I, I understand that there's been a moratorium um, on evictions. Can you say a little bit more about what's been going on in this landscape? With the COVID emergency declared by the governor in March, uh, the governor implemented a restriction on evictions for any household that could demonstrate that they'd had income loss uh, due to COVID impact, either loss of job uh, or higher costs um, or requirements for childcare. Um, and this is a eviction prevention when you go to court. So it is a case a specific action. Not much you can do before you get called to court on that. But across the county, we have a variety of resources, including rental assistance payments are available. And it's critical for anyone with concerns about this to understand the county and the state have stepped up using generally federal money to make financial assistance and counseling available uh, to any tenant that has any concerns, uh, whether or not it's eviction related. And what happens if someone is called to court? I mean, that sounds very intimidating to the average yeah. person. What, what, what is, how are they helped in the process? Well, it, the fundamentals are anyone who is one month behind on their rent can be uh, 
summons, uh, the landlord can sue to possess the property. Um, if anyone receives a notice of a summons, a notice of court appointment, there's three things that they should do. First, they should contact the county, uh, our Office of Landlord Tenant Affairs, and or the nonprofits and Maryland Legal Aid that are available to help them understand that. They need to understand the process. Then they need to prepare, and they absolutely should understand these protections available against eviction if you can demonstrate income loss, but only if you can demonstrate income loss. And then the key thing is to show up at court, um, and the court will hear uh, different arguments and defenses uh, that cannot be made unless the person shows up. But it's very important to know what your options are and be prepared um, and then to attend. It can be very scary, uh, but the more you learn early, the better off you'll be able to handle it. Absolutely. What if people can't demonstrate that they lost income, but they have under hardship? What do they do? Um, the protections that are available are from the governor's executive order, very specifically demonstrated income loss. If someone has not had a demonstrated income loss in the COVID emergency period, um, then the counseling, uh, Maryland Legal Aid, will help them understand how to work with their landlord. Uh, we do have financial assistance that could help to bridge some of the gap. Uh, we're hoping that our landlords are entering into payment agreements and working with their tenants in this period, landlords do not want to evict. Uh, it's very costly, and they end up with a vacant unit at a very difficult time. So there are ways to work with your landlord, but the eviction prevention is only there if you have a loss of income from COVID. It also does not protect if your lease expires. And if you get a notice to vacate, 60 days notice to vacate at the expiration of your lease, and you're unable to leave, the landlord can sue for tenant holding over action and can evictions are occurring for tenants who are unable to relocate. So it's a difficult time with the best information, again, uh, available through the county's website and through our Office of Landlord Tenant Affairs. And during COVID, the county is absolutely open to support. We've extended uh, additional funds for nonprofits, Maryland Legal Aid and others to really support. Um, but it is it's very difficult. Uh, path to navigate. Yeah, tell us a little bit about your nonprofit partners. Who do right. you work with and how can the, right. the general public tap in? The best resource right now is our county website, montgomerycountymd.gov forward slash renters. So montgomerycountymd.gov forward slash renters has the list of all the organizations that are supporting tenants. We have the Renters Alliance, Housing Initiative Partnership, Latino Economic Development Corp, the CASA Organization, uh, the, the um, Maryland Legal Aid, and Maryland Legal Aid is available at the courthouse and does represent anyone who has an emergency um, uh, eviction uh, action uh, against them. What do we most want to communicate to people Frank, um, during this time, for those people that are without without a job right now or falling behind, what should they what should they know? Well, again, the very very important first step is to get information, um, and our website's a good place to go. Uh, the three one one general county information line. Anyone with rent concerns can call three one one, ask for information about rental assistance ask for landlord tenant affairs. If they have an emergency, they can ask for housing stabilization at 311. They should get information. Uh, they should know that they're not alone. Uh, they should know there is a process. There are rules and structures and things that landlords have to do. You cannot be evicted without a court order. Your landlord can write you all kinds of letters, but until the court order says uh, that you will be evicted, uh, you are protected. The county has funds available to help offset some of this. Um, and in the event that people are going to lose their homes, the county does have support to help people transition and relocate. So our focus is first, uh, you know, stop the evictions, work with the landlords, work something out. And secondly, uh, to assist uh, households, help people understand, you know, when they can 
have to or when they need to relocate, uh, what kind of assistance available from the county. Terrific. Any, any other final words? Do we think this moratorium will hold as COVID is still here for the foreseeable future? Um, as long as the governor has a state of emergency and we have no indications that that's going to be lifted in the next two or three months, um, this governor's protection for failure to pay rent evictions will remain. But the day he lists that eviction, anyone who had gone through court and received protection will lose that protection all at once. So there's a lot of concern about that, but it will take some time. Anyone who heard about the federal protection that was issued by the CDC, that is no longer a factor in Maryland. Uh, the courts actually are not hearing failure to pay rent cases in the month of December uh, through the end of December. So there are no judgments being issued until cases are restarted in January. It will take some time for them to catch up. They had this shut down earlier this year, reopened at the end of August, and then shut down again in the middle of November. So there is a time for our tenants to understand their rights, prepare, and particularly to work with the landlord, work with our nonprofits to help with counseling, workout plans. Uh, there's not going to be enough money to pay everybody's rent, but there are ways to work through this. Terrific. Well, Hank, thank you so much. I think you have given really important information for a lot of people out there. And um, thank you for joining us today. And that's sure. it for Seniors Today. You can access a lot of information for seniors by going to our senior website at montgomerycountymd.gov slash seniors, or you can call the Senior Resource Line at 240-777-3000. Thanks so much for joining us on Seniors Today. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. Have you been to a park managed by the Montgomery County Department of Parks lately? If you live in the county, chances are yes. In fact, there's a county park within two miles of your home. With more than 400 parks and amenities across 37,000 acres of land, the Montgomery County Park System is often cited as one of the prime reasons people choose to live here. And especially during the COVID-19 outbreak of 2020, the parks proved to be an essential resource for those residents. Its history goes back almost a century. Montgomery Parks, as it's called, is a department of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. The MNC PPC is a bi-county agency established in 1927 by the Maryland General Assembly. Now based in Riverdale, the commission was set up to administer parks and planning in both Montgomery and Prince George's counties. The idea was to facilitate the development of the land that was close into Washington, D.C. and Prince George's and Montgomery County, and the park system was an important part of that because uh, the Lee family and others who own property in the area wanted to create a uh, commission, a bureaucratic structure, and a park system that would help them to create those first suburban subdivisions. And that meant turning the stream valleys into parkland creating a place where water and sewer infrastructure could be located, creating some parks for those early subdivisions. As the county evolved into the 40s, the 50s, after the, after the war, and Washington, D.C. became a major international city, and Montgomery County became a bedroom community, uh, the park system had to evolve along with it. So as the population grew, uh, we created more recreational parks. We had the need for more athletic fields. The 1970s and 80s brought a focus on environmental stewardship as well as smart growth community planning. 
by the time we reached the 2000s, it became clear that people wanted to live in urban centers. So uh, we found a need to respond to that desire by developing more urban parks. Uh, it was common back when I was designing parks that we would be getting uh, 10 or 20 acres of land in dedication because a farm or a large tract of land would be developing into suburban homes and uh, we would get the property and develop the park in typical fashion with athletic fields and playgrounds and basketball courts and trails. Uh, today it's a whole different ball game. That type of greenfield de development really is done in Montgomery County. Now our growth is occurring and is projected to continue to occur in ur more urban areas. The MNC PPC oversees the Montgomery County Department of Parks, the Montgomery County Planning Department, the Prince George's County Department of Parks and Recreation, and the Prince George's County Planning Department. The MNC PPC does not operate the Montgomery County Department of Recreation. That falls under the county's executive branch. The Commission's ten members include five residents of Montgomery County and five of Prince George's. Planning board members are appointed by the Montgomery County Council. The planning department works hand in hand with the Parks Department. The county executive recommends its budget and the council approves it. And that carries an arms. The county council approves the parks budget every single year. So we have to work together to figure out how much funding is necessary for maintenance of parks, for activation, for new activities at parks, and for acquisition of new parks. For many years, Montgomery Parks was headquartered in Silver Spring at a former elementary school. It recently relocated to Wheaton. Montgomery Parks includes divisions that not only handle park management and development, but natural resources stewardship, wildlife ecology, trail planning, archaeology, history and cultural resources, facilities management, and policing. We have 94 sworn officers and 21 civilians that help augment the mission of park police. So our officers, you know, we patrol roughly 500 acres of commission property, and we do that in various modes of travel. We have motorcycle, horseback, foot, vehicle, bicycle, and we even have a boat. We also have 37, 38 volunteers. You're all in. Serving more than a million Montgomery County residents, along with visitors from all over the region and the world, Montgomery Parks recognizes the great geographic, economic, racial, and ethnic diversity here. Parks and rec agencies at their core have always been focused on equity, but now we run all of our capital investment through an equity lens. We look at all kinds of demographic data. Our goal is that we want to make sure our parks are available and accessible and welcoming to everyone. In fact, I'm very proud that we've spent a lot of money making both programs accessible and our facilities accessible in the parks. Sustainability is a priority too. While environmental concerns have always been on the forefront, they're ramping up even higher and Montgomery Parks has become a leader in sound environmental practices. The big area that we're using to make things more sustainable is renewable energy. And as you can see here, we are at South Germantown Recreation Park. We have a solar field here. We also have another solar field at Rock Creek Regional Park. And these parks combined will offset 2,500 tons of greenhouse gases annually. So that can convert to about enough electricity to power roughly 400 homes in a typical year. Also, in addition to our solar fields, we have a couple parks that have solar panels on the roof of some of the small buildings. Another uh, sustainability measure is rainwater harvesting. We have two big sites. Our, probably our biggest one is Brookside Gardens. We have a 25,000 gallon underground cistern for collecting rainwater, storing it, and then ultimately using it to water all of the plants and the rose bushes at Brookside. From solar panel projects to stream monitoring, from mowing fields to managing nature centers, from running the carousel to renovating playgrounds, there's a lot to do. The FY21 total operating budget for the Parks Department is approximately $130 million, 
and that includes more than 700 full-time employees and 400 seasonal workers and contractors. The Montgomery Parks Foundation also helps raise money and provides support for the parks. And then there are the hundreds of park volunteers. We're very fortunate in parks to have a huge volunteer support group that helps out with many volunteer opportunities. Unfortunately, during COVID times, we've had to put the programs on hold, but we hope to eventually bring volunteers back. Um, some of the volunteer activities that happen in the parks is we have people help out with our beautiful gardens at Brookside. We have people help out at our gardens at our nature centers. We have archaeology volunteers. We have historic property volunteers. Our big shows like Wings of Fancy and the light show at Brookside Gardens and our Harvest Festival, unfortunately this year we've had to put them on hold. So one of our most popular amenities, of course, are trails. And we're very fortunate to have a huge volunteer program for trails as well. We have trail rangers who do inspections quarterly. And whenever they're out there, they let us know if there's trees and stuff across the trails. As of August 2020, there are 424 parks in the system. And they range from huge regional parks, such as Black Hill and Boyd's, to small pocket parks, such as Acorn Park and Silver Spring. In between, there are recreational parks, stream valley parks, local parks, neighborhood parks, special parks, and conservation parks. And don't forget about the ones for our beloved pets. In addition, Montgomery Parks supports more than 250 miles of trails, both paved and natural surface, and four lakes. The largest is over 500 acres. There are 363 athletic fields, 303 outdoor tennis courts and two indoor tennis centers, 276 playgrounds, 229 basketball courts, and 21 volleyball courts. Adding to the opportunities, count in 11 community gardens, seven cricket fields, four golf courses, three skate parks, two ice skating complexes, two archery ranges, and two miniature trains. And don't forget about the historic carousel, miniature golf course, driving range, splash playground, Tai Chi court, BMX track, and a full service campground. Through public-private partnerships, there are six equestrian centers, a soccer complex, a baseball stadium, an outdoor ropes course, and more. Four nature centers and a nature classroom keep things chugging along too as well as four event centers that can host weddings and other gatherings. Dozens of historic sites and museums explore our collective history. Montgomery Parks has five premier historic sites and museums within there. We have out in Clarksburg the Kingsley Schoolhouse, our historic one-room schoolhouse built in the late 1890s. We have, as you're coming south, Oakley Cabins African American Museum and Park, one of the oldest of the historic sites within the county. And we have in Durwood the Agricultural History Farm Park, which houses our living exhibits, our farm animals, our pigs, our goats, our chickens. And at Woodlawn Manor Cultural Park is one of our newer museums, the Woodlawn Museum, which focuses on Quaker heritage and the Underground Railroad Experience Trail Hike and the Underground Railroad Experience, particularly that in Montgomery County. The newest of our historic sites is the new Josiah Henson Museum and Park in North Bethesda. Henson was an inspiration for Harriet Beecher Stowe's landmark 1852 novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Guests will visit the historic plantation house and new museum to learn about the hardships endured by enslaved people in Montgomery County. Another venue is Brookside Gardens in Wheaton. This award-winning 50-acre botanical garden features both local and exotic specimens of plants, flowers, trees, and wildlife. I came to horticulture through trees, and having the ability to look at the trees that I planted, and now look at them and how big they are and how much pleasure they're giving people, it's, it's not a tribute to me, but it's it's amazing that I've been able to give this gift to people because that's really all I wanted to do. Educational opportunities abound at Brookside as well as throughout the parks including nature classes for kids, summer camps, gardening lectures, botanical drawing classes, and environmental workshops. In previous years 
Annual events such as the Garden of Lights, the park's half marathon, and Mudfest allowed everyone from the community to join in. Rounding out the options for fun are the activity buildings and picnic shelters that are available to rent for birthday parties and other events. Of course, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there were no parties nor public events. Montgomery Parks, like other county agencies, had to close up most everything. Even the basketball hoops were taken down. To stop the spread of the disease, nature centers were closed, playgrounds were cordoned off, and ice rinks were shuttered. The Wings of Fancy Butterfly exhibit has been open to visitors every summer for more than 20 years. For the safety of everybody, uh, we just needed to postpone the exhibit for this year. Thankfully, the grounds at Brookside Gardens remained open. In fact, the entire park's trail system was available during the quarantine and well used. The benefits of fresh air and exercise were never more obvious. So our trails were particularly popular venues for people getting out and walking and exercising and enjoying nature. But the interesting thing is they became so crowded that we thought we needed to do something and our, our, that something was to open up seven miles of parkways. Other aspects of Montgomery Parks continued during the quarantine. Classes and camps went virtual, while naturalists and historians educated the public online. Plant sales were held curbside and with no contact. Management worked remotely and conducted meetings and planning sessions online. Behind the scenes, buildings were updated and cleaned, and fields were renovated. Montgomery Park's amenities slowly reopened according to safety rules and guidelines set by the state and the county. Unfortunately, the quarantine delayed employees moving into the new and much anticipated Montgomery Park's headquarters. Completed in August 2020, the 14-story LEED Platinum rated building in downtown Wheaton provides new offices for Montgomery Parks as well as the planning board, the planning department and other county agencies. This state-of-the-art building will allow more collaboration among agencies and serve as a town center for Wheaton's revitalization. Community, again, the priority. Please check the Montgomery Parks website for more information, updates, rentals, classes, and more. Welcome to Animals Matter. I'm Susan Kennedy, and I'm here with Jackie, who is a service dog in training through Warrior Canine Connection, a nonprofit here in Montgomery County that raises service dogs for veterans. And speaking of service dogs, here in Montgomery County, in our library system, we have a program where four legged friends like Jackie give young people confidence in their reading skills. We will be holding our Read to a Dog program at 4.30 in the program room. Meet Monty and Ace, two tail-wagging tutors who spend their Wednesday afternoons at the Gaithersburg Library. They are part of the Read to a Dog program where young readers come and share a book of their choice to these four-legged friends. We encourage children, uh, mostly kindergarten through uh, second grade, especially for our dogs, um, to come and really just practice their, their reading skills um, in a non-threatening environment. Um, it gives them a chance to not feel intimidated, um, to give them a chance they may not have to read to a dog, um, and just, just to kind of give them a fun experience. Monty and Ace are both retired service dogs. Monty was the companion of Madeline Berry's son, Mark, who passed away last year. After that, Monty, mm -hmm. since he had, they've been together for five years, he really was used to being out and being with people. And he was going, and actually he was going through the grieving process as well. And so I just happened to be up at the library. I saw the sign that said, you know, read to a dog. And I was like, oh, this is great. So I stopped by the librarian and said, you know, hey, this is a retired service dog. I'd really like to be a part of the program. And so they said, absolutely. Ace was a guide dog. When he retired, he went back to live with his puppy raiser, Terry Binder. 
She started volunteering with Reed to a dog because she says he needed a job. She tells us the program not only instills confidence in the young readers, but it also puts some children's fears to rest. The other thing I have found that I wasn't expecting is the kids who are afraid of dogs. These are perfect dogs for them because they're so calm. And so we are doing sort of double duty. We're doing not only the reading part, but we're um, here for kids to learn a little bit about dogs, dogs that are yeah. that are nice, good dogs for them to, to, mm -hmm. to meet. And so we, we uh, get to do both things, I think. There was a bit of a wait to read to Monty and Ace. And each and every one of the bookworms had a story about a dog to share with their captive audience. Go, dog, go. That was so smart. Why did you pick Go, dog, go? Because I like that book. Go, dogs, go. Delight. Why do you like reading to dogs? It's so wonderful. Why did you choose Perfectly Martha? Because it's about dogs, and reading to a dog is basically reading about dogs to a dog. Dogs aren't really listening, but they're interested. How long have you been reading? Mm, since I was three. Oh, goodness. And how old are you now? Seven. So you came to read to the dogs. That made your day really special, didn't it? Definitely. I, I never get to read to my dog. She wouldn't lay like this. No. And just let you read her a book. So Unless she was really tired, so. Yeah. Well, maybe From digging up. And making hole next to hole next to hole next to hole after a hole. <laughs> the Read to a Dog program has a number of benefits, including improving a child's self-esteem and even reducing anxiety or stress. Monty and Ace benefit too, with plenty of love and affection. We've had kids that um, are either you know shy or you know they may not have been as motivated to read, um, and this has been a great opportunity. We've had several parents that have told us that you know it's it's given their kid a new experience to you know open up and be more willing to read, to become a reader. So yes, we have. It's very exciting to hear those kinds of things. Dogs can teach us about what matters most. And the unconditional acceptance is just what these children need in their journey to become better readers for many years to come. That was a good story. Just off Big Woods Road in Dickerson, you'll find a farm that's nestled in the agricultural reserve that's like no other. Madison Field simply takes your breath away. The 400 acre farm functions primarily as an equestrian facility. But what makes Madison Field so unique yeah. It's a lot of work. Yep, I've done before. Is it provides therapeutic and vocational training opportunities. I've been on a couple of horses before. For children and adults with physical and intellectual disabilities. This farm is for everybody. It serves the community at large. It serves people with special needs and with, on, with differing abilities. And um, it serves veterans as well. It's, it's intended to be inclusive and we're making this place something special, that's for sure. Ava is a participant in the Madison Fields Therapeutic Riding Program. Is he like your buddy? He's my buddy and my child. Oh. So I love him. <laughs> She's been coming to the farm for more than a year and in that time has formed a special bond with Dakota, a horse she refers to as her baby. So, so what are you doing now? I am grooming him with a curry. One, two, three. Ava comes for riding lessons twice a week at Madison Fields. Good eyes up, look where you're going so that way he can follow your movement. She learns basic horsemanship skills under the guidance of Maggie. A little more walk. Sit down. Her certified Sit down. riding instructor. Down. Yeah. Good. Follow his shoulder up. Down. So we were working on processing steps. Ava came up with her own course that she wanted to ride today. In your drawing you gave me it was a three-step course. So she had to remember all three steps and we turned it into a barrel pattern and she was able to complete it twice. Good. All right, walk on. More walk. Good job. Through the riding program at Madison Fields. Well, give him a pat, tell him he's a good horse. All right, you want to go outside for a walk? Yeah. The horses improve the well-being of people of all ages with different needs. Way to go, Casey. All right, including go those with oh, autism, learning disabilities, animal? and traumatic brain injury. Good. Okay, in this year's budget. Here you go, let's put it back in the tack room. The county council approved grant funding for Madison Fields. Good job. Yeah. Is he, is 
Madonna getting clean or dirty? The funds were used to start a new vocational program that provides structured opportunities for these adults with the goal of learning employable skills for jobs in agriculture. Councilmember Craig Rice is a big supporter of Madison Fields. The reason why the majority of these folks didn't have jobs before is because the expectation was that they couldn't do it exactly, right? And so redefining that for people to make sure that they understand that that couldn't be farther from the truth, that they can do, they can do it. a lot of the same stuff exactly. that we do. We want to educate the county and the students and the elementary kids about the agricultural reserve because it is such an amazing place, an amazing part of this county that, in my opinion, more people need to know about. Sometimes it's good to drive up here on these rustic roads and drive up in these you near know, where these farms are and just get some fresh air. Good job. Was that fun? Yeah. Good. And that agricultural reserve component is something that Craig Rice says makes this program so meaningful. People always assume is that they're just farms and they're commodity farmers that are here. But there's so many other people who are doing so many other different dynamics that still live up to the commitment to support and sustain agriculture to make sure that our environment is thriving but on top of that have an overall social mission that's also there as well. And for Ava, her time spent at Madison Fields is something that definitely makes her shine. And you do a really good job with him. It must make you feel proud. I am proud of myself. I'm proud of Dakota. When we heard the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department had added a canine to its unit, well, we knew we had to meet this four-legged friend who was bringing smiles to folks who were visiting the courthouse. Meet Lacey, the newest recruit in the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department. This four-year-old Labrador retriever won't be fighting crime. She's tasked with an important job as the department's first therapy dog to bring comfort and a smile to someone who might be having a bad day. Because so many people that come in this building are um, in crisis, there's, it's, it's very difficult, you know, a lot of times people come in, they're victims of crimes, uh, they could be the actual defendants in crimes, a lot of children come in this building, uh, and, and we just felt there was so, so much of a need that the, the comfort dog, the facility dog, could really make a difference. Christine Vega is Lacey's handler. They've been a team now for about six months. At one time, she thought about being a canine officer, but it wouldn't have worked with her lifestyle. However, when the opportunity to work with a therapy dog came to her attention, she knew she needed to take action. So when you found out that you'd been chosen mm -hmm. to be her handler and you met her, tell me how that how that went down. So it was fabulous. It was the day before Thanksgiving, so Thanksgiving Eve, and I got the, the news that I had been selected. And Sergeant Stanton said, well, you can wait until the weekend or Monday to come meet Lacey and pick her up. And I said, well, let's go get her tonight. And so literally, this is the first night of... Oh, oh, of, that's how look at Lacey... Lacey just wanted the love. And I fell in love with her. She came up and was right in my arms, her head on my shoulder, and it was like we had been together forever. And that's the picture she, she sent me. Sergeant Stanton is Joe Stanton. I can release the dog to come to me to help. He is the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office Canine Unit Supervisor. Come. He said when Sit. Sheriff Popkin entrusted him with finding the right dog for the job, he had to step outside of his comfort so, zone. It was something new for the sheriff's office uh, and for a trainer, from my perspective as a police dog trainer, it was something different for me. So I had to go out and look for kind of a different type of dog uh, that I'm used to searching for. Patrol dogs are generally really, really high energy dogs. And I needed a dog that was going to be calm in pretty much any scenario that she could re exactly like this. <laughs> like this. Yes. She's friendly. This is Lacey. Lacey yeah. was donated to the Sheriff's Department to provide unconditional Hi. love and affection to victims oh, and their family the members who come to the courthouse on a daily basis. This gentle-faced canine responds to visitors with genuine acceptance. So, like a therapy dog. So that's what she's here for. Just for everybody to pet and say hi to. You guys have a good day. And for those who meet Lacey, it's hard to deny the comfort, the warm welcome and kisses she delivers during stressful times. Sergeant Vega could literally be busy all day long providing 
that sort of comfort level with Lacey on a daily basis because there really is that demand and that need. And we have a, we have a, uh, one thing that we did here in Circuit Court was opened up what we call Kids Spot and it's a, it's a actual daycare center that so the children don't have to go into court and witness some of the awful things that are going on potentially with family. And those kids get to be exposed also to the comfort dog on a daily basis as well. So we've had several incidents where she has intervened with the child. Um, one was right when we first got her. There was a panic alarm coming from our family division. Um, two parents were going through a custody dispute and they had their 12 year old daughter with them. And I responded to the alarm and I saw the little girl there and she was crying and upset and we moved her right over into Kid Spot and she got to interact with Lacey and it was like she had forgotten everything she had witnessed between her parents. The simplicity of the human dog bond is what makes this canine connection so powerful. It's a kinship that has also made an impact on staff at the courthouse. With the people coming through the courthouse, it doesn't matter which side of the law you're on. Um, they light up when they see Lacey and they come over and they want to pet her and then they ask questions and they want to know what she's used for and um, they interact with her. So it's a positive experience for the public. It's what pretty much goes on when Lacey is here in the lobby. Um, with our office, it is interesting to see grown men, deputy sheriffs, um, interact with Lacey because they become a different person. <laughs> they get excited, they're like, where's Lacey? And come over and love on her. So it's just a great thing all around. And in the courthouse, the employees will stop me and say, where's Lacey? Can you come to our floor? Can you come to my office? I went on vacation for a week and a half and I, that's all they asked about was Lacey. Where is she and when can she come back? The requests that we're starting to get from outside in the actual court facility is uh, becoming quite interesting as well. Uh, the, the, these days, I think people kind of tend to walk around with a certain level of stress because somebody, everybody is so overextended. How are you today? <laughs> She's great. Hi, Happy Lacey. it's Friday. Yes. And Lacey and Sergeant Vega just bring an air of magic and it makes a difference in people's lives. Well, that does it for this edition of Animals Matter. If you'd like more information about Warrior Canine Connection, the Read with the Dog program, or Madison Fields, you can visit their websites. For County Cable Montgomery, I'm Susan Kennedy, and on behalf of Jackie, thanks for watching. Up next on the bottom line, it's the end of daylight saving time, and public safety officials want you to be vigilant. Everybody has a role in traffic safety. Pedestrians, bicyclists, and vehicles. We'll visit a Rockville Cafe that dishes up a little bit of soul. We hope people will come and grab a cup of coffee and just, you know, say hello and be a neighbor and be a part of our community. New funding to address the growing mental health needs in our schools. And why it's so important to do now because it's gotten worse. And a weekend project that turned into a community movement. We're thrilled that we can help in a small way. We have no illusions that this is making a dent in all of the equity challenges that we face as a community. But and it's making a real difference for the families that you serve, and that's yeah. what counts. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'm Susan Kennedy. It may not be something that most people think about, but the end of daylight saving time can mean a rise in the number of pedestrian accidents. The time change happens this year on November 1st, and Montgomery County Police want pedestrians and drivers to be aware. We realize that uh, we're in a time of the season uh, where we do see a rise in pedestrian collisions. So we, we try to combat that with education, enforcement, um, and we try to go proactive with things like this. Last year in Montgomery County, there were close to 500 pedestrian crashes. 14 of those were fatal. Statistics show that pedestrians walking around dusk are nearly three times more likely to be struck by cars in the days following the end of daylight saving time. Everybody has a role in traffic safety. Pedestrians, bicyclists, and vehicles. As far as pedestrians are concerned, um, some easy steps are wear things that might be more visible when it gets darker out. Um, even to the extremes of wearing a vest, it, that could help. 
And I get that those are tough things to sometimes do for going to work and things like that, but um, trying to remain as visible as possible is one thing. Two, use sidewalks uh, when they're available and, and walk there and not in the roadway. And when you do have to cross the roadway, try to get to a lighted intersection or a marked crosswalk. And third, avoid distracted walking. Councilmember Evan Glass says with the time change that is happening, everybody needs to be aware of their surroundings. If you are a pedestrian, you know, maybe take the earbuds out, look around and just be aware of when you're crossing the street. I always try to make eye contact with the driver so that I know that we see each other. And let's see what we got here. We have one car stopped and another's going to keep going. You need courage to be able to do this. And it is so important because uh, we can't presume that drivers are seeing everybody who's on, on the street. Um, it's unfortunate to say, but that's just a reality. The county and state have invested in improving intersections with the installation of Hawk beacon signals and rapid flashing beacons. McBain says that folks should be aware that police will be out on the roads enforcing traffic laws to keep our streets safe. We do do enforcement for not only the pedestrian moves, but also um, more often we try to address um, enforcement with the drivers. And so we, like the intersection we are here at Turkey Branch Parkway, we go out and we start monitoring whether vehicles are stopping at these rapid flashing beacons um, and also if they're uh, stopping at, um, at the hawk signals. Um, and so uh, in, in addition, sometimes we have officers posing as pedestrians and actually going out into the roadway. And when we see a violation, we uh, make the stop and cite it. So even though you're getting an extra hour of sleep, Councilmember Glass says to remember those extra Z's come with accountability. There is an extra responsibility, clearly, that pedestrians have to take. Um, but for drivers as well, please take your eyes away from your phone, away from your radio. Um, focus on the road and make sure that when you're in a heavily pedestrian area or anywhere, quite frankly, uh, that you are keeping your eye on the road and looking out for pedestrians. There's a new cafe in downtown Rockville that's open for business. We went with Council President Sydney Katz to visit the Soulful Cafe, where everyone has a place at the table. Tucked away on Monroe Place in Rockville is a little cafe that's full of positive energy. Hello. How are you doing? The Soulful Cafe is located just off the main entrance of the newly opened Main Street Apartments. The cafe is a partnership between Dawson's Market and Main Street. So Dawson's has always been uh, a part of the community. Uh, part of our mission statement is to, to employ 10% of our staff uh, in what we call a difficult to hire category, people that um, tend to have difficulty finding positions because of a disability, something like that. You know, just really right away felt that it was a great marriage between the two different missions and the two companies. The opening of the Main Street Cafe is not only about inclusion, but it also offers great taste. It's real good. Yeah. Yeah. Jillian Copeland is the founder of Main Street. She says the Soulful Cafe gives everyone the opportunity to nourish their mind, body, and soul. I got a crumb wrap and I got a double chocolate chip muffin. Our mission of creating a space for belonging, this is perfectly aligned, right? So bright spaces, um, air, the food and drink, really acai bowls and smoothies and coffee. Uh, uh, a small cappuccino. Soon, so we hope pedestrians will walk by and we hope people will come and grab a cup of coffee and just, you know, say hello and be a neighbor and be a part of our community. And connecting with the community is what Main Street is all about. The cafe serves as a gathering place for county residents looking to support local food. What are you getting? A mean green smoothie. An almond brother. And residents and staff of Main Street use the cafe as home base and time to check in and find out how things are going. So I think it's kind of like a feeling of community as well as a space that they can hang out and enjoy and kind of kick back, relax, and, you know, eat a muffin, have coffee, and, you know, just enjoy the day. Council President Sidney Katz says the Soulful Cafe is not only changing lives, but it's shaping the future. And Montgomery County has such 
is so fortunate, truly is blessed, that we have every opportunity to meet people from every background in, in, every, in every sort of way. And that's what this is all about. We're all, I always say that a community is like a family. And it is. And, we, and in our family, we have various personalities and people who have various uh, abilities and, and, and are good in one thing and not so great in another. It, it's really just a, a wonderful, wonderful feel. It's a place where people want to come and join. They don't want to be here because they're helping someone with a disability. They want to be here because they're stimulated and they're engaged and they're connected and they walk away and their life is richer because they fill their cup and they fill their soul. You can visit the Soulful Cafe at 50 Monroe Place in Rockville. The cafe is open every day except Sunday and Monday at 7 a.m. In this story, we meet a Gaithersburg couple working to build educational equity through their carpentry skills. Desks by Dads is a nonprofit organization that was started by a mom. So Desks by Dads is actually a brainchild of my wife, Jessica. In August, Jess Burales partnered with PTA moms who were working on a virtual learning project. I was sort of in the mindset of thinking, of, you know, about what do kids need to be ready to learn? And it just sort of occurred to me, well, what about desks? And Jess's Honeydew weekend project for her husband, Al, was for him to build a desk. He said, sure. He watched a couple YouTube videos and picked up some materials from Lowe's over the weekend and put a desk to together in about an hour. It sort of took off from there. Took off it did. After posting pictures on Facebook, dads all over the county volunteered to help. Um, great to see how other people kind of take my idea and kind of ran with it and made it their own. That's really fun to see. We've had so many volunteers uh, improve on the design, you know, add their own spin on it. Uh, to be honest with you, each desk that we've received is a little nicer than the last one. So this is Mary Kate. And Women are also invited to this men's club. On this day, Mary Kate Ryan delivered the desks that Dallas made. Kate painted the desk. The desks are, I mean, they're fantastic. I love the colors. And her boyfriend, Mike. <laughs> He's the muscle. <laughs> I didn't, I, all I did was load him. At the first stop, Santiago and his mom, Anna, met the truck and Santiago got to pick his desk. Mm -hmm. I'll take this one. Which one, this one here? Yeah. He was working on the table inside for where we eat. Now I could, I don't have to sit at the table and do my work. I could have my own little space right there. Councilmember Hans Reamer met the group at the next stop. How was it with the last family? It's fantastic. We bought two small desks for our two kids because mm -hmm. yeah. creating a defined workspace, it's good for the parents, it's good for the kids. It's, they weren't cheap. Yeah. Not everybody has 100, 200 yeah. bucks laying around. Generalmente tarda como una semana, pero es rápido y dan cuatro mil dólares. I'm also trying to share information resources about county resources that are available, like the COVID rent assistance program. Okay, gracias. <laughs> He's going to go call his brother. <laughs> so far, more than 120 desks have been built and distributed. This mom um, has some um, COVID symptoms, so we're not going to have any contact. Each desk comes with a chair and a lamp. We're thrilled that we can help in a small way. We have no illusions that this is making a dent in all of the equity challenges that we face as a community. But It's making a real difference for the families that you serve, and that's yeah. what counts. They, they really feel proud when they have their own space and they get to set it up and decorate it. It's really nice. If you would like to get involved with Desk by Dads, check their Facebook page for details. The coronavirus pandemic has revealed many inequities, one of those being in the area of mental health. School closures have affected all students, but for many of those young people, school is the main provider of mental health services. To increase somatic health uh, services, at our Montgomery County Public Schools. This week, the council approved more than $860,000 to address the growing need for these services at elementary schools with high concentrations of poverty. Everybody's been working on this in their own space pre-COVID to say, hey, we need to do this, which is why we put forth special appropriations to do this and why it's so important to do now because it's gotten worse. It hasn't gotten better. Uh, and this administration has continued to ratchet up when it comes to the dialogue around what it is that we see about dividing us all and not having us together and our children feel that. 
The services to be supported by the appropriation are targeted at schools that have 80% or more of students who are eligible for free and reduced price meals. ESOL services at those schools averages at 56%. The funding will provide three school community health nurses and additional contractual support for mental health services. Councilmember Nancy Navarro says it's critical that these programs are applied with a racial equity lens. We've been, you know, lamenting this problem for such a long time, dating all the way back when I was a member of the Board of Education. Um, so the time has arrived for us to then have a strategy that is completely strategic in terms of how do we grow that pipeline, but also how do we have, uh, how do we take advantage of innovative um, models that um, that can, you know, have folks that could be maybe assistants or that can provide that intermediary support while we're growing uh, licensed uh, mental health practitioners that reflect our student population. Council members say it's their hope these services can expand beyond the schools highlighted in this appropriation and that they continue to grow post pandemic. Well, that does it for this edition of The Bottom Line. For County Cable Montgomery, I'm Susan Kennedy. Are you behind on your rent payments? If so, there may be help for you. The COVID-19 Rent Relief Program provides short-term rental assistance to eligible households who have lost income and fallen behind on their rent due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Funds are still available, and the program will provide up to $4,000 to eligible households to cover the cost for back rent or a rent credit for future months. To find out more about this program, visit the county website where you will find a link to apply. Are you looking for help in reopening your business during this pandemic? You could be eligible for funding through Montgomery County's Reopen Business Grant Program. Money is still available for those businesses that need support in making the necessary adjustments to adapt and move forward safely and sustainably. Reopen Montgomery Program Grants will reimburse county businesses and nonprofits for the cost of complying with reopening guidelines. These requirements are there to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and maintain public health. To find out more if you are eligible for this funding, visit the county's business portal page where you will find a link to the application. Hi, my name is Mershai Salu, Visual Information Specialist for the Montgomery County Council. Health insurance has always been important, but has become even more important than ever during this pandemic. In today's segment, I'm speaking with Luis Omar Lopez, Certified Healthcare Navigator from Montgomery County Health Connection, a healthcare marketplace in the state of Maryland. Mr. Lopez, thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, thank you. So we can just, uh, let's, get, let's just get started. Uh, tell us about Maryland Health Connection and how it works. All right, so Maryland Health Connection, as we, some people know, everybody knows, is the um, state insurance marketplace. It's where everybody, individuals, Marylanders, um, can go in and enroll in health coverage, um, whether it's for Medicaid or the um, through the Affordable Care Act. Okay. And uh, what types of plans are available um, and are testing and services for like COVID-19 related services covered through these plans? Yes. So um, beginning November 1st, that's when open enrollment started. And um, people that are currently enrolled, they can renew their health coverage um, for the 2021 year or um, individuals who are um, not enrolled and they want to enroll in health coverage, they can also do that as well during open enrollment. Health plan costs have dropped again this year. And um, like last year, nine out of 10 Marylanders um, that enrolled in coverage um, received and were able to qualify for financial assistance, which means that the, the premium of their coverage was decreased. Um, open enrollment ends in December 15. So if you want to be covered for the new year, um, you can explore your options today. Um, the coverage and the types of services that are covered um, with these plans. So 
Um, you'll recognize that health um, insurance companies that provide pri private plans specifically, like CareFirst and Kaiser Permanente, are still going for the, for the new year. Um, this year, for 2021, there's a new insurance company, United Healthcare, um, giving many Marylanders another option to enroll in coverage. Um, people who are eligible for Medicaid, they can enroll all year round. And um, this is something good to know that um, the plans that are um, available through the marketplace, mm -hmm. um, they cover and they include important benefits like COVID-19 testing and treatment, it's um, covered, and mental health care coverage and doctor's visits and um, many more. Okay, that's good to know. When and how can like people enroll and are there uh, help available to kind of help folks navigate through the sign-up process, um, um, especially for those whose first language is not English? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. So um, people can enroll. Um, there's many ways that they can do so. Um, they can visit the MarylandHealthConnection.gov uh, website, which is um, where they will um, create the account and um, start the application process if they are not currently enrolled. Um, they can also download the mobile app, which is um, Enrolled MHC, which is available for Android and um, um, Apple. And um, they can also call, um, depending on the county, um, there's different phone numbers. I work with Montgomery County, so I will provide you with the Montgomery County phone number. So we have um, certified navigators, which are the um, the experts that will help consumers um, um, navigate the application process. It'll be all over the phone. Um, currently, all the county offices are still closed due to the pandemic. So um, individuals can call the county line, which is 240-777-1815, uh, and they will be transferred to one of the navigators, which the navigator can help them enroll in coverage, renew their coverage for the new year, and it'll be all um, over the phone, they won't have to go to any any of the facilities, um, or they can also assist them if they want to um, see options online, how to navigate the website, etc. Okay, and I will run the number on the screen for folks as well. Um, open enrollment is for health insurance coverage starting next year in um, 2021. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of options do you have for those who need health insurance right away? So right now, um, as we continue to face the public health crisis um, and fight COVID-19, it has never been more important for Marylanders to have health coverage. So uh, Maryland Health Connection opened a special enrollment period for uninsured Marylanders. So if you have lost coverage through your employer or your income has decreased, you may be able to get coverage today. The coronavirus um, special enrollment period is open through December 15. Um, this is good to, um, to know that as of today, um, November 18th, anybody that enrolls in coverage from November 15 through um, December, I'm sorry, this is a little confusing. So from November 1st through the November 15, your coverage will be effective um, the beginning of November, so November 1st. From November 15th um, through December 15, your coverage will be effective on December 1st. So if you don't, if you need coverage next month on December, um, people can enroll using that um, special enrollment period for um, COVID-19. Okay. Um, and you, you mentioned at the beginning that um, the premiums have dropped this year. Mm -hmm. um, what, how affordable are, are these plans and what type of financial help is available, especially to people that have lost their jobs or going through mm -hmm. financial issues? Right. So um, the um, Maryland Health Connection Program, it bases the financial assistance that individuals received on the income um, usually for the private health insurance is based on yearly income. So a lot of individuals that um, probably received unemployment or um, the federal extension, um, some of these um, assistance that were received from, from the government, they may be counted for the yearly income, but say for example, an individual that is currently receiving only unemployment, um, they, they may still qualify for um, Medicaid 
also depending on their immigration status. But if their only income at the moment is um, unemployment because, um, well, they lost due to everything that's happening, they lost their job, um, they may be eligible for the free health insurance. For those individuals who do not qualify for Medicaid because of immigration status, the um, income, the financial assistance will be based on the yearly income. And um, it's a little confusing. Um, and obviously there is more information on the on the website, but yes, it's basically depending on your yearly income and the household size. So the more people, so say for example, a family of five will receive more financial assistance than a family of two with the same income. Right, okay. Um, and as to like it pertains to those that um, have like pending immigration statuses, um, do they qualify for this program? Um, like what's the process for that? So um, individuals to enroll through Maryland Health Connection, they need to have a valid immigration status. Um, people with employment authorizations, people with um, green cards, um, visas. There are some visas um, for um, for children and for pregnant women. The visa, if they have a visa or they have uh, employment authorization or a green card, they can still qualify for Medicaid. Um, but adults and um, just regular folks that have uh, different immigration status, they will qualify for, um, for coverage through Maryland Health Connection. Um, those individuals that don't have an immigration status they can still apply for the county programs um, or the county clinics, I should say. Um, the, they do have, I'm not sure um, if other counties offer these services, but I know that Montgomery County has the, the county clinics, which individuals that currently don't have an immigration status can apply for, for those services so they can seek medical services. Okay. Um, and what do you need, like what source of documents would you need in order to apply? So um, to enroll in, in coverage, um, you will need a photo ID. Um, sometimes once the social security number for those that are um, seeking coverage, we will need the, either the social security number or the IT number. Sometimes the system will be able to verify the people, the person identity just by the social. Sometimes the system may ask for um, specific questions like um, personally, personally identifiable questions just to confirm their identity. Um, immigration status, so like I said, if they have a green card or if they have a uh, employment authorization or if they have their, um, their foreign passport with a visa, um, we will need that information as well. Um, for individuals that are still working, um, if they receive at the end of the year a W-2, they will need to present their most recent pay stubs just to verify their income. Um, individuals can also um, present their tax records, usually the previous year. So for example, individuals are um, enrolling in coverage right now can utilize the 2019 taxes more than likely those um, the the tax records are utilized for individuals that are self-employed so they don't receive a w-2 they receive a 1099 so that will be the way that they can prove their income individuals that receive w-2s they will have to provide um, pay stubs and if they're currently enrolled or they have coverage through their employer or whatever the case may be they can also provide um, the policy numbers and other insurance information Okay, perfect. Um, I understand it's enrollment season and you're incredibly busy, so I won't hold you too long. But if you can okay. remind us one more, t one last time when the deadline is and um, where folks should go to get more information or should when if they want to reach out. Right. So, uh, like I said, right now, open enrollment is running. It started in November 1st and it's going to run through December 15th. This is um, for consumers that want to enroll in coverage beginning um, effective January 1st or for those who want to renew their coverage for the following year. We also have availability for those who want to enroll in coverage um, effective December 1st. They can utilize the, um, the COVID-19 special enrollment period 
Now, the special enrollment period for COVID-19 is for those that want to enroll in coverage effective December, so they can still get coverage beginning um, next month. Um, it is not an opportunity for those that are currently enrolled to change plans. So the ones that, if they want to, the individuals that are currently enrolled, if they want to um, plan shop, it'll be effective the following year. So again, they can call the Maryland Health Connection hotline, which the number is um, 1-855. Wait, I think I have it here. Give me one second. Uh, 1-855-642-8572. Or individuals within Montgomery County, or any individuals, honestly, if, if uh, we um, help individuals throughout the state um, here in Montgomery County, the number is 240-777-1815. They can also visit the website, marylandhealthconnection.gov, or they can also download the mobile app, Enroll MHC. Okay. Well, Mr. Lopez, um, thank you again for sharing all these valuable points. Um, there's a lot to learn from this, so I really appreciate you taking um, time out of your busy day for me. Awesome. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. They gave me Vicodin after my knee surgery. They kept prescribing it, so I kept taking it. I didn't know it would be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. <laughs> Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. watching Council Wrap-Up. We're here with some of the top council news for the month of October. It may not be something that most people think about, but the end of daylight saving time can mean a rise in the number of pedestrian accidents. The time change happens this year on November 1st, and Montgomery County Police want pedestrians and drivers to be aware. We realize that uh, we're in a time of the season uh, where we do see a rise in pedestrian collisions. So we, we try to combat that with education, enforcement, um, and we try to go proactive with things like this. Last year in Montgomery County, there were close to 500 pedestrian crashes. 14 of those were fatal. Statistics show that pedestrians walking around dusk are nearly three times more likely to be struck by cars in the days following the end of daylight saving time. Everybody has a role in traffic safety, pedestrians, bicyclists, and vehicles. As far as pedestrians are concerned, um, some easy steps are wear things that might be more visible when it gets darker out. Um, even to the extremes of wearing a vest, it, that could help. And I get that those are tough things to sometimes do for going to work and things like that, but um, trying to remain as visible as possible is one thing. Two, use sidewalks. Uh, when they're available and, and walk there and not in the roadway. And when you do have to cross the roadway, try to get to a lighted intersection or a marked crosswalk. And third, avoid distracted walking. Councilmember Evan Glass says with the time change that is happening, everybody needs to be aware of their surroundings. 
if you are a pedestrian, you know, maybe take the earbuds out, look around, and just be aware of when you're crossing the street. I always try to make eye contact with the driver so that I know that we see each other. And let's see what we got here. We have one car stopped and another's gonna keep going. You need courage to be able to do this. And it is so important because uh, we can't presume that drivers are seeing everybody who's on, on the street. Um, it's unfortunate to say, but that's just a reality. The county and state have invested in improving intersections with the installation of Hawk beacon signals and rapid flashing beacons. McBain says that folks should be aware that police will be out on the roads enforcing traffic laws to keep our streets safe. We do do enforcement for not only the pedestrian moves, but also um, more often we try to address um, enforcement with the drivers. And so we, like the intersection we are here at Turkey Branch Parkway, we go out and we start monitoring whether vehicles are stopping at these rapid flashing beacons um, and also if they're uh, stopping at, um, at the hawk signals. Um, and so uh, in, in addition, sometimes we have officers posing as pedestrians and actually going out into the roadway. And when we see a violation, we uh, make the stop and cite it. So even though you're getting an extra hour of sleep, Councilmember Glass says to remember those extra Z's come with accountability. There is an extra responsibility, clearly, that pedestrians have to take. Um, but for drivers as well, please take your eyes away from your phone, away from your radio. Um, focus on the road and make sure that when you're in a heavily pedestrian area or anywhere, quite frankly, uh, that you are keeping your eye on the road and looking out for pedestrians. This month, the council introduced an appropriation that would invest $1.8 million to expand educational enrichment and equity hubs to support those students negatively impacted by distance learning. The funding was proposed by Councilmember Craig Rice, who chairs the council's Education and Culture Committee. And so having these hubs to be able to just provide that additional support that's necessary, whether it's homework help, whether it's just the guidance, whether it's just the comfort of being around somebody in person, all of those kinds of things are needed for some of our students who just are struggling with the distance learning model and it's really not working for them uh, that are going to help them to bridge the time until we can get our kids back in school. The Children's Opportunity Fund and the Black and Brown Coalition have partnered with county child care providers licensed by the state to deliver services in schools to implement educational enrichment and equity hubs. Currently, there are hubs in nine county elementary schools. The funding would expand the number of hub sites by at least 20 to those low-income students while schools meet virtually. One of the things we know is that there are pockets of kids of need throughout the county. There is not one area. They're not just in Silver Spring or in Wheaton or in Germantown or in Montgomery Village. The reality is, is that they're spread all around the county. This funding reflects the county's commitment to racial equity and social justice. The goal of the hubs is to provide virtual learning support to those vulnerable students who have been negatively impacted by the challenges of distance learning. A public hearing and action on this proposal is scheduled for November 10th. Over the last several months, Montgomery County residents have stepped up to help the community by lending a hand in many different ways. This month, we met a Gaithersburg couple working to build educational equity through their carpentry skills. Desks by Dads is a nonprofit organization that was started by a mom. So Desks by Dads is actually a brainchild of my wife, Jessica. In August, Jess Burrales partnered with PTA moms who were working on a virtual learning project. I was sort of in the mindset of thinking of, you know, about what do kids need to be ready to learn? And it just sort of occurred to me, well, what about desks? And Jess's Honeydew weekend project for her husband, Al, was for him to build a desk. He said, sure. He watched a couple of YouTube videos and picked up some materials from Lowe's over the weekend and put a desk to together in about an hour. Just sort of took off from there. Took off it did. After posting pictures on Facebook, dads all over the county volunteered to help. Um, great to see how other people kind of take my idea and kind of ran with it and made it their own. That's really fun to see. We've had so many volunteers uh, improve on the design, you know, add their own spin on it. Uh, to be honest with you, each desk that we've received is a little nicer than the last one. So this is Mary Kate. And Women are also invited to this men's club. 
On this day, Mary Kate Ryan delivered the desks that Dallas made. Kate painted the desk. The desks are, I mean, they're fantastic. I love the colors. And her boyfriend, Mike. <laughs> he, he's the muscle. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I, all I did was load him. At the first stop, Santiago and his mom, Anna, met the truck and Santiago got to pick his desk. I'll take this one. Which one? This one here? He was working on the table inside for where we eat. Now I, could, I don't have to sit at the table and do my work. I could have my own little space right there. Councilmember Hans Riemer met the group at the next stop. How was it with the last family? It's fantastic. We bought two small desks for our two kids because mm -hmm. creating a defined workspace, it's good for the parents, it's good for the kids. It's, they weren't cheap. Yeah. Not everybody has 100, 200 yeah. bucks laying around. I'm also trying to share information resources about county resources that are available, like the COVID rent assistance program. Okay, gracias. <laughs> He's going to go call his brother. <laughs> So far, more than 120 desks have been built and distributed. This mom um, has some um, COVID symptoms, so we're not going to have any contact. Each desk comes with a chair and a lamp. We're thrilled that we can help in a small way. We have no illusions that this is making a dent in all of the equity challenges that we face as a community. But, but it's making a real difference for the families that you serve, and that's yeah. what counts. Cheese! They, they really feel proud when they have their own space and they get to set it up and decorate it. It's really nice. If you would like to get involved with Desk by Dads, check their Facebook page for details. The coronavirus pandemic has revealed many inequities, one of those being in the area of mental health. School closures have affected all students, but for many of those young people, school is the main provider of mental health services. The council approved more than $860,000 to address the growing need for these services at elementary schools with high concentrations of poverty. Everybody's been working on this in their own space pre-COVID to say, hey, we need to do this, which is why we put forth special appropriations to do this and why it's so important to do now because it's gotten worse. The services to be supported by the appropriation are targeted at schools that have 80% or more of students who are eligible for free and reduced price meals. ESOL services at those schools averages at 56%. The funding will provide three school community health nurses and additional contractual support for mental health services. The time has arrived for us to then have a strategy that is completely strategic in terms of how do we grow that pipeline, but also how do we have uh, how do we take advantage of innovative um, models that um, that can you know have folks that can be maybe assistants or that can provide that intermediary support while we're growing uh, licensed uh, mental health practitioners that reflect our student population. There's a new cafe in downtown Rockville that's open for business. We went with council president Sydney Katz to visit the Soulful Cafe, where everyone has a place at the table. Tucked away on Monroe Place in Rockville is a little cafe that's full of positive energy. Oh, how are you doing? The Soulful Cafe is located just off the main entrance of the newly opened Main Street Apartments. The cafe is a partnership between Dawson's Market and Main Street. So Dawson's has always been uh, a part of the community. Uh, part of our mission statement is to, to employ 10% of our staff uh, in what we call a difficult to hire category, people that um, tend to have difficulty finding positions because of a disability, something like that. You know, just really right away felt that it was a great marriage between the two different missions and the two companies. The opening of the Main Street Cafe is not only about inclusion, but it also offers great taste. It's real good. Yeah. Yeah. Jillian Copeland is the founder of Main Street. She says the Soulful Cafe gives everyone the opportunity to nourish their mind, body, and soul. I got a crumb wrap and I got a double chocolate chip muffin. Our mission of creating a space for belonging, this is perfectly aligned, right? So bright spaces, um, air, the food and drink, really acai bowls and smoothies and coffees. Uh, uh, a small cappuccino. Soon, so we hope pedestrians will walk by and we hope people will come and grab a cup of coffee and just, you know, 
say hello and be a neighbor and be a part of our community. And connecting with the community is what Main Street is all about. The cafe serves as a gathering place for county residents looking to support local food. What are you getting? A mean green smoothie. An almond brother. And residents and staff of Main Street use the cafe as home base and time to check in and find out how things are going. So I think it gives them kind of like a feeling of community as well as a space that they can hang out and enjoy and kind of kick back, relax and, you know, eat a muffin, have coffee and, you know, just enjoy the day. Council President Sidney Katz says the Soulful Cafe is not only changing lives, but it's shaping the future. And Montgomery County has such, is so fortunate, truly is blessed that we have every opportunity to meet people from every background in, in, every, in every sort of way. And that's what this is all about. We're all, you know, I always say that a community is like a family. And it is. And, we, and in our family, we have various personalities and people who have various uh, abilities and, and, and are good in one thing and not so great in another. It, it's really just a, a wonderful, wonderful feeling. It's a place where people want to come and join. They don't want to be here because they're helping someone with a disability. They want to be here because they're stimulated and they're engaged and they're connected and they walk away and their life is richer because they filled their cup and they filled their soul. You can visit the Soulful Cafe at 50 Monroe Place in Rockville. The cafe is open every day except Sunday and Monday at 7 a.m. Well, that does it for this edition of Council Wrap-Up. To follow the County Council's work, visit their website. I'm Susan Kennedy. What do you do if you smell natural gas? A gas leak can happen if a gas pipe is damaged, if an appliance that uses gas isn't hooked up right, or if someone leaves a burner or the oven on. If you smell natural gas, don't try to find out where it's coming from. Just get out. From a safe location, call 911 and then your local gas company. If the odor is very strong or you hear something hissing, Leave the area immediately and warn other people as you go. Natural gas is highly flammable. Don't light a cigarette or use your phone or anything with batteries. Don't turn light switches on or off. Don't start your car. Don't do anything that could create a spark. Washington Gas's emergency number is 703-750-1400. Evacuate first. Call next. I already knew that I was going to go to college, you know, from a young age. I definitely want to major in political science. After that, I'm going to get my law degree. Then I'm going to come back to Detroit, boost the economy, become the mayor or something, try to make the situation better for other people. I feel like I owe it to the city. I'm determined. It's, it, it's going to happen. My name is Justin, and I am your dividend. Hi, I'm Susan Kennedy and welcome to In The Loop. This is our opportunity to sit down with council members to talk to them about the issues and what they've been working on during their term. And today I'm joined by Council President Sidney Katz. Welcome, Mr. President. And boy, we have a lot to talk about because your presidency has been one of a kind, hasn't it? Tell, it tell me a little is. bit about, um, you were inaugurated in December yes. or voted in in December. That is unanimous, congratulations. And only a couple of months after that, we were ensconced in this COVID. COVID-19 pandemic. It's been tough. You've had to guide our council through this. Talk a little bit about how you've been able to navigate through this so gracefully. Well, thank you for calling it graceful. But, uh, you know, when, when it first started, no one could have predicted that we were going to have a pandemic that would change our lives so dramatically. Um, but it happened, and, and that's what we have to deal with. You know, I always tell people that, that uh, I, I had read about Zoom, I had heard about Zoom, I now live on Zoom. That's, that's what happened. We were very, very concerned that we needed to, you know, I always say it called the county office building, the people's building. This is, this is where people come to, to for government, uh, local government. This is where people uh, come to talk to a council member. This is where they come for a public hearing. 
and, and the building closed. The people's building closed. So we were very concerned about, about what does that mean and how are we going to have our public involved in, in their government. And what we did was we immediately came up with a system for, for Zoom. It had to be tweaked a couple times so that they could, we could have public hearings. The county council has traditionally had six committees where much of the work is actually done. Uh, we couldn't meet in committees, so we had to immediately go to everything being a committee of the whole. All nine of us had to be on every topic, on every, on every uh, discussion, but we did it. Yeah, it, it was a quick change, wasn't it? And we're still virtual at this point. Yes. We are not sure when we're coming back, taking it month by month, waiting to see how the cases go here. An update on, uh, on uh, the COVID-19. We have weekly briefings with we Dr. Travis Gales. Family gatherings and large gatherings continue to be affiliated with case transmission. And Dr. Earl Stoddard, talk a little bit about that guidance and how that's played into, you know, your votes as far as these health orders and all the other items that you've had to take on. Well, and of course it gets confusing with that. They are truly uh, wonderful people who do a lot of work. I, I always tease them that 24-7 is not enough, uh, not enough for them. They, they need 25-8 because that's what they seem to always be working. And, and there's so many people with so many different opinions and want to have discussions with them so that they understand the concerns that they have. Listen, we've affected every part of every person's life, not just in Montgomery County, but throughout the United States, throughout the world in many cases, that, that uh, businesses had to close, that, that schools, I mean, no one would have ever assumed that we would have schools that were not going to be open. Today is Monday, September 21st. And then they had to change to the, to the virtual uh, learning. And so there, certain things that we're going to try are not going to work. I mean, and, and we have got to understand that that's not exact. I mean, that's not a failure. 80% mm -hmm. is, is still a successful rate. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people look at you, well, you, that worked, but, you know, that other part didn't. Well, we're going to have to, if it doesn't work, we're going to have to massage how it does work. Yeah, that, that's well said. Uh, and now I know that we know the county received a large pot of money from the federal government through the CARES Act for us to, to use during this time of crisis. And we have so many needs. And we have colleagues who represent different parts of the county who see those needs. Talk a little bit about how you decided where that funding should go. How did that work? The president just before me, uh, Council Member Navarro, uh, we had passed the day that I actually became president of the county council, we signed the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act. And I remember joking to the crowd, it shouldn't go unnoticed. So my first day as council president, can you imagine this? Look what we've done. And now what are we, you know, what's going to happen for day two? Who knows what's going to happen? Well, and of course, we need to make certain that everything we do it has an equitable side to it. For And, and the, the dollars were no different for that. And of course, we do have tremendous need. And we continue. To have tremendous need. You want bread? I can give you a whole thing of bread. We have people that that need food. We have, you know the food inequities. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. You're welcome. We have we have people that need money for rent. We have people that need money for child care. We can mm -hmm. keep that list going. And we did receive from the federal government, which was a huge help, 183 million dollars, which is a lot of money, mm -hmm. except when you're talking about a budget that's six billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And and so the, and that 183 million had to last has to last until the end of the year, mm -hmm. and so you have to figure out how we're doing it. We've pretty much allocated every every dollar of it, but we we've we've had so much that we've needed to do. We've had people that have never needed government before, so as much as we were concerned about the the the, the time we were living in that moment we were even more concerned about next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. And so that's the next concern. God bless you, ma'am. And you know, we... Good day.
Well, good afternoon. I am uh, Sidney Katz, the immediate past president of the Montgomery County Council. And for those of you who are wondering about the immediate, I, I, um, uh, on Tuesday, we were, uh, the Montgomery County Council elected, and I congratulate uh, Council President Tom Hucker and Vice President Gabe Albernaz. And I know both of those gentlemen will do a marvelous job uh, as, as the president and as the vice president. But I'm um, uh, the District 3 County Council representative, uh, and I uh, am delighted that we are being joined here today, and everyone else is being is joining us on Zoom for our 15th business briefing. The purpose of this briefings, of these briefings, has been to help local businesses and nonprofits navigate through our new economic reality. The, and I'm very happy today to welcome James Chung, who's the president of Reach Advisors, uh, to today's business briefing. Mr. Chung has a wealth of experience, and you're going to find that out in about in two seconds here. And uh, he will share his item, uh, his ideas related to the county's economic recovery from the impacts of COVID-19 and to fulfilling our immense economic potential for the benefit of all of the 1.1 million residents. We will then take questions from our Zoom audience. Please send your questions to the chat box on the right of the screen. Uh, I also wanted to thank Laurie Edberg from my office, who was who gets these briefings together for us, which is not an easy task, and she does a wonderful job on that. And I, of course, always want to thank Susan Kennedy, who moderates these briefings. She always does a wonderful job as well. And with that, Susan, please let us begin. Well, thank you, Council Member Katz. And that's going to be difficult for me to get used to, too. I've called you Mr. President for so long, but congratulations on a very successful year. And you navigated the council through a very difficult time and did a wonderful job. Um, thank you very much. And we have James Chung with us today. Mr. Chung, thank you so much. You're, you're coming to us from northern New York, we understand. Talk a little bit about Reach Advisors and how you got connected with Montgomery County. And I know you have a little bit of a presentation you'd like to share with us as well to start us off. Susan, uh, thank you. Uh, we were brought in at the start of the year by the Montgomery County Business Roundtable and the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation to take a look at uh, what is the future of Montgomery County? What have been the challenges and what are the potentials to break through? And we were brought into this because we did something, uh, an abbreviated version of this for Frederick County, maybe about five years ago or so. And so there were some people involved in that uh, with the Montgomery County Business Roundtable who thought that it was the right time to take a look at these issues for Montgomery County as well too. And as we dived into this issue, uh, we realized it was probably pretty wise timing because Montgomery County is this very interesting uh, decision point about uh, where it's heading in the future, uh, sort of a fork in the road, basically. And talk a little bit about some of those findings. I know you, you've got some branding ideas. You've got some ideas on, on how our job growth has, has progressed over the past few years. Um, you know, we look at the, the jobs in the county. We have a lot of small businesses. Our job growth has mostly been in the area of lower paying jobs, not the higher paying jobs. Can you walk us through a little bit of, of what you have found in your research about Montgomery County? Okay, let's think about the best way to do this. Uh, that was a two-hour presentation uh, a couple weeks ago, but... Uh, means maybe, you're going to have to speak, speak fast, that means. That's yeah. <laughs> maybe what I'll try to do is I try to reduce some of the slides, and maybe what I'll do is maybe do 10 minutes, try 10 minutes of highlights, oh, and yeah. then uh, leave time for some questions after that. Perfect. So let me do the share screen here and go to desktop two, and let's see if you're able to... Um, ah... Hold on a second. I'm going to have to do uh, uh, okay. Hold on a second. Let's see if I can add this. And for some reason, it is not letting me. So with that, why don't I talk through these issues That's as plan right. B? Um, okay. So you won't be seeing the visuals, but I think we can get the message across here. And it was interesting when we brought in because Montgomery County is a powerhouse. Um, we didn't recognize this until we started, but Montgomery County's economy is bigger than 13 states in the U.S. And it's not just because it's a bigger county. It's because there's such high productivity in this economic productivity in this county. 
And it's a 99th percentile county on so many measures, or more accurately, 99.5. It's one of the best counties in the U.S. by many measures. But I can see why they were getting sort of really concerned about it, because when we looked at it, Montgomery County had a fantastic run-up in the 80s and 1990s when we looked at it. Um, basically, there was massive infrastructure improvement, you know, red line, 270, 370. Um, the NIH budget really skyrocketed in the 1990s. Um, and with that, it became the suburban community choice for DC. It was where you wanted to be. But starting after about mid 2000s, Montgomery County just flatlined for about 15 years. Um, in part, the NIH budget had dropped. Um, in part, what we thought was really odd is that um, after the last recession um, at the end of the 2000s, around 2009, um, Montgomery County did not recover anywhere near like the rest of the U.S. Household income, household income grew much less than the rest of the U.S. It grew much less than the rest of the DMV. Um, one of the things that really concerned us is uh, younger adults, age 25 to 44, there's basically almost no growth of the backbone of the workforce, and it's not attracting the same level of income and education of those young adults. Basically, what's happening is the job growth in Montgomery County has been in lower paying jobs. The job loss has been higher paying jobs. So basically not what you want to see happen. So I can see why there was concern. Then we looked at business formation and um, basically across the U.S., there's almost always one net new business added for every 21 new residents or whatever. And Montgomery County kept growing, but business formation absolutely just flatlined since the last recession versus the rest of the U.S. It recovered. Um, and uh, it's not just versus the U.S. versus the DMV. Um, it slowed down. And so there were concerns. And when we looked at it, we dug into a couple structural uh, drivers behind it. And one is a concept that we call traded clusters versus local clusters. Traded clusters are related industries that primarily serve markets beyond the region. In other words, they export their product and uh, the high paid jobs of that company are headquarters locally, and they're free to choose a location, but typically concentrated in a few regions that have very specific advantages. Um, and then there are local clusters, which are industries that primarily serve the local market. Um, they're both needed for a healthy and prosperous regional economy. But um, the reason why we wanted to focus on the on that di differentiation is most businesses are local cluster businesses, but, um, and Montgomery County is sort of on average in terms of distribution for the rest of the US. But the rest of the DMV and for most stronger cities have much higher ratio of traded cluster businesses. They're the ones that generate higher wages, higher wage growth, um, higher job growth, more regional GDP growth. And Montgomery County does not have, for a powerhouse county, it actually has a very low percentage of those traded cluster businesses. There's another structural thing that we also flagged too, and this starts to get a little bit more complex based off the work of our data science firm, is that um, we can deconstruct local market economies by a concept called alpha and beta, which are borrowed concepts from Wall Street. Alpha is the level of structural growth that's you know beyond the level, beyond normal cyclical you know, basically, where is their growth that's 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 abnormally strong um, on a risk adjusted cyclically, cyclically, cyclically adjusted basis? And there's beta, which is how variable is it to, you know, how sensitive is the U.S. economy, shifts in the U.S. economy? And what we found is um, Montgomery County is very modest alpha. Um, it outperforms the U.S. by just a little bit. And the reason why is life sciences. But the problem is life sciences usually injects a ton of alpha into an economy. Montgomery County is a ton of alpha or a ton of life sciences, but it doesn't get much alpha driving it. It, it just doesn't get the same kind of juice that Boston or Raleigh Durham or San Diego get from the life sciences. Um, then regarding beta, the good news is it's low beta. It's much less cyclical than the rest of the US because the federal dominance creates stability and downturns. But we also notice that the federal dominance has been in a way constraining growth during economic expansion because it's not a, an economy geared up for for growth like that. So if Montgomery County wants to outperform again and um, and just you know bring in more quality jobs, job growth, wage growth, um, outperformance will be driven by growing more traded cluster businesses and unlocking hidden alpha, which is a concept that our clients that use the data science serve look for. Where can they find outsized growth? For, so in other words, it's like, you know, instead of just adding bodies, how are they adding like, 
you know, more talented, higher productive, higher educated um, audience. And the good news behind this is Montgomery County does have a couple of pockets of very significant assets already in place to grow alpha and traded cluster businesses, but it just hasn't fully capitalized on that yet. Um, number one of those areas is the hospitality industry. When we looked at it, it was amazing. When we looked at the basically the market capitalization for the hospitality industry in the US, more than 50% of the US market cap is headquartered in Montgomery County between Marriott, Choice Hotels, um, and then between the REITs here, you know, more than 50% of the hotel real estate investment trusts are based in Montgomery County. So it's a powerhouse. And then you have others in the hospitality ecosystem. You have the hotel operators um, in Montgomery County. You have, uh, you know, the food services companies where the internet, the international companies where the U.S. headquarters in Montgomery County. So there's a lot here. And you have a couple of hospitality tech companies that are moving in. The, they're here as well, too, which they should be because their biggest customers are here. Their best labor pool is here. But, you know, so one of the things we're thinking about is how, what opportunities do we have to generate even higher value from this unique agglomeration of industry talent? There are very few counties in America where more than half of the industry is headquartered there. It's an extremely rare thing. Um, but as we think about it, if Montgomery County doesn't do anything, the industry is in reinvention now because of the pandemic and COVID that's going to last for a long, not, not, well, we're hoping the pandemic doesn't last for long, but the reinvention is in gear. So Montgomery County in a way has the most to lose in terms of jobs lost, headquarters, you know, staff moving away. Um, but it also has the right to win, which is the concept we're big on is what do you have the reason to win in leading the reinvention of the hospitality industry? And a lot of that reinvention is going to inevitably involve technology innovation because they're figuring out how can they still deliver the service with lower staff that's going to be technologically added. And Montgomery County technology has not been a strength of Montgomery County, um, but um, Montgomery County is the right to win in tech where it already has an unfair advantage. And one of it is that agglomeration of the hospitality industry. So we would like to see the, the overall hospitality industry reinvention happen in Montgomery County because the, the headquarters are here. They're going to be driving a lot of it. They're going to be looking for solutions. But what we'd like to see is a lot more of these high growth hospitality tech companies domicile here. Basically, you know, there are a lot of staff who, aren't gonna, who are furloughed, who aren't going to go back to headquarters jobs. And there are a lot of people in the industry also in the same situation who should come to Montgomery County because they're the ones, you know, who have the, the skills and the, you know, the customers are here. So we think that there's a big cluster of tech businesses to grow around there because Montgomery County does not have its share yet, but it has all the other reasons Montgomery County should win on that. Now, there's another big area for growing alpha and trade and cluster businesses, and that's the life sciences industry. Montgomery County is generally viewed as, or actually I have to step back, the Washington DC metro area is generally viewed as, it's not Boston and San Francisco when it comes up to life sciences, but it's in that next tier with another half dozen cities. But then we map where all those companies are. There's life sciences companies in Washington DC. Basically it's I-270 in Montgomery County. You know, it's not the DC metro area. 90% of that is Montgomery County. Um, and But the problem is, despite the fact that it's one of the 10 leading cities, it has the lowest venture capital flow of any of those cities. Um, and so that's one of the things that just does not, that's why it's not generating the alpha. It's not generating that dynamic growth that happens in the, the, the job growth and the wage growth that happens when you have that powerhouse in industry. So we try to figure out what's, what are the unique strengths in Montgomery County? So, you know, other than having the world's largest biomedical research center, <laughs> GS Square in Montgomery County, what are other unique strengths? And so we started this project before, basically we came in in February and then the project shut down in March for obvious reasons. But since we were then just analysts on computers rather than on the ground, we did something interesting. We mapped Basically, the World Health Organization was tracking every company and every institution in the world that was trying to develop some kind of COVID uh, vaccine or COVID therapeutic. And so we were able to map and see where the hotspots were across the world. You know, there was Japan, China, um, England. Um, and then in the U.S., there was a hotspot in the U.S. Then we drilled down on the map. When we drilled down further and further, it was really interesting. And I wish I could show this map. The world's highest concentration of activity around COVID vaccines and therapeutics is I-270 in Montgomery County. It was amazing. And um, so one of the recommendations we have is flat out declare Montgomery County as the advanced immunology capital of the world. 
<laughs> and be able to help support the acceleration of talent flow, new business formation and capital flow. Because look, we're hoping COVID comes and goes, but we now know that these issues are gonna be here with us in different forms. Um, that what Montgomery County has in spades is what the world is gonna demand and need more of. So we might as well let the world know it's here and get more of that talent and the businesses. Like I want Montgomery County to be like the US headquarters for all the international companies that are in advanced immun Im immunology, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I want the top scientists to think, you know, oh, well, I got my job offers in Boston, San Francisco, but more interesting stuff has happened and immunology is happening in Montgomery County. That's what I want to see happen. So that was another area in terms of driving alpha and, and, uh, and, and more traded cluster businesses. But there's one more thing I'm going to put on the table in the remaining two minutes. And that is, I'm going to just put a question out there. How boldly can Montgomery County shape the future? And, um, Basically, as we think about the 2030s, every decade, there's a major change in technology that changes everything. You know, in the 40s, it was the vacuum tubes that built the computers that, you know, that the U.S. Army used. 50s transistors, 60s integrated circuits, the 1970s microprocessors, which in the 1980s created personal computers, 1990s that enabled Internet, in the, you know, in the last 13 years, mobile. But what's going to happen in 2020, 2030s? we think we already see the signs of what's gonna be the fundamental change. It's the quantum computing future. Now, this is sort of far to understand, I'll step back and define quantum computing. It draws on that weird world of quantum mechanics, the physics of subatomic particles, the things that brought us MRIs and microwaves. But when it comes to computing, basically computing is basically translating everything that into zeros and ones and controlling switches in our computers. But in the quantum world, there's this concept of superposition where it's no longer zeros and ones, it's exponential states. So you can encode and process data in exponentially more states and zero ones. So you can do things like amazing, amazing things. It's gonna change everything, just like the internet, just like mobile did. But it, it basically, we're gonna see the early signs of this in 2020s. It's gonna change the world in the 2030s. We're gonna think of quantum like we think of internet today or mobile today. But why are we mentioning this? Because Montgomery County has never been a technological leader. But here's why we put it on the radar screen. Reason number one, most of the current funding and direction for the, for the quantum world is coming out of the federal agencies, including NIST, the Department of Energy's uh, Advanced uh, uh, um, you know, AI Technology Office, uh, uh, DARPA and IARPA, which is the Intelligence Advanced Research Project Administration in Montgomery County, as is NIST. So the already the leaders, the, the, the Ford vision those are things that have decisions happening here in Montgomery County now. And reason number two is that when we think about where the hard science research is being done, once again, we mapped it across the world. Um, and then we found something really weird. We weren't expecting that the highest concentration of the advanced R&D is happening just across the county border, two, three miles away at UMD. It's pretty ridiculous. UMD has more going on on this than Harvard and MIT combined, more than Stanford and Berkeley combined. So the hard stuff is happening right around the corner. One more reason is the lowest hanging fruit for the earliest value creation is cryptography and cybersecurity, which is why it makes sense for a lot of this to happen because Montgomery County is at the epicenter. And then drug discovery is the other low hanging fruit. And here's the other thing I wish I could map is that basically between NIST running down I-70, you know, IARPA, NIH, FDA, UMD, and then up to Fort Meade. It's effectively a 50 mile crescent, which we believe can become as valuable as the 50 miles between San Francisco and San Jose. The, now, we have a head start on a couple pieces. One is the governmental drivers are either in Montgomery County or just across the border, um, you know, between, you know, DOD, you know, what's happened in DC, Department of Energy. Second, huge head start in academic R&D. It's three miles across the border. Third, Montgomery County is the epicenter for a large portion of future demand because life sciences is where the, where the action is going to happen big time. And that, as we think about it, can create the platforms to attract the remaining key pieces, workforce and business leadership, venture capital and corporate investment. It's another area where I'd like to see a lot more companies like international companies said, put, put their headquarters in Montgomery County in the quantum world um, and attract that kind of talent. So 
Montgomery County absolutely has the right to win in the quantum computing future. And I know it sounds like, you know, Star Trek-ish, but 90% odds, this is going to change everything and redefine redefine our economy and our lives. Um, So Montgomery County has the right to win in quantum computing future if it has the guts to go for it. Yeah, and that's what I'm going to try to like push, and I'm going to be sticking with Montgomery County to to just uh, be available and sort of push to think about how does Montgomery not let this opportunity pass away from us. But let me if- ask you, Mr. Chung. Let me just ask. Let me just just jump in there for just a second. And, and this is all this is all in, incredible information, and, it, and it's we we know these things about Montgomery County. So so what do you suggest? How do we do we jump on this and 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 market this and rebrand ourselves so people people understand that we have all of this to offer here? Yeah, so it's a, this is a really good question because as I tell my clients, your brand is not what you say about yourself, it's what others say about you. And so how do we start to make it clear that that is the case? Now, in terms of branding, like for example, the advanced immunological capital of the world, you know, right now it's sort of hard to bring all those companies together because they're racing to get vaccines and therapeutics out the door. But um, I think that there's, I think that there are wonderful stories to be told that can be brought, that can be made much more visible in the media and in industry about this. Um, I think that, and I get the sense that Montgomery County Economic Development is totally tuned into this idea of let's go get international international companies to headquarter U.S. operations in the U.S. You know, if they are in 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 in, uh, in, um, in advanced uh, immunology and uh, um, or if they are in quantum, um, I think that there are. This has provided sort of impetus for a lot of the quantum leaders to think about, okay, how do we end up really putting this together? Um, I understand that there have been uh, some of the federal elected leaders who have now heard about this and are now um, have asked for meetings like this to start to think about like what can happen from a legislative and federal side that can help advance this. Because the hospitality industry happened because there were very interesting like, uh, you know, legislative things and uh, that happened that, that made Montgomery County super attractive for those companies. So let's see if we can do that in the other categories as well, too. So a whole range of things that have to come together. But I think that the parties are really starting to tune into this and accelerating. I'm certainly getting a lot of uh, input and feedback and people moving things forward. And um, I think so. I think it's the perfect time to do it. Um, and I think that it's the, the opportunities there. And so um, I think both from just branding as well as the doing part of it, the, he- uh, the heavy lifting part of it, I see a lot of signs those things are in motion. You know, when they invented the word wow, James, I think they were talking about you. Uh, the information <laughs> that you have given, I, I understand it's a two-hour lecture, and I, believe me, would sit through all two hours of it. Um, but it, it's just amazing. Let me ask you, and, and I, I'm going to have to go back now and do some of my research on traded clusters and local clusters. and and um, But now, are the traded clusters and the local clusters, I guess, but are they... Do they involve more than for-profit businesses, or is the government a traded cluster? Is a, or nonprofits? How does that work? Yeah, this is sort of a good question. Like, let's take NIH for example. You know, eighty percent of the budget is extramural. In other words, grants that they're sending out to research hospitals yeah. and universities and stuff like that. Twenty percent is intramural um, spending that's happening here. But I would consider them sort of a, a traded cluster entity. I think I think it's a it's a really good um, it's a really good example of you know what happens within the walls of NIH impacts the rest of the nation and the world in very profound ways, so I would absolutely characterize that. But because NIH is in Montgomery County, I think there's so many more things that you know. With with NIH, FDA, and Montgomery County, there's so many more. There's so much more activity that can happen around that that can be to the benefit of Montgomery County and spawn even more of these traded cluster businesses. So, there's a reason that those should be in Montgomery County because the mass of traded in, cluster institution is here. But there are many more things that can be leveraged to accelerate that even further and deeper. 
James, let me ask you about what you were talking about earlier about the hospitality industry and, and making it um, growing the IT part of it, the IT technology part of that. Can you can you describe that a little bit more for us, for us who don't understand exactly? We're thinking of, you know, brick and mortar, Marriott, host hotels, choice yeah. hotels, where those folks go into work. We know a lot of those folks have been laid off at this time. There's been salaries that have been cut. Um, how, how do these people come back through IT? So here's the thing is that, uh, so these companies, here's the challenge that we have is that um, we hope the pandemic is something that's gonna be in a rear view mirror, hopefully some point next year. And that those companies like, I'll tell you, when it's all clear, I'm gonna be a happy road warrior again. Yeah. Um, and so those ho ho companies will be fine, but they've learned to live lean. They're not going to bring back every last one of those people. And they've realized that they can reinvent. They need to reinvent everything. And a lot of that reinvention is happening in tech. Um, I want more of those tech people in the industry to be in Montgomery County, you know, who might have been in other entities because the, cust the ultimate customers for, the, for those advancements are here or just across the border at Hilton, you know, and, and, and Tyson. So there's a reason those companies should be here in much greater numbers. But the tech people are only maybe a quarter or 30 percent of those companies. Seventy percent are other people with, you know, with, with, with knowledge of the industry as well, too. So there will be a lot of jobs grown for the non-tech people as well, too, in that category. And there will be more jobs growing in the tech side of that than sort of the, the headquarters jobs. Um, and Montgomery County, oddly, given the extreme dominance, just does not have that many tech businesses or, or hospitality tech businesses compared to the few other cities where we've seen that kind of dominance. They have a ton of tech companies that have grown up around that industry and that raise a lot of capital and build big businesses. Montgomery County hasn't had that yet, but it's an incredible opportunity for Montgomery County. Now, are the tech um, companies, are they... Uh, in in the United States, or many of them international, how does that work? Yeah, so the, the good news is the U.S. is still a tech powerhouse, and the major headquarters companies are in the U.S. and in Montgomery County, or within five miles of Montgomery County. So um, I I mean I don't see any reason there could be thousands of jobs created in hospitality tech over the next five years um, in Montgomery County. Um, you know, high paying jobs that leverage the, the years or decades of experience of a lot of staff, you know, uh, in Montgomery County. So um, that's just one opportunity. And part of the reason why I want to see Montgomery County build the tech, the, the muscle of building tech companies is the quantum future is around the corner. Once again, you know, only 30 percent of those jobs are going to be quantum scientists. Seventy percent are going to be people who can build growing companies. Very interesting. Very interesting. So if you could change one thing right now about how we do things here in Montgomery County, what would that be? Oh, <laughs> it's okay. a loaded question. <laughs> you, have whole, you have a whole two minutes to answer it. So <laughs> it's certainly going to be easy um, for you. One of the things we noticed when we walked in, we've never walked into a community that has done more analysis and smart thinking about themselves than any others. This is a policy town. I mean, you know, um, what we would like to see change and what we're trying to put on the table is um, it has a remarkable set of assets that are not fully brought to the highest and best potential yet. It is gifted with incredible assets that no one else in the U.S. or the world has. Um, and the world is moving in the direction of what those assets can do and what they can be. And it's Montgomery's time to decide we're doing it. Yeah, that's it's that's a very good point. And obviously, with with the vaccines, you mentioned this right now. I mean, the, the idea of branding us as an immunological headquarters. Um, we have several companies that are involved: Novavax, Emergent Biosciences. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're being developed and manufactured here in Maryland. That's huge. That is, that is that is something that we really need to take advantage of. Yeah, and then I should say just like advanced immunology uh, covers a lot of things, not just the vaccines, but uh, Montgomery County has those strengths in spades. And uh, it is, it, it, look, let, let's face it, it's a growth business for the, you know, for, for the next decade or for the rest of humanity, you know, so we might as well be the center of it. Well, Mr. Chung, it has been a very 
very informative 30 minutes. I'm going to turn it over to Council Member Katz to close us out. Thank you so much for coming and, and sharing all your knowledge with us. Oh, Thank you. Fun. You know, um, James, we always say that that this is the fastest 30 minutes that you're going to involved. This was the fastest 30 minutes, I think, since we've had any of these briefings. Uh, you, know, you really are just a remarkable person. You have remarkable knowledge, and Montgomery County needs to listen to you. And, and what I sincerely appreciated was that you told us the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that's what we have. We, we have all of that, and we're going to have to change to get back to all the good and, and uh, work on what, what other areas we need to work on. But James Young, president of REACH Advisors, I sincerely appreciated you being here, and I sincerely, and I know that we will be in touch. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Great. Thanks. This has been fun. I look forward to more with you guys. Yes, Please. definitely. Please. Thank, right. you, Thank, you. Right. Thank you, Mr. John. Great. Take Bye -bye. care. has been passed as council member Sidney Katz turns over the reins to council vice president Tom Hucker. Yeah. How does it feel? Fine. <laughs> to lead the council for the coming year. And that is unanimous. Congratulations and Tom, we all look forward to working with you very uh, very 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 soon as council president. This council believes in a shared ideal. We may not call it the same thing but I call it the Montgomery County promise. It's a promise to our residents that no matter where you come from, we're glad you're here, that your children can access strong schools where they will be challenged to achieve their full potential, that our young adults can consistently find gainful employment and affordable childcare, where they can pay for their higher education and still save enough to buy a home, start a family and put away money for retirement where all of our residents can access dental and health care, regardless of their income or their zip code, where our seniors can age in place without being forced to move away, and in recent years where we make our policies with an eye toward achieving equity and addressing systemic racism, and where we push the envelope to address the existential threat of climate change. To me, that's the Montgomery County promise. Council member Gabe Albernoz was unanimously selected as the council's next vice president. Sidney Katz leaves his presidency, having led the majority of his term virtually through the COVID-19 pandemic and conducting dozens of meetings where critical decisions that would affect the residents of Montgomery County were being made. As I reflect back on this past year, I am both proud and grateful. I am proud that the council was able to do so much for our residents during one of, if not the most challenging time in our history. The challenges that COVID-19 presented were unprecedented. Our lives were and continue to be upended on every level. It made each person realize that we cannot take for granted so much of what happens to us. Neighbor helping neighbor. It also reminded us of the disparities we are constantly working to eliminate. In other news, the council paid tribute to the founding father of the Agricultural Reserve, Dr. Royce Hansen. It truly is an honor to be able to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Montgomery County Agricultural Reserve, and to take this time to honor Dr. Royce Hansen. The With a proclamation presentation by Council Members Andrew Friedson, Nancy Navarro, and Craig Rice to celebrate the 40th anniversary of this county so, gem. Um, Andrew and Craig and Nancy, particularly, thank you. All the members of the council, thank you for uh, protecting the reserve. My parents used to always tell me, we're not sure how long we're going to be able to sustain this but uh, we'll keep going as long as we can. Uh, then came the Ag Reserve, and back in the day, I didn't know who Roy Sanson was, but I uh, have to you know, extend many thanks to Roy Sanson for all the work he did uh, to turn the Ag Reserve around, make it happen back in 1980. Uh, it really meant the world to, to me and my family to be able to stay here and again, uh, continue growing fruit. This is all due, in large part, to a man who was about to retire, but chose to step back into the arena. His steady hand, 
calm under pressure, and rare humility kept him open to the concerns of all stakeholders. From the bottom of my heart, thank you, Royce Hansen. Through your insight, you foresaw that safeguarding this valuable resource was critical to our cultural identity as an agricultural community. This land surely would have been lost to development and the valuable resource of farmland lost forever without your thoughtful guiding hand. Your guidance then and your mentoring of our young citizens today is needed more than ever to Thank you. 
Unfortunately, pedestrian safety is never a fun thing to talk about in Montgomery County because we continue to struggle um, toward the Vision Zero goals. When I did the uh, State of the County address, I actually changed the address because I didn't want to talk about Vision Zero as if it was a great success story in the county. And I feel like this is really a work in progress. And it's a work that needs a lot more progress than has been made so far. So um, I want to introduce uh, Wade Holland, who's going to be our, our new Vision Zero coordinator. We are going to have our full-time Vision Zero coordinator. That'll be going over to the council. I guess you'll be doing a presentation tomorrow. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what I, you know, I think our, our approach is going to be. Uh, we've got to find innovative solutions and we've got to find them faster than we're finding them. We spend a lot of time talking about high tech engineering solutions that would require years and more money than we can put our finger on to solve. And there's a lot of low lying work that we can do and we can do early. And, you know, I've been looking around at what's happening around us. I drive to D.C. on occasion. I've been intrigued by the use of these uh, small, white, flexible poles that they've used to square the corners. Um, and squaring the corners is a big deal because it means people don't swing around the corners the way they're used to doing it. And in the way the corners were designed to facilitate quick movements around corners, it actually forces you to stop and think and take your time making the turn and it gives pedestrians a little bit more of a refuge. That's the kind of thing that we can do, we can do quickly to start making a difference in terms of pedestrian safety. We know lighting's an issue, so we need to talk with the state about the ability to put the bright white lighting at the intersections and frankly, mid-block where there are bus stops because we need to, to enhance the visibility of people crossing the roads if we know people are going to cross mid-block, we can talk to our blue in our faces and say, you shouldn't do it. We know it's going to happen. We should make sure that the lighting is adequate and people can both see vehicles coming and that the vehicles coming can see the pedestrians in the roadway. We've already had three pedestrians killed by collisions in, in January. Um, last year, there were 13 pedestrians and one bicyclist killed. This is too many people. And uh, we need to really begin making more progress. Lots of departments are involved in this. The transportation departments involved. Fire and police are involved. Our public schools are involved. Park and planning, OMB, public information, and county stat. Everybody pretty much is engaged in doing the work of trying to make our roadways safe to, for, de for pedestrians. And we're all going to have to stay engaged in getting this work done. So I'm really happy to see that it's a team effort. I'm interested in what park and planning is looking at doing with predictive analysis. That's a different level than what we've um, been doing so far and make sure we need to make sure that all that integrates with the work that we're doing. Um, I just want to say that, you know, there are important safety tips that people need to adhere to. One is drive, drive at a safe speed. And that we were just talking about this before we came up here. If you're going over 35 miles an hour driving, you're likely to be driving faster than the range of your low beams in the sense that you're driving so fast, you're covering distances quicker than what your low beams are showing you and that you really need to be cognizant of your speed and what you can actually see when you're driving. Um, this county is going to spend $266 million in a six-year CIP on on road and um, pedestrian safety improvements. That's, you know, not all, obviously it's not all Vision Zero, but in the way we're doing our work now, Vision Zero is being incorporated into the design and the improvements that we're making. Uh, we're building more um, bike safety projects. We're doing more pedestrian safety projects. $62 million worth of projects on pedestrian and, and bike safety. Um, we're going to include the first part of the Bethesda Loop, pedestrian safety improvements along Middlebrook and Belpre Roads, and at least four new pedestrian beacons. And I'm a big fan of the, the Hawk beacons that have been put out there. Um, they actually tell people to stop. Um, I like the Hawks that actually have the red lights um, because they actually force the drivers to stop. 
Um, we're all, I think we've all gotten too used to seeing flashing yellow lights. So while they may have some effect, um, there's nothing like a red light to send the message that you can't go through this intersection until a pedestrian or the bikes, bicyclists have, have cleared it. And, uh, we've got more than 30 action items in this year's uh, plan. But I've tried to emphasize again with our staff to start looking at quickly implementable low tech, <laughs> but actual improvements that we can make to deal with pedestrian safety issues in the county. We don't need to wait for the high tech solutions. There's a lot we can do now with the resources that we have. We need to start doing it. And we need people in this county to know that we're serious about this. We need to drive these numbers down. Um, 13 is too many. We need to start um, bringing them down. We can't afford another, another 10 fatalities over the next 11 months. And this year will be worse than the previous year. So that's not an acceptable way for us to go. And having said all this, I want to introduce Wade. Um, come on up and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Wade Holland. Um, I've actually been in the county for about six and a half years, um, working on pedestrian safety and Vision Zero uh, on and off since then uh, when we launched our Vision Zero action plan. In November 2017, I provide interim support for Vision Zero um, as the Vision Zero coordinator. So now that I'm the full-time coordinator, I hope to continue working with all of our partners and our community partners as well and reaching out to more communities than we haven't been able to reach out to in the past. Um, one thing we've really seen in, during the two-year Vision Zero action plan is that our partner list keeps growing and growing and growing, uh, not only because we have more people involved, but we actually have more people proactively outreaching outre to my office or DOT to be involved with Vision Zero, we know this community very much cares about pedestrian, bike, and traffic safety, and they want to live in a community that's safe. So we have 9.3 million that's been added for pedestrian safety initiatives, and this covers a broad range of activities. Uh, it could include the high-intensity activated crosswalks, the hawk signals that the county executive referenced a minute ago, pedestrian refuge island. There could be accessible countdown signals or warning beacons. Those kinds of things all help improve safety for everyone. Sometimes it's necessary to put fencing up to sort of block people from crossing in areas where it's just unsafe to, to do a mid-block crossing. Signage can make a big difference for people. Sidewalks, bus pull-off areas, uh, all of these things help in terms of uh, keeping everyone safe. We may end up relocating, adding, or eliminating bus stops. Again, crossing safely to get a bus can oftentimes be an issue for people. We've also added uh, $4.5 million specifically related to improved safety along the Purple Line. And so that'll be for keeping in mind pedestrian and bicycle needs as that new project gets, gets going. $4.2 million for sidewalk uh, minor projects throughout the county. $2 million to add the Amherst Bikeway project in Wheaton um, CBD. Another $1.9 million to put lights in the Seven Locks uh, Bikeway. Um, $1.3 million for Bikeway minor projects. And then also uh, a little over $600,000 to widen a project, uh, widen a sidewalk that we had previously planned for Good Hope Road. And this making it wider will make it easier for people to travel safely. Improving safety is a continual effort for us at, at the Department of Transportation. In 2020, our slate of planned Vision Zero projects includes uh, targeted in, uh, infrastructure improvements on roadways that have the highest number of crashes, both severe and fatal crashes, which includes Crabs Branch Way, Belpre Road, and Shady Grove Road. Uh, implementing safety recommendations that resulted from a recently, recently completed pedestrian roadway safety audit on Middlebrook Road. Uh, we have a number of uh, hawk and pedestrian beacon type signals going into um, uh, at various locations throughout the county. New bike facilities planned for Bethesda, North Bethesda, and Wheaton. And we're about to build the county's first neighborhood greenway in Aspen Hill. This is a bikeway along low speed, low volume residential streets that are focused to give them walking and biking a priority. Finally, we'll be completing our uh, complete streets guidelines and transmitting those to the county uh, council for approval. I wanna thank the county executive for, for
for hitting the panic button, so to speak. Three of our citizens dying in the first 16 days is a tragic situation. We work very diligently throughout the year in trying to prevent these crashes, but we all have to do more. There's been some common factors in these crashes that I just want to point out. As uh, you heard, most of them are occurring on the major arterial roadways. They've been occurring at night or shortly after rush hour traffic. Uh, the lighting was adequate, but not enhanced as the county executive was talking about. The pedestrian ages were 75, 40, and 32. So we're not talking about youth necessarily. We're talking about uh, adults. In two of the crashes, the pedestrian was not crossing in the intersection. They were crossing not in a crosswalk per se, they were crossing in the mid block. And um, we didn't note any engineering deficiencies. But well, like you heard, we are looking in a, in a holistic way to how we can change these behaviors. And when we talk about, and I've said it once, I'll say it again, everybody has a role and responsibility. You've just heard our county executive tell you that we are gonna look at this differently. We're gonna do things that we haven't traditionally done and we're gonna to try to make changes. But drivers need to look out for children, pedestrian and bicyclists, our vulnerable users. You need to drive defensively and not entitled. We're not talking about right away. We're not talking about fault. We're talking about doing what it takes to prevent these crashes. We need our drivers to expect the unexpected and expect that children, animals, and pedestrians will be coming out, not when you anticipate them and be able to drive slowly and carefully to prevent these crashes from occurring. It's not a matter of being right. It's a matter of being safe. Pedestrians must not enter the roadway in a fashion that it makes it impossible or difficult for drivers to stop for them. It's not a matter of who has right of way. It's not a matter. You need to use intersections and crosswalks because that's where people can see you. If the county executive gets his way and we get enhanced lighting at these locations, it'll be visible and brighter. I think people will want to do this. If you want to wear, do some lighting clothing or make sure that you make that eye contact, that's enhanced and important that you do this. Bicyclists, you need to obey traffic laws and expect that vehicles will not see you when riding on the sidewalk because you're going so fast that drivers don't see when they turn in. In the same regard, drivers, you have to understand that bicycles have a right to be on the roadway. It doesn't matter how fast they go. The speed limit is a maximum speed limit. We have to give them the space they need to operate safely and not give them a hard time when they're riding on the road because that's what we're trying to encourage people to do. DOT and SHA, we need to implement these LED lights as the county executive talked about. The police need to continue to do our enforcement to ensure that uh, both drivers, pedestrians, and bicyclists obey the law. Last year, we did several hundred pedestrian enforcement details, which totaled about 1,400 hours of pedestrian time. We can do better. We can do smarter. We can do more. Civic groups, we need you engaged to actively participate in the awareness we need to get not only your members, but help with the general public. And we need the PIO to be able to get a comprehensive program. They can't do it by themselves. We're going to have to get help. But we need everybody to educate others. What you hear today, and thank you for being here today, because we have to get this message out. Everybody has to look out for each other. It's not that difficult, but we are, we are not going in the right directions. Uh, I want to compliment Mr. Holland, now I call him Captain Zero, um, because I know he's highly intelligent, dedicated, and passionate about traffic safety. But more importantly, he's young, because we're talking about the next 10 years, 2030, we're going to eliminate these crashes of Vision Zero's um, going to be acceptable, and we're going to need a young man to be able to captain this ship for a long period of time. With that, thank you all very much.
Hello and welcome to My Green Montgomery. I'm Susan Stark. There's a good reason for everyone to want a Green Montgomery County. For some, it's to preserve our natural beauty. For others, it's to reduce our carbon footprint and live more sustainably. And still for others, it's about saving green money every day. Whatever your reason, we'll tell you how you can find information and resources to achieve your green goals. In this episode, we're going to find out how your business can become green certified. We're also going to get some tips about improving your garden and the importance of adding trees to your landscape. But first, we're going to discover how you can increase the beauty of your property, decrease stormwater runoff, and earn rebates for installing a rain garden, rain barrel, or other conservation landscaping techniques. Most rainfall on urban surfaces such as roofs, driveways, roads, parking lots, and patios end up in stormwater runoff. In contrast, rainfall on natural surfaces like forests and meadows soak into the ground where it can replenish groundwater and recharge streams. The Rainscapes program is pitched at the individual. So the government does a lot of big stormwater ponds and other retrofits along roadways like Arcola Avenue has got a retrofit that's going to treat some of the water before it goes into the storm drain. But what can the individual homeowner do? Um, you can put in a Rainscape and these are multiple benefit solutions. They control the water, they help it soak in, but they also provide a lot of beauty and a lot of projects around the home that can enhance your property. Most people are just learning about how to do this and how they want to do the right thing for the environment. So how can they do it? And so we give them the information. And then on top of that, we have the rebate program, uh, which provides some incentives to cost share uh, for people that want to do things at home. There are several everyday gardening practices that control stormwater runoff from your yard, like using organic or natural fertilizers or pesticides for a healthy yard so chemicals stay out of our waterways. Keep leaves and other yard trimmings out of the storm drains by collecting trim for composting or check the leaf collection schedule from your community at mygreenmontgomery.org. Also, try to grass cycle by leaving grass clippings right on your lawn. We have nine different types of rebate projects actually, but the things like a rain garden or changing your turf out for native plantings, which support our pollinators. You might think about a green roof or you could do permeable pavement uh, as a retrofit where you're replacing your driveway when you have to replace it anyway. Uh, rain barrels, cisterns, dry wells, there are lots of different ways and uh, you don't have to do it all in one piece. You can do it as a series of years. So in late May, uh, we have a conservation landscaping workshop. You can find the link to it on our webpage. It's offered here at Brookside Gardens, and it costs $10. Um, at that workshop, we talk about watershed health, things you can do in your landscape to decompact your lawn, to replace your lawn with native plantings, to um, support our native um, butterflies and birds, other pollinators. And then we also give you a property map which includes the topography. We talk about drainage issues on your property. There are many people that want to solve drainage issues and conservation landscapes are one way to do it. So for $10, it's a pretty good deal and we can take 40 people each day. Um, so a total of 80 and there's room. So I hope people sign up. To find out more about the Rainscapes program and the different projects you can do at your home or office, go to rainscapes.org. Coming up, we're going to find out what you can do to grow your own garden and increase the native landscaping in your yard. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to Energy Star light bulbs and you'll realize just how much cash you are really burning through. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Welcome back to My Green Montgomery. I'm here at Brookside Gardens where Phil Normandy is joining us to tell us what tips we need to enhance our gardening attempts. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell us, what should we be doing this time of year with our garden? Well, this is a tricky time of year. It's uh, a little late for some of the really early spring stuff. It's a little bit early to be putting out our summer plants. So I should not be planting any tomatoes and basils and... It's probably not completely safe right now. Uh, even just at seed stage? Oh, seed stage is okay, but it's so cold right now, nothing's going to germinate. Um, remember that a lot of our summer vegetable plants and crops are heat lovers. They really perform best in midsummer. Uh, just think about your tomatoes and ripening and so forth. 
And right now, today at least, it's quite cold, and we are in for a very cool week. So I would say it's, well, it's probably not safe to put anything out until after the 1st of May. I know you're seeing them in the garden centers, and they're big and they're bushy, and we had a couple of 80-degree days, and it's very tempting to go out there and stuff them in the ground. But um, just to be on the safe side, I think I'd wait till after May 1st, which is technically our frost-free date. Okay, and what are the most important things we should do once we do get our plants and we do want to start planting them? I um, guess the soil is the first thing. Yeah, you, you, if you're planting in an established bed, you just want to turn the soil, loosen it, add compost or other organic matter if you can that keeps the soil loose and makes it retain moisture. So you it's don't have to water as much. It's good nutrients as well, right? It is. It's good for, it provides some nutrients and it binds up any other nutrients that you might be putting on in the form of fertilizers. Um, during dry periods, uh, starting in May, the soil can dry very quickly. And so you want to provide about an inch of water a week to these plants to get them going until they get the roots out into the soil. And when they get the roots into the soil, then they're a little more aggressive about finding water than they were than when they were just in a little plug. Like when they're small and they're in their little box, their little black containers, mm -hmm. how deep should they go in the ground? Should it stay about the same level? Same level. Very good point. Yeah, don't overbury your plants. I know you can with tomato plants if they're a little leggy because they'll form roots, but in general, if you plant too deeply, it's just sort of suffocating the plants. So keep them at the same level that they were in the pot. And do you have to immediately water them once you put them Absolutely. in the Absolutely. You must because you've already disturbed those roots and you've taken them out of their soil. And so a good drink is, is the best insurance against wilting. How important is it to have a lot of plants and trees in our landscape? I think it's very important because um, in any urban area, deforestation from building is continuing, of course. And while trees that are left behind are still growing, we're, we're having a net loss. And so any place where we can plant and have room to plant anything that produces oxygen, the better off we are with our greenhouse gas problem. You, you can help by putting out, if you don't have room for large trees, you can put you know more shrubs. So the net, it's, it's the net number of leaves where the oxygen is actually made is the important thing for cleansing the environment. Okay, and when it comes to planting our trees, is there anything I should know about that? Yes, there is. Um, trees can be planted best when they're dormant with the leaves off, and that's when the ground is, is cool and so forth. And so if you're buying a tree that's been dug out of the ground at a nursery, it's called bald and burlap, usually has a burlap bag around it. It's best to plant those um, in March, April, before they start growing actively. You can still continue to plant them, but it's it's considered to be a fall or a spring activity. For things that are grown in pots, you can plant them almost any time because you're not sacrificing a lot of roots. You're just taking them out of the pot, spreading the roots, and planting them and watering them. However, the later it gets into summer, the more care they're going to need to get them established, a lot more care to water and so forth. But right now, the garden centers are, are full of fresh plant material, and it's... Uh, you know, quite tempting to go out and, and, and make your selection now. Well, I know a lot of farmers are worried about the warmer weather because a lot of their plants were starting to bud earlier than usual. So oh, it's, the this, weather's... it's been crazy. We Some things were four weeks ahead. Right. We should be in peak tulip time and they're already finished here. So even though it's cold for us, it's actually good for our plants. It's good. It slows them down. They, they sort of got this giant jump when it was 80 degrees and it wasn't, it wasn't good for them. Well, thank you very much for all of your tips. Oh, you're certainly welcome. And for more information and tips for your garden, go to brooksidegardens.org. Up next, we're going to tell you how your business can take steps to be green and get certified. We'll be right back. Here's your chance to save money and help the environment. Bring your reusable bag when you shop and you'll save five cents for every store bag you don't need. Retailers in Montgomery County charge five cents for the plastic or paper bags they provide. Why? Because plastic bags are the biggest single source of stream and waterway litter, causing pollution and flooding. And every year, Montgomery County spends $3 million on cleanup. So do yourself and the environment a favor. Bring your reusable bag when you shop. You'll fight litter and keep the change. Montgomery County, Maryland Green Business Certification Program is designed to recognize businesses and other entities that have taken voluntary steps to protect, preserve, and improve the environment. 
Earning a green business certification indicates that the business is part of an innovative leadership movement to green business operations and help transition to a sustainable future. The program currently is, is, is focused on uh, office-based businesses, uh, and it's about day-to-day -day operations. So in a sense, it's a, it's a complement uh, to LEED certification. LEED, of course, focuses on, on buildings and major systems. Ours is really about cultural change and day-to-day -day operations and policies. Um, and it's uh, divided into seven sections. It's an application with 260 uh, actions ranging from organizational commitment, stormwater management, energy conservation, environmentally responsible procurement, et cetera, et cetera. And based on uh, your size, if you're small and you lease space versus whether you're large and own and occupy your space so you have more latitude to make the changes, it's anywhere from about 60 actions to 120 actions. Those could be little actions or very significant actions. Most of them are cost neutral um, or will actually save you money. I mean, sure, there are things on the application like you know, uh, install a green roof, which is definitely has significant capital costs. But those are, you know, those are optional. None of the, and then we have a few required actions, but none of those required actions are really uh, going to cost you a significant amount. The application process to become a green certified business is designed to provide each business with the flexibility to pursue a wide variety of measures. Yeah, I think certainly familiarize yourself with the website. There's a lot of interesting reading. There's a, a resource guide which is uh, really useful. And actually, it's embedded within the application. So if you pull up the application, you'll see that uh, uh, certain actions are highlighted in green. If you click on those, it'll take you immediately to a resource guide that'll, guide that'll explain, you know, why is this action important and how do I go about implementing this action? So start there. Um, don't be overwhelmed. It, it's, a, it's a lengthy uh, application, but I think as you get into it and get some support through uh, a green team and create a survey so that you're getting some uh, bright, fresh ideas from your employees and you're also getting buy-in, uh, you'll see that it's a very uplifting uh, process. Many local companies have seen the value of participating in green practices and have taken advantage of the green business certification. We didn't go into it looking for a cost benefit, but what we've seen on the back end is that there is a cost benefit. Um, one of the biggest money saving um, ideas that we've had was to switch everything over to printing double sided automatically. Um, and I think a lot of people just started thinking more about printing and cut back altogether. So we went from, you know, a couple of boxes of paper every week to you know a couple of reams so we've really cut back on the paper usage which has resulted in cost savings and we weren't looking for that to happen so it, it was a unexpected benefit. Uh, as far as future initiatives we would love to continue to do anything that we can uh, to help the environment and the other nice thing about going green is we've met and had the opportunity of meeting so many other businesses uh, that are green and so it um, allows us to learn a lot more about what we can continue to do. We've had some functions at our branches where we've invited all of the, the companies and clients that we've met that also have that same goal. That's yeah. been great. If you're interested in the Green Business Certification Program and would like more information, go to mcgreenbiz.org. Well, that's our show. I'd like to thank you for tuning in. If you'd like information about any of our topics on today's show or to find more green projects, go to mygreenmontgomery.org, your guide to living a green life in Montgomery County. You may have already heard that Pepco and soon BG&E will be installing new meters called Smart Meters for all customers of Maryland. Pepco has recently begun installations in Montgomery County and they'll continue through 2012. You will receive information from your utility before they exchange your meter, which you should review carefully. This information helps explain the features of the new Smart Meters and when those features will be available.
Saludos y bienvenidos a esta cápsula informativa del Condado de Montgomery. Yo soy Lorna Virgilí y gracias por su sintonía. Comenzamos el programa con el Censo del 2020. A partir de esta semana, todos sus hogares recibieron una carta por parte del Buró del Censo invitando a completar el cuestionario. Dicha carta contiene un código identificador único que identifica su hogar. Una vez que reciba esta invitación por correo, pueda responder al censo por internet visitando my2020census.gov. También tendrá la opción de responder por teléfono o con el cuestionario de papel. Las instrucciones sobre cómo responder al censo se incluirán en esta carta. Bueno, eh, le pedimos a nuestra comunidad hispana, comunidad valiente que siempre está peleando, que por favor completen el formulario del censo comenzando esta semana. Esta semana recibirán el, el, la invitación para que vayan al internet y completen el formulario. Por favor, abre esa carta, vaya al internet, complete el formulario. Y si no quiere hacerlo por internet, por favor, solamente llame y por teléfono puede proveer la información. Lo importante es que participemos. Estamos muy contentos, nuestra comunidad va a participar y tendremos un censo excelente dentro de la comunidad hispana. Es de suma importancia que todos los hogares de Montgomery completen el cuestionario. Designe a alguien en su casa para completar el censo. Hágalo por internet si puede o llame al número 1-800 que va a recibir en la carta del censo para que lo responda por teléfono o pida el cuestionario de papel en español. Este es el conteo de toda la población del país que ocurre cada 10 años para distribuir fondos federales que apoyan los programas y servicios que ofrecemos acá en el condado de Montgomery. Es importante que todas las personas que estén viviendo en casa, incluyendo bebés, niños, ancianos e inquilinos, sean contados. Y no importa el estatus migratorio en el país. Y para aquellas personas que necesiten asistencia para completar el cuestionario del censo o que no tienen computadora en casa para hacerlo por internet, podrán obtenerla en las bibliotecas públicas del condado, también en la ciudad de Rockville. La ciudad ha anunciado que los centros comunitarios Lincoln Park, Thomas Farm, Twinbrook y Rockville Senior Center estarán disponibles para aquellas personas que quieren llegar a completar el cuestionario del Censo 2020. Para más información sobre el censo, puede visitar 2020census.gov diagonal ES o llamar a nuestro centro de operadoras llamando al 311. La Organización Mundial de la Salud ha declarado el brote de coronavirus como pandemia global. En Montgomery no hemos sido inmunes ya que se han reportado casos de personas cuyas pruebas médicas dieron positivo de coronavirus. A medida que el brote de COVID-19 continúa evolucionando, el Ejecutivo del Condado Mark Elrich y el Consejo del Condado inmediatamente celebraron una conferencia de prensa para presentar información y asesoramiento a los residentes del condado. Quiero que la comunidad sepa que no tengan pánico y que se mantengan informados. Nosotros tenemos la información um, aquí dentro del condado, así que chequea la página del internet con el condado o llama el 311 si tienen preguntas. El condado ha creado una página de web especial montgomerycountymd.gov diagonal coronavirus para proporcionar a los residentes una serie de recursos incluyendo videos del oficial de salud del condado de Montgomery, el doctor Travis Gales. Se le urge a la población el obtener información mediante fuentes fidedignas y confiables. Como prevención, lávese las manos con frecuencia durante todo el día. Use agua tibia y jabón. Si no hay agua y jabón disponibles, use un desinfectante de manos a base de alcohol. Si debe toser o estornudar, hágalo en el codo. Cubra la tos y los estornudos con un pañuelo de papel. Evite tocarse los ojos, la nariz y la boca. Los gérmenes se propagan de esta manera. Mantenga las superficies, especialmente las superficies del baño y los juguetes de los niños, limpias, limpiándolas con un desinfectante doméstico. 
Quédese en casa si está enfermo y regístrese para recibir alertas a través del sistema de notificación de Alert Montgomery del condado. Para inscribirse a nuestro sistema de emergencia, visite alert.montgomerycountymd.gov. Se va aproximando la elección primaria presidencial en el estado de Maryland y nuestra Junta Electoral ha implementado nueva tecnología para que las personas se puedan inscribir a votar o servir como trabajadores electorales enviando mensajes de texto al 77788. Se necesitan votantes inscritos que puedan servir como trabajadores electorales durante la elección primaria presidencial que se llevará a cabo el 28 de abril. El proceso para aplicar requiere un examen por internet y entrenamiento. Para más información visite 777vote.org o envíe el mensaje Servir por texto al 77788. Si desea inscribirse para votar, envíe un mensaje con la palabra vota a y va a recibir un enlace para que pueda inscribirse. Y continuamos en la temporada de presentar los impuestos y queremos recordar a los residentes del condado que el programa Vita del condado puede ayudar a aquellas personas con la preparación de impuestos gratis, individuos y hogares que ganaron 56 mil dólares o menos en el 2019 califican para el servicio de impuestos gratis. Voluntarios certificados por el Servicio de Rentas Internas ayudaron a más de 2,000 residentes el año pasado, con ubicaciones en Silver Spring, Wheaton, Germantown y Gaithersburg. Para obtener más información visite montgomerycountymd.gov diagonal cashback o llame al 311 para concertar su cita. Le preparan gratuitamente los impuestos federales y del estado de Maryland. En el 1987, el Proyecto Nacional de Historia de la Mujer solicitó que el Congreso estableciera marzo como mes de la historia de la mujer. Y recientemente, el Ejecutivo del Condado Mark Elrich y miembros del Consejo presentaron proclamas a una serie de mujeres y organizaciones de mujeres que han contribuido a la historia, la innovación y la cultura del condado de Montgomery. Media docena de mujeres recibieron este reconocimiento. Usted las ha visto estacionadas en las aceras. Son un modo de transporte cómodo, fácil y que atrae mucho a la juventud. Un nuevo proyecto de ley presentado en el Consejo añadiría restricciones de edad y velocidad al programa de e-scooters del condado. La medida ha sido presentada por el presidente del consejo, Sidney Katz, y copatrocinada por el concejal, Gabe Albornoz. Buscan que solo la puedan alquilar personas mayores de los 14 años de edad y que los menores de 18 tengan que utilizar un casco de protección mandatoriamente que no se puedan conducir a más de 15 millas por hora y habrán restricciones de dónde se podrán estacionar. El verano del año pasado se implementó un programa piloto de los e-scooters en el condado, el cual ha tenido mucho éxito. Tras tomar en cuenta la opinión de la policía, el concejal Katz nos dice que esas leyes son simplemente sentido común. Tendrán una audiencia sobre este tema el 24 de marzo. Y el Departamento de la Policía de Montgomery busca personal para el Centro de Llamadas de Emergencia, el 911, y también para la Academia de Policías. El jefe de la policía, Marcus Jones, ha dicho que busca diversificar un poco más la fuerza policíaca, y esto quiere decir que se busca personas bilingües dispuestas a ingresar a la Academia de la Policía. Si le interesa este empleo, puede someter su solicitud visitando montgomerycountymd.gov diagonal careers. 
La Oficina de Derechos Humanos del Condado de Montgomery está organizando la gira de Historia del Movimiento por los Derechos Civiles. Este tour en autobús llamado Civil Rights Educational Freedom Experience recorre lugares históricos en los estados sur del país donde se encaminó el movimiento de los derechos civiles de los afroamericanos. La excursión es de una semana en autobús, con hospedaje en varios hoteles y el recorrido para en varios lugares emblemáticos de la vida del doctor Martin Luther King Jr. y otros héroes de los derechos civiles. El tour se lleva a cabo del 18 al 26 de abril. La inscripción para el viaje cierra el 15 de marzo. Para obtener más información, visite montgomerycountymd.gov diagonal human rights. Y bueno, si usted busca de una mascota para su familia, en vez de comprar, adopte una. Recuerde que nuestro centro de adopción de animales tiene cientos de animalitos que usted pudiera adoptar. Esta semana le presentamos a Sunny. Tiene 10 años y es diabético, pero esto no le prohíbe ser toda una bola de energía. Si le interesa adoptar a Sunny u otra mascota, puede visitar las instalaciones localizadas en Derwood. Y para más información, también puede llamar al 240-773-5900. Y bueno, así llegamos al final de esta cápsula informativa del Condado de Montgomery. Para toda la información sobre lo que acontece en el condado, visite nuestra página de internet montgomerycountymd.gov o para solicitar cualquier servicio, llame a nuestro centro de operadoras marcando el 311. Yo soy Lorna Virgilí, gracias por su sintonía y recuerde, manténgase informado de lo que pasa en nuestro condado. El censo cuenta a todos los que vivimos en este país, incluyendo aquellos que no pensarías que también cuentan. Una persona en el hospital, sí, cuenta. Miguelito que acaba de nacer, sí, Miguelito ya cuenta. Los García y los Álvarez que comparten la misma casa, sí, todos cuentan. El primo Luis que acaba de llegar al país y está viviendo en el garaje de Pedro, también cuenta. El censo cuenta a todos para que a todos nos vaya mejor. El mensaje de texto típico te distrae del camino por casi 5 segundos. Evita textear, evita chocar. Aprende más en evita textear, evita chocar.org. ¿Sabía usted que existen más de 10.000 números telefónicos en el gobierno del condado de Montgomery? Bueno, ahora solo debe recordar el número 311 para cualquier llamada que no sea de emergencia. El 311 es el sistema de información vía telefónica que ofrece el gobierno. ¿Necesita información? ¿Tiene algún problema con un servicio del condado? ¿Desea localizar a algún departamento o agencia del gobierno? Entonces, marque el 311. El centro de operadoras está abierto de lunes a viernes desde las 7 de la mañana hasta las 7 de la noche. El sitio de internet está disponible las 24 horas al día. En el condado de Montgomery, la meta es reducir y reciclar el 70% de todos los desechos para el 2020. Al reciclar y reducir los desechos, conservamos los recursos naturales y mejoramos nuestra comunidad. Reciclen el hogar, el trabajo, la escuela y continuemos reciclando. Para información, llame a la División de Servicios de Desechos Sólidos del condado de Montgomery al 311 o visite montgomerycountymd.gov barra recycling. Continuemos reciclando. Recicle más ahora. Introducing Ride on Flex, Montgomery County Department of Transportation's new on-demand transit service to help you get around and define Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton zones. Riding the Flex is easy. Download the Ride on Flex app, select your pickup and drop-off locations within the zone, and go to your pickup location, a corner near you, and you ride for two bucks or less. Visit rideonflex.com for service areas and hours of operation. 
¿Cómo está? Le saluda Lilian Más, vocera hispana para el Consejo del Condado de Montgomery. El día de hoy me acompaña Carolina Orozco, representante de Montgomery Health Connection, una agencia que se encarga de proveer cobertura médica a todos los residentes del Condado de Montgomery, pero también en todo el estado de Maryland. Estamos en una pandemia y algo que está incrementando cada vez son los casos de personas infectadas con el coronavirus y ahora más que nunca es importante poder contar con cobertura médica, es por eso que la hemos invitado para que nos diga cuáles son las opciones que tienen todas aquellas personas que ya sea no tengan seguro médico y quieren adquirir uno, que tenían seguro médico y lo han perdido ya sea porque le han reducido las horas en su trabajo, porque han perdido su empleo, todavía hay oportunidades de poder obtener cobertura médica y para eso está aquí. Bienvenida, gracias por estar con nosotros Carolina. Gracias por esta oportunidad. Podríamos empezar hablando sobre qué es Montgomery Health Connection y cómo esto puede beneficiar a todas aquellas personas que no tienen cobertura médica, que ahora más que nunca es importante tener una. Claro que sí. Eh, nosotros somos eh, una entidad que trabajamos directamente con el mercado de Maryland para seguros médicos que se llama Maryland Health Connection. Ahí las, los residentes de Maryland pueden aplicar para una cobertura médica y eh, también ahora que es el periodo de eh, inscripción abierta pueden comprar un plan dental para el año 2021. Como usted dijo, estamos en una época de emergencia. Los casos están subiendo de COVID, so es nuestro deber asistir a todos los residentes que son elegibles para comprar un seguro médico y proteger a su familia. ¿Por qué no empezamos por ahí entonces? ¿Quiénes son elegibles para poder tener acceso a ese plan de cobertura? Como no, los uh, residentes de Maryland que son ciudadanos, individuos que tienen permiso de trabajo, residencia, la tarjeta uh, de residencia permanente y otro tipo de visas. Bien, usted no está limitado solamente a ciudadanos americanos. Sí se necesita tener un seguro social válido, ya sea que lo ha tenido obtenido a través de un tipo de visa o permiso de trabajo, o si tiene TPS, pues TPS, puede usted tener acceso a este plan de cobertura médica. Entonces, una vez que ya decimos, ok, yo califico para poder tener esa cobertura médica, ¿puede la gente también incluir a miembros de su familia siempre y cuando tengan los requisitos que hemos dicho anteriormente? Sí, hay eh, familias que, por ejemplo, tienen distintos tipos de eh, visa, documentos, ciudadanos, permiso de trabajo, como dije, mencioné antes. So, sí, cualquier persona que, ten, que eh, tenga esos requisitos puede aplicar. Por ejemplo, si su hijo es ciudadano americano y usted solo tiene ese TPS o algún tipo de visa de trabajo, puede aplicar a su hijo. O viceversa, si usted tiene eh, residencia, tiene residencia y su, sus hijos están ya sea en espera de, de un estatus, pero tienen un seguro social válido, podrían aplicar para este plan de cobertura. Correctamente. Bien. Entonces, una vez que establecemos que tanto nosotros como nuestro, los miembros de nuestra familia pueden tener acceso a eso, nos, sería bueno poder explorar los diferentes tipos de cobertura, porque como sabemos, eh, para muchos, o sea, que, quienes hemos tenido seguro médico, es, no es nada barato. Entonces, si ha sido que he perdido mi seguro médico porque perdí el trabajo o ya no estoy haciendo lo suficientemente eh, lo, la cantidad de dinero que estaba haciendo antes, uno, uno lo piensa dos veces, ¿cómo voy a estar pagando por un seguro médico? No tengo, no tengo el ingreso para poder hacerlo. ¿Qué opciones hay? Sí, hay eh, dos opciones. Hay personas que cualifican para lo que conoce, se conoce el Medicaid, que es el programa de gobierno gratuito. Eso tiene una, unos margen de ingreso. So, si usted cualifica, dependiendo del tamaño de su hogar, entonces tiene su programa gratuito de salud médica. Ahora, hay personas que no cualifican, ya sea por ingreso o por estatus migratorio, pueden cualificar entonces para lo que se conoce un subsidio y reducción de costo al usar el plan. So, hay muchos eh, incentivos para que personas vengan al mercado a aplicar para seguro. Y uno de los grandes miedos que hay ahora mismo en, el, en, el, en la comunidad inmigrante, ya sea que, que tenga o no tenga documentos, es todo esto de la carga pública. El Perfecto. tener acceso a esta, este tipo de ayuda 
de una u otra manera los subsidios que usted está hablando, eh, ¿podría afectar en ese sentido? Bueno, eh, lo, nosotros siempre le aconsejamos al aplicante que hable con su abogado, pero lo que se conoce como carga pública son para los eh, programas de gobierno gratuito, ya el Medicaid. Eh, la carga pública no aplica para mujeres embarazadas que tienen el Medicaid o para individuos, niños menores de 21 años. So, hay sus reglas. Y, bien, y no todos estos programas de los que usted está hablando son gratuitos, ¿no? Son, no todos son subsidiados por el gobierno federal. Hay opciones que sí puede tener algún tipo de ayuda, pero usted tiene que pagar algo de su bolsa. ¿Cuáles son esas opciones? ¿Y de cuánto más o menos estamos hablando? Yo creo que esa es la gran incógnita, lo que todos queremos saber. Si vamos a pagar seguro médico, ¿de cuánto dinero estamos hablando? Bueno, eso es, uno tiene que llenar una aplicación porque cada caso es distinto. Hogar de tres personas con cierto tipo de ingreso, hogar de una persona con un ingreso. So, no se puede decir, ah, usted va a recibir 180 o 300 dólares. Tiene que llenar la aplicación porque en la aplicación está la fórmula de tamaño de hogar, edades y, e ingreso. Ingreso es el factor primordial. Básicamente lo que me está diciendo es que el costo del seguro médico va a depender del ingreso que tenga en ese momento y el número de personas en una familia. Si Exacto. he perdido mi trabajo y no tengo ningún ingreso, ¿puedo yo tener ese tipo de seguro? Usted sí puede aplicar. Tiene eh, Ahora mismo por el estado de emergencia que estamos en Maryland y, y pa, pa, eh, particularmente en el mundo, este Maryland Health Connection abrió la oportunidad de, de inscribirse para ahora mismo. No tiene que esperar hasta el 2021. Eso sí podrían aplicar. Y nosotros asistimos a los clientes para evaluar su ingreso, para evaluar qué recursos tiene. Lo que yo quiero sí establecer es que no son cantidades inalcanzables. No estamos hablando de que va a estar pagando 300, 400 dólares al mes. Hay seguros, de todo depende también de lo que escoja, ¿verdad? Pero desde 10 es que... dólares he escuchado. ¿O sí, eso es cierto. Porque un ejemplo es de 10 personas, 9 de las personas que están aplicando reciben ese subsidio. El mercado de Maryland Health Connection es la única avenida para que los, los residentes de Maryland vean si cualifican para subsidio. Si usted va a, a una agencia de seguro médico, una compañía de seguro, no le van a dar esos descuentos. Solamente es Maryland Health Connection. So es muy bueno que las personas vengan a, a Maryland Health Connection, nos llame o se vayan a la página web para ver si ellos cualifican, especialmente en estos momentos de crisis. Vamos a agarrar el papel y lápiz, porque vamos a estar dándole el número de teléfono en donde usted puede llamar, se le va a atender completamente en español. Carolina, ¿o me equivoco? Como no, nosotros tenemos representantes bilingües. Eh, y entonces usted puede hacer todo el tipo de preguntas que usted quiera hacer en ese momento. Y si puede escribirse ahí en ese momento, eh, eh, es más que perfecto. Ahora, okay. nosotros hemos estado hablando anteriormente, durante el año, desde que dio inicio la crisis, sobre cómo usted puede inscribirse. Estas eran inscripciones para que usted pudiese registrarse, eh, eran, eran especiales, y eran, se crearon específicamente por el coronavirus. Esta inscripción de que se está dando ahora mismo, es la que va a contar para el próximo año, para el 2021. O sea, que si se cierra el periodo para usted poder inscribirse y no lo hizo, ¿cuándo va a volver a tener una oportunidad? ¿Hasta el próximo mes de noviembre del 2021? Correcto. Pero de nuevo, durante el año, si una persona sufre unos cambios como perdió el trabajo, como bajó el ingreso, eso es un periodo especial. Eso se puede para ese individuo que ha tenido cambio de vida, por ejemplo, se casa, se divorcia, eh, un embarazo, las personas pueden aplicar, porque eso es, además de tener este periodo de inscripción abierta, que es una vez al año, más la del COVID, cuando las personas pierden su cobertura, entonces sí pueden aplicar en el mercado. Yo tengo una pregunta y esta es más curiosidad personal. Este, ¿Cuál es la diferencia entre ustedes y el seguro Cobra? 
que, que es algo que le ofrecen a uno, por ejemplo, cuando pierde el, el empleo y le dicen, aplique cobra? Esa es muy buena pregunta, porque eh, las personas no entienden que cuando tienen seguro médico eh, por medio de un grupo, por su empleado, la prima mensual ya es 100 por, 102% responsable el, el, consum, el empleado. Ya el empleador, como no hay la relación, es responsabilidad 100%. Eso, eso puede salir muy caro. So, nosotros lo que queremos aconsejar es a las personas que están en esa situación que vengan al mercado de Maryland Health Connection primero que no, se comunique con nosotros para nosotros poder asistirle. ¿Cu ¿Cuándo cierra el periodo de inscripción con ustedes? Diciembre 15. Okay, so, si después de diciembre 15 usted no ha conseguido su seguro médico, va a tener que esperar hasta noviembre del 2021, a menos que hayan habido cambios, como decía anteriormente. Carolina, sí. este programa es lo que muchos conocen como Obamacare. Sin mal, no me equivoco, corríjame, Carolina. Correctamente. Así, como mucho, todo esto fue una iniciativa de cuando estuvo la pasada administración Obama y ahí fue donde inició todo esto de este de estos planes de cobertura. Así que es algo muy importante que usted lo tome en cuenta porque tiene esa opción ahí. Muchas personas podrían, podrían estar diciendo, no, mejor me ahorro ese dinero y, 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 y yo soy saludable. Entonces, recordemos que no solamente estamos en medio de una pandemia, sino que los accidentes pasan. Los accidentes no se planean. Usted puede tener control quizás de cómo, de su comportamiento, si se va a poner la máscara, si se va a lavar las manos, pero usted no tiene control de todos los factores alrededor de usted, más de lo que usted hace. Entonces, no solamente es cuestión de que si me enfermo o no me enfermo, es también cuestión de que si pasa un accidente, usted va a tener el respaldo médico que va a necesitar para poder sobrepasar esa, ese problema. Esa Bien, entonces... Tenemos que, hemos dicho, ya, ya estamos recapitulando porque se nos está acabando el tiempo y me gustaría hacer un poquito más, más concentrado. Entonces, las personas, ya sea residente, que tenga papeles o no, bueno, que tenga papeles, eh, no, no tiene que tener un estatus como que ciudadano o residente, puede tener visa, o siempre y cuando tenga un seguro social válido, usted puede tener acceso a esto. Puede sí. incluir a todos los miembros de su familia siempre y cuando también califiquen. Y este no sé qué otra información le gustaría a usted compartir, Carolina, que cree que sea sí. importante para nosotros. El seguro social es importante, pero quiero hacer una calificación, porque hay ciertas visas que no requieren tener seguro social. Un gran ejemplo es el de la el, el estudiante, el F1 o F2. El F1 sí va a tener un seguro social, pero lo que es la esposa, los niños, no requieren tener. ¿No les piden a ellos tener seguro médico como visa de estudiante? Seguro social. No, sí, pero para ellos también, para poder ellos, yo creo que uno de los requerimientos, bueno, usted sabrá más que yo, pero sí tengo entendido que uno de los requerimientos es que deben de tener seguro médico. Exactamente. ¿Y para tener seguro médico no necesitan un seguro social? Por medio del mercado, no. Por eso, por, por eso hago la distinción, que hay visas que no requieren tener un seguro social. ¿Puede decir entonces el número de teléfono en donde las personas en el condado de Montgomery y en cualquier otro lado del estado de Maryland pueden aplicar para estos, este tipo de seguros? Sí, con mucho gusto. Eh, el teléfono de Montgomery County Health Connection, que somos nosotros, es 240-777-1815. Dos cuarenta, siete, 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 un ocho, uno cinco. Y lo estoy viendo ahora mismo en su pantalla. Se nos acaba el tiempo. Solo quería confirmar antes de despedirme que también dentro de estos planes hay cobertura para servicio de cuidado de, 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 de dental y de, de la vista también. Eh, de la vista viene en el plan médico, es muy limitado. Uh -huh. Y usualmente es para, para individuos menores de 19 años. Bueno, yo con esto me despido. Le agradezco mucho que nos esté dando un poquito de estas clases porque es importante tenerlas presentes sobre lo que es cobertura médica. Yo soy Lilian Más y espero que nos esté sintonizando este, todos los, los viernes de cada mes en, um, en, a través de Radio América. Radio América y también nos puede ver aquí en nuestra página de Facebook, Consejo del Condado de Montgomery y también en nuestro canal local del Condado de Montgomery. Hasta la próxima y muchas gracias, Carolina. Gracias. Hi. 
Hi, my name is Mishai Salu, Visual Information Specialist for the Montgomery County Council. Health insurance has always been important, but has become even more important than ever during this pandemic. In today's segment, I'm speaking with Luis Omar Lopez, Certified Healthcare Navigator for Ooh. Montgomery County Health Connection, a healthcare marketplace in the state of Maryland. Mr. Lopez, thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, thank you. So we can just uh, let's get let's just get started. Uh, tell us about Maryland Health Connection and how it works. All right. So Maryland Health Connection, as we some people not everybody knows, is the um, state insurance marketplace. It's where everybody, individuals, Marylanders, um, can go in and enroll in health coverage, um, whether it's for Medicaid or the um, through the Affordable Care Act. Okay. And uh, what types of plans are available um, and are testing and services for like COVID-19 related services covered through these plans? Yes, so um, beginning November 1st, that's when open enrollment started and um, people that are currently enrolled, they can renew their health coverage um, for the 2021 year or um, individuals who are um, not enrolled and they want to enroll in health coverage, they can also do that as well during open enrollment. Health plan costs have dropped again this year. And um, like last year, nine out of 10 Marylanders um, that enrolled in coverage um, received and were able to qualify for financial assistance, which means that the, the premium of their coverage was decreased. Um, open enrollment ends in December 15. So if you want to be covered for the new year, um, you can explore your options today. Um, the coverage and the types of services that are covered um, with these plans. So um, you'll recognize that health um, insurance companies that provide pri private plans specifically, like CareFirst and Kaiser Permanente, are still going for the, for the new year. Um, this year, for 2021, there's a new insurance company, United Healthcare, um, giving many Marylanders another option to enroll in coverage. Um, people who are eligible for Medicaid, they can enroll all year round. And um, this is something good to know that um, the plans that are um, available through the marketplace, mm -hmm. um, they cover and they include important benefits like COVID-19 testing and treatment, it's um, covered, and mental health care coverage and doctor's visits and um, many more. That's good to know. When and how can like people enroll and are there um, help available to kind of help folks navigate through the sign up process, um, um, especially for those whose first language is not English? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. So um, people can enroll. Um, there's many ways that they can do so. Um, they can visit the MarylandHealthConnection.gov uh, website, which is um, where they will um, create the account and um, start the application process if they are not currently enrolled. Um, they can also download the mobile app, which is um, Enrolled MHC, which is available for Android and um, um, Apple. And um, they can also call, um, depending on the county, um, there's different phone numbers. I work with Montgomery County, so I will provide you with the Montgomery County phone number. So we have um, certified navigators, which are the um, the experts that will help consumers um, um, navigate the application process. It'll be all over the phone. Um, Currently, all the county offices are still closed due to the pandemic. So um, individuals can call the county line, which is 240-777-1815, uh, and they will be transferred to one of the navigators, which the navigator can help them enroll in coverage, renew their coverage for the new year, and it'll be all um, over the phone. They won't have to go to any any of the facilities um, or they can also assist them if they want to um, see options online, how to navigate the website, etc. Okay, and I will run the number on the screen for folks as well. Um, open enrollment is for health insurance coverage starting next year in um, 2021. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of options do you have for those who need health insurance right away? 
So right now, um, as we continue to face the public health crisis um, and fight COVID-19, it has never been more important for Marylanders to have health coverage. So uh, Maryland Health Connection opened a special enrollment period for uninsured Marylanders. So if you have lost coverage through your employer or your income has decreased, you may be able to get coverage today. The coronavirus um, special enrollment period is open through December 15. Um, this is good to, um, to know that as of today, um, November 18th, anybody that enrolls in coverage from November 15th through um, December, I'm sorry, this is a little confusing. So from November 1st through the November 15th, your coverage will be effective um, the beginning of November, so November 1st. From November 15th, um, through December 15, your coverage will be effective on December 1st. So if you don't, if you need coverage next month on December, um, people can enroll using that um, special enrollment period for um, COVID-19. Okay. Um, and you, you mentioned at the beginning that um, the premiums have dropped this year. Mm -hmm. um, what, how affordable are these plans and what type of financial help is available, especially to people that have lost their jobs or going through mm -hmm. financial issues? Right. So um, the um, Maryland Health Connection Program, it bases the financial assistance that individuals received on the income um, usually for the private health insurance is based on yearly income. So a lot of individuals that um, probably received unemployment or um, the federal extension, um, some of these um, assistance that were received from, from the government, they may be counted for the yearly income, but say for example, an individual that is currently receiving only unemployment, um, they, they may still qualify for um, Medicaid, also depending on their immigration status. But if their only income at the moment is um, unemployment, because, um, well, they lost, due to everything that's happening, they lost their job, um, they may be eligible for the free health insurance. For those individuals who do not qualify for Medicaid because of immigration status, the um, income, the financial system will be based on the yearly income. And um, it's a little confusing. Um, and obviously there is more information on the, on the website, but yes, it's basically depending on your yearly income and the household size. So the more people, so say for example, a family of five will receive more financial assistance than a family of two with the same income. Right, okay. Um, and as to like it pertains to those that um, have like pending immigration statuses, um, do they qualify for this program? Um, or like, what's the process for that? So um, individuals to enroll through Maryland Health Connection, they need to have a valid immigration status. Um, people with employment authorizations, people with um, green cards, um, visas. There are some visas um, for um, for children and for pregnant women, the visa, if they have a visa or they have uh, employment authorization or a green card, they can still qualify for Medicaid. Um, but adults and um, just regular folks that have uh, different immigration status, they will qualify for, um, for coverage through Maryland Health Connection. Um, those individuals that don't have an immigration status they can still apply for the county programs um, or the county clinics, I should say. Um, the, they do have, I'm not sure um, if other counties offer these services, but I know that Montgomery County has the, the county clinics, which individuals that currently don't have an immigration status can apply for, for those services so they can seek medical services. Okay. Um, and what do you need, like what sorts of documents would you need in order to apply? So um, to enroll in, in coverage, um, you will need a photo ID. Um, sometimes once the social security number for those that are um, seeking coverage, we will need the, either the social security number or the IT number. 
Sometimes the system will be able to verify the people, the person and identity just by the social. Sometimes the system may ask for um, specific questions like um, personally, personally identifiable questions just to confirm their identity. Um, immigration status, so like I said, if they have a green card or if they have a uh, employment authorization or if they have their um, their foreign passport with a visa um, we will need that information as well um, for individuals that are still working um, if they receive at the end of the year a w-2 they will need to present their most recent pay stubs just to verify their income um, individuals can also um, present their tax records usually the previous year. So for example, individuals are um, enrolling coverage right now can utilize the 2019 taxes. More than likely, those um, the, the tax records are utilized for individuals that are self-employed. So they don't receive a W-2, they receive a 1099. So that will be the way that they can prove their income. Individuals that receive W-2s, they will have to provide um, pay stubs. And if they're currently enrolled or they have coverage through their employer or whatever the case may be, they can also provide um, the policy numbers and other insurance information. Okay, perfect. Um, I understand it's enrollment season and you're incredibly busy, so I won't hold you too long. But if you can like a... remind us one more, t one last time when the deadline is and um, where folks should go to get more information or should when if they want to reach out. Right. So, uh, like I said, right now, open enrollment is running. It started on November 1st, and it's going to run through December 15th. This is um, for consumers that want to enroll in coverage beginning um, effective January 1st, or for those who want to renew their coverage for the following year. We also have availability for those who want to enroll in coverage um, effective December 1st. They can utilize the um, the COVID-19 special enrollment period. Now, the special enrollment period for COVID-19 is for those that want to enroll in coverage effective December, so they can still get coverage beginning um, next month. Um, it is not an opportunity for those that are currently enrolled to change plans. So the ones that, if they want to, the individuals that are currently enrolled, if they want to um, plan shop, it'll be effective the following year. So again, they can call the Maryland Health Connection hotline, which the number is um, 1-855, wait, I think I have it here. Give me one second. 1-855-642-8572 uh, or individuals within Montgomery County or any individuals, honestly, if, if uh, we um, help individuals throughout the state um, here in Montgomery County. The number is 240-777-1815. They can also visit the website, marylandhealthconnection.gov, or they can also download the mobile app, Enroll MHC. Okay. Well, Mr. Lopez, um, thank you again for sharing all these valuable points. Um, there's a lot to learn from this, so I really appreciate you taking um, time out of your busy day for me. Awesome. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. They gave me Vicodin after my knee surgery. They kept prescribing it, so I kept taking it. I didn't know it would be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. <laughs> Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth.
Welcome to Animals Matter. I'm Susan Kennedy, and I'm here with Jackie, who is a service dog in training through Warrior Canine Connection, a nonprofit here in Montgomery County that raises service dogs for veterans. And speaking of service dogs, here in Montgomery County, in our library system, we have a program where four-legged friends like Jackie give young people confidence in their reading skills. We will be holding our Read to a Dog program at 4.30 in the program room. Meet Monty and Ace, two tail-wagging tutors who spend their Wednesday afternoons at the Gaithersburg Library. They are part of the Read to a Dog program where young readers come and share a book of their choice to these four-legged friends. We encourage children, uh, mostly kindergarten through uh, second grade, especially for our dogs, um, to come and really just practice their, their reading skills um, in a non-threatening environment. Um, it gives them a chance to not feel intimidated, um, to give them a chance they may not have to read to a dog, um, and just, just to kind of give them a fun experience. Monty and Ace are both retired service dogs. Monty was the companion of Madeline Berry's son, Mark, who passed away last year. After that, Monty, since he had, they have been together for five years, he really was used to being out and being with people. And he was going, and actually he was going through the grieving process as well. And so I just happened to be up at the library. I saw the sign that said, you know, read to a dog. And I was like, oh, this is great. So I stopped by the librarian and said, you know, hey, this is a retired service dog. I'd really like to be a part of the program. And so they said, absolutely. Ace was a guide dog. When he retired, he went back to live with his puppy raiser, Terry Binder. She started volunteering with Reed to a dog because she says he needed a job. She tells us the program not only instills confidence in the young readers, but it also puts some children's fears to rest. The other thing I have found that I wasn't expecting is the kids who are afraid of dogs. These are perfect dogs for them because they're so calm. And so we are doing sort of double duty. We're doing not only the reading part, but we're um, here for kids to learn a little bit about dogs, dogs that are yeah. that are nice, good dogs for them to, to, mm -hmm. to meet. And so we, we uh, get to do both things, I think. There was a bit of a wait to read to Monty and Ace and each and every one of the bookworms had a story about a dog to share with their captive audience. Go Dog Go. That was so smart. Why did you pick Go Dog Go? Because I like that book. Go Dogs Go. Delightful. Why do you like reading to dogs? It's so wonderful. Why did you choose Perfectly Martha? Because it's about dogs and reading to a dog is basically reading about dogs to a dog. Dogs aren't really listening, but they're interested. How long have you been reading? Mm, since I was three. Oh, goodness. And how old are you now? Seven. So you came to read to the dogs. That made your day really special, didn't it? Definitely. I, I never get to read to my dog. She wouldn't lay like this. No. And just let you read her a book. So Unless she was really tired, so. Yeah. Well, maybe From can... digging up and making hole next to hole next to hole next to hole <laughs> after each hole. <laughs> the Read to a Dog program has a number of benefits, including improving a child's self-esteem and even reducing anxiety or stress. Monty and Ace benefit, too, with plenty of love and affection. We've had kids that um, are either, you know, shy or, you know, they may not have been as motivated to read. Um, and this has been a great opportunity. We've had several parents that have told us that, you know, it's, it's given their kid a new experience to, you know, open up and be more willing to read, to become a reader. So, yes, we have. It's very exciting to hear those kinds of things. Dogs can teach us about what matters most. And the unconditional acceptance is just what these children need in their journey to become better readers for many years to come. That was a good story. Just off Big Woods Road in Dickerson, you'll find a farm that's nestled in the agricultural reserve that's like no other. Madison Fields simply takes your breath away. The 400 acre farm functions primarily as an equestrian facility. But what makes Madison Fields so unique? Yeah. It's a lot of work. Yeah, I've done before. Is it provides therapeutic and vocational training opportunities. I've been on a couple of horses before. For children and adults with physical and intellectual disabilities. This 
farm is for everybody. It serves the community at large. It serves people with special needs and with on with differing abilities, and um, it serves veterans as well. It's it's intended to be inclusive and. We're making this place something special, that's for sure. Ava is a participant in the Madison Fields Therapeutic Riding Program. Is he like your buddy? He's my buddy and my child, oh. so I love him. <laughs> She's been coming to the farm for more than a year, and in that time has formed a special bond with Dakota, a horse she refers to as her baby. So, so what are you doing now? I'm giving him with the curry. One, two, three. Ava comes for riding lessons twice a week at Madison Fields. Good eyes up, look where you're going so that way he can follow your movement. She learns basic horsemanship skills under the guidance of Maggie. Little more walk, sit down. Her certified sit. riding instructor. Down, yeah, good, follow his shoulder, up. Down. So we were working on processing steps. Ava came up with her own course that she wanted to ride today. In your drawing you gave me, it was a three-step course, so she had to remember all three steps, and we turned it into a barrel pattern, and she was able to complete it twice. Good. All right, walk on. More walk. Good job. Through the riding program at Madison Fields. We'll give him a pat, tell him he's a good horse. All right, you want to go outside for a walk? Yeah. The horses improve the well-being of people of all ages with different needs. Way to go, Casey. All right, including go those with oh, autism, learning disabilities, and traumatic brain injury. Good. Good. Okay, in this year's budget... Back. Here you go, let's put it back in the tack room. The county council approved grant funding for Madison Fields. Good job. Yeah. The funds were used to start a new vocational program that provides structured opportunities for these adults with the goal of learning employable skills for jobs in agriculture. Councilmember Craig Rice is a big supporter of Madison Fields. The reason why the majority of these folks didn't have jobs before is because the expectation was that they couldn't do it exactly. Right? Exactly. And so redefining that for people to make sure that they understand that exactly. that couldn't be farther from the truth. Because they can do, they can do a lot of the same exactly. stuff that we do want to educate the county and the students and the elementary kids about the agricultural reserve because it is such an amazing place an amazing part of this county that in my opinion more people need to know about sometimes it's good to drive up here on these rustic roads and drive up in these near where these farms are and just get some fresh air good job was that fun yeah Good. And that agricultural reserve component is something that Craig Rice says makes this program so meaningful. People always assume is that they're just farms and they're commodity farmers that are here. But there's so many other people who are doing so many other different dynamics that still live up to the commitment to support and sustain agriculture, to make sure that our environment is thriving, but on top of that have an overall social mission that's also there as well. And for Ava, her time spent at Madison Fields is something that definitely makes her shine. And you do a really good job with them. It must make you feel proud. I am proud of myself. I'm proud of Dakota. When we heard the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department had added a canine to its unit, well, we knew we had to meet this four-legged friend who was bringing smiles to folks who were visiting the courthouse. Meet Lacey, the newest recruit in the Montgomery County Sheriff Department. This four-year-old Labrador retriever won't be fighting crime. She's tasked with an important job as the department's first therapy dog to bring comfort and a smile to someone who might be having a bad day. Because so many people that come in this building are in crisis, there's, it's, it's very difficult, you know, a lot of times people come in, they're victims of crimes, uh, they could be the actual defendants in crimes, a lot of children come in this building, uh, and, and we just felt there was so, so much of a need that the, the comfort dog, the facility dog, could really make a difference. Christine Vega is Lacey's handler. They've been a team now for about six months. At one time, she thought about being a canine officer, but it wouldn't have worked with her lifestyle. 
However, when the opportunity to work with a therapy dog came to her attention, she knew she needed to take action. So when you found out that you'd been chosen mm -hmm. to be her handler and you met her, tell me how that how that went down. So it was fabulous. It was the day before Thanksgiving, so Thanksgiving Eve, and I got the, the news that I had been selected. And Sergeant Stanton said, well, you can wait until the weekend or Monday to come meet Lacey and pick her up. And I said, well, let's go get her tonight. And so literally, this is the first night of... Oh, oh, of, that's how look at that's, Lacey, uh, Lacey just wanted the love. And I fell in love with her. She came up and was right in my arms, her head on my shoulder. And it was like we had been together forever. And that's the picture she sent, she sent me. Sergeant Stanton is Joe Stanton. I can release the dog to come to me to help. He is the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office K-9 Unit Supervisor. Come. He said when Sheriff Popkin entrusted him with finding the right dog for the job, he had to step outside of his comfort zone. It was something new for the sheriff's office uh, and for a trainer, from my perspective as a police dog trainer, it was something different for me. So I had to go out and look for kind of a different type of dog uh, that I'm used to searching for. Patrol dogs are generally really, really high energy dogs and I needed a dog that was going to be calm in pretty much any scenario that she could re exactly like this. <laughs> like this? Yes. She's friendly. This is Lacey. Lacey yeah. was donated to the Sheriff's Department to provide unconditional nice. love and affection to victims oh, yeah. and their so family members who come to the courthouse on a daily basis. This gentle-faced canine responds to visitors with genuine acceptance. So, like a therapy dog. So that's what she's here for, just for everybody to pet and say hi to. You guys have a good day. And for those who meet Lacey, it's hard to deny the comfort, the warm welcome and kisses she delivers during stressful times. Sergeant Vega could literally be busy all day long providing that sort of comfort level with Lacey on a daily basis because there really is that demand and that need. And we have a, we have a, uh, one thing that we did here in Circuit Court was opened up what we call Kid Spot and it's a, it's a actual daycare center that so the children don't have to go into court and witness some of the awful things that are going on potentially with family. And those kids get to be exposed also to the comfort dog on a daily basis as well. So we've had several incidents where she has intervened with a child. Um, one was right when we first got her. There was a panic alarm coming from our family division. Um, two parents were going through a custody dispute and they had their 12-year-old daughter with them. And I responded to the alarm and I saw the little girl there and she was crying and upset. And we moved her over into kid spot and she got to interact with Lacey and it was like she had forgotten everything she had witnessed between her parents. The simplicity of the human-dog bond is what makes this canine connection so powerful. It's a kinship that has also made an impact on staff at the courthouse. With the people coming through the courthouse, it doesn't matter which side of the law you're on. Um, they light up when they see Lacey, and they come over and they want to pet her. And then they ask questions, and they want to know what she's used for, and um, they interact with her. So it's a positive experience for the public. It's what pretty much goes on when Lacey is here in the lobby. Um, with our office, it is interesting to see grown men, deputy sheriffs, um, interact with Lacey because they become a different person. <laughs> they get excited, they're like, where's Lacey, and come over and love on her. So it's just a great thing all around. And in the courthouse, the employees will stop me and say, where's Lacey, can you come to our floor, can you come to my office? I went on vacation for a week and a half, and I, that's all they asked about was Lacey. Where is she and when can she come back? The requests that we're starting to get from outside in the actual court facility is uh, becoming quite interesting as well. Uh, the, the, these days, I think people kind of tend to walk around with a certain level of stress because somebody, everybody is so overextended. How are you today? <laughs> She's great. Happy it's Friday. And Lacey and Sergeant Vega just bring an air of magic and it makes a difference in people's lives. Well, that does it for this edition of Animals Matter. If you'd like more information about Warrior Canine Connection, the Read with the Dog program, or Madison Fields, you can visit their websites. For County Cable Montgomery, I'm Susan Kennedy, and on behalf of Jackie, thanks for watching. Or stroller.
during the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up to date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. On the inner loop of the I-495 from Colesville Road, U.S. 29 to University Boulevard, Maryland 193. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should, che should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up to date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. On the inner loop of the I-495 from Colesville Road, U.S. 29 to University Boulevard, Maryland 193. 
on or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check, should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up to date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. On the inner loop of the I-495 from Colesville Road, US 29, to University Boulevard, Maryland 193. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one and a half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check 
should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM, on the U.S. 29 corridor, and on County Cable, Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. On the inner loop of the I-495 from Colesville Road, U.S. 29, to University Boulevard, Maryland 193. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or a stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check, should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and right on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM, on the U.S. 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. 
During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check, should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM, on the U.S. 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from Georgia Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433.
We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. 
Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one and a half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You're listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM, on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. 
For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the final locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland, 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland, 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland, 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin Jean Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM, on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., 
the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and right on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland, 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland, 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland, 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin and John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the NPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, 
remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check, should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor the transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from Georgia Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes to the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or a stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and right on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from Georgia Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. 
Wreckage for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, like in various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM, on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, block in various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. 
During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont and Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check, should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up to date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont and Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and riding on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations.
from the outer loop of the IR-495 from George Avenue, Maryland 97 to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking in various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation and information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. 
Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and right on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from Georgia Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes to the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and right on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM, on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. 
Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, black in various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and riding on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM, on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, black in various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. 
Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check, should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up to date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, black in various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should, che should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up to date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, 
WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that the Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check, should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and riding on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. 
This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check, should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up to date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. 
You're listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights to be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You're listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. 
During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin and John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one and a half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland, 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland, 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland, 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one and a half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check, should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 
We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking in various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one and a half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard 
to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You're listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM, on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from Georgia Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or a stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit 
Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check, should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up to date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. 
on or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation and information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from Georgia Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, black in various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the NPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, 
a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and right on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the final locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland, 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland, 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland, 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin and John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes to the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and right on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. 
from the outer loop of the I-495 from George Avenue, Maryland 97 to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont and Wheaton areas, remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor the transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. 
Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check, should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up to date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. On the outer loop of the I-495 from George Avenue, Maryland 97 to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John access road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM, on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. 
Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and right on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. 
Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You're listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM, on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, black in various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the NMPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check, should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and riding on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up to date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. 
You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes to the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up to date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, 
The MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check, should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 
We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere 
while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor the transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation and information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from Georgia Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, 
please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM, on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, black in various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and right on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor the transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM, on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, black in various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., 
the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You're listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, black in various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride-On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride-On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one-half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, 
remain suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 a.m. on the U.S. 29 corridor and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from Georgia Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires the headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from Georgia Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. 
Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one and a half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus on-demand transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check to check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777-7433. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Traveler's Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM, on the Interstate 270 Corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 Corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. Watch for an accident on the outer loop of the I-495 at Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187, blocking various lanes. On or about Monday, November 23rd, starting at 9 a.m., the National Park Service will close the Cabin John Access Road and ramps to the westbound lanes of the Clara Barton Parkway. This closure is expected to end in the late afternoon and is required to install surface asphalt. Drivers should follow detour signs on MacArthur Boulevard to enter the parkway elsewhere while the ramps and road are closed. During the week of November 30th, the MPS will install surface asphalt at the intersection of the Cabin John Access Road and Erickson Road. We will maintain access to Erickson Road, but drivers should anticipate delays. This work is expected to last only a few hours and will be completed during off-peak hours. Beginning Thursday, March 19th, Ride On will follow a new reduced service plan that maintains coverage of Ride On routes so that residents can access food, essential services, and essential jobs. The new service plan represents about one and a half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders by boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board at the rear door of the bus. Passengers can board through the front doors if a lift is needed to accommodate a disability or stroller. 
During the emergency, all ride-on services will be temporarily free to all passengers. Flexbus On-Demand Transit, a pilot program implemented in 2019 in the Rockville and Glenmont Wheaton areas, remains suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should check, should check the status of their usual buses before leaving for their bus stop. For current and ride-on bus schedule information, please call the Transit Information Center at 240-777. 7433. We will continue to monitor the transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up to date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening to the Montgomery County Transportation Management Center's Travelers Advisory Radio System, WPBJ 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD 1070 AM on the US 29 corridor, and on County Cable Montgomery. Roadways are wet and may be slippery. Please allow more space between vehicles to accommodate longer stopping distances. Remember that Maryland law requires that headlights be on when windshield wipers are on, even during daylight hours. Travel slow on Interstate 495 in the following locations. From the outer loop of the I-495, from George Avenue, Maryland 97, to Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187. I definitely like the exercise. I like walking. For like Evan Taff, walking. walking dogs is a labor uh, of love. Mutually beneficial to be able to have a job where you can be outside and no matter the season, you're getting in some good exercise. He's been paying daily visits to Millie so for 13 Millie. years. And she's got some bad sensitive hips due to her age. So just lift her up a little bit here. This is Jet. And four-year-old Jet since yeah. he was a pup. He's a real looker. Since 2007, Taff has been operating Walks in Love, an independently owned pet sitting business based in Montgomery County. Taff was able to make a good living with this business until March when the coronavirus appeared. Yeah, I mean, it was a seven day uh, a week job um, and five of those days were, were, you know, seven to eight hour days, including, you know, morning and evening visit stuff just because of people's routine with going away. And um, once the pandemic hit, all that stopped, obviously, with the with the quarantine. When the pandemic shut down businesses and put restrictions on others, Walks in Love faced a loss of income that was sudden and unexpected. But thanks to the county's public health emergency grant program, Taff, a lifelong county resident, was able to keep his business afloat. It was a great uh, buffer uh, for my mortgage. Um, and, um, you know, I had to defer that for a couple months and bills and groceries and so, it, uh, it went quick. We live in a great county, and a, and a county very uh, responsible and you know, for their citizens. So I think that was cool for the county to be non-judgmental about it and just help you out. The county's public health emergency grant program awarded close to $21 million to 2,300 county small businesses and nonprofits with grants averaging $8,900. Walks and Love received $5,000. Bethesda resident and client Miles Diller says assisting these businesses is the right thing to do. Well, you know, we're in such a, a crisis in so many ways that this is the one time where you have to dig deep into the government uh, funds to support everything. Otherwise, the ramifications will be far worse in the future. Even with loyal clients like Millie and Jet, Taft still doesn't have enough work to get back to his five-day-a-week schedule with his four-legged friends. But he plans to stick it out and hope for the best. Has not picked up or anything, and certainly with the yeah. question mark about what's it going to be like through the, the fall and the winter and into next year with the, the vaccine question, I think that leaves a lot of people, you know, not sure about what to do about pet sitters. And if they haven't seen them now for so long, probably not feeling incredibly safe. Reporting from Bethesda, I'm Susan Kennedy. 
In March, Montgomery County was awarded $183 million as part of the CARES Act and the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Since then, the council has approved 31 special appropriations to address the needs of residents and businesses impacted by the pandemic. We've had so much that we've needed to do from our small businesses. We, you know, millions of dollars. We needed money for hospitals that they could, that they could and, and, uh, come up with, uh, with different ways for, for them to reconfigure. We've, we've needed money for the hotel industry. We've needed money, money for residential housing and for everything that you can think of, we've needed money for. We've had people that have never needed government before that need government today. We're now going to get a briefing from the coronavirus relief fund. This week, the council and received a briefing on how that money has been used and if any reallocations or additional funds are needed. More than $100 million has been appropriated for COVID-related expenditures. Some of those expenditures include rental assistance and eviction prevention, food assistance and security, assistance to child care providers, grants for small businesses to help keep their doors open, and assistance to arts organizations. An additional $82.2 million is expected to be spent by the end of this year. Council members want to be sure that those residents who need this help are able to get it. The amount of money that has not been spent translates into residents not receiving that assistance. I'm just super disappointed that so many of, of, of these amounts, these special appropriations, these funds that are specifically to address the needs of some of the most vulnerable people in the county, that when I see how little has been spent, I just don't even know what to say. Many of these initiatives still have funding available and are accepting applications. To find out if you are eligible for funding from these programs, visit the county's COVID-19 information portal. Reporting from Rockville, I'm Susan Kennedy. Tucked away on Monroe Place in Rockville is a little cafe that's full of positive energy. Hello. How are you doing? The Soulful Cafe is located just off the main entrance of the newly opened Main Street Apartments. The cafe is a partnership between Dawson's Market and Main Street. So Dawson's has always been uh, a part of the community. Uh, part of our mission statement is to, to employ 10% of our staff uh, and what we call a difficult to hire category, people that um, tend to have difficulty finding positions because of a disability, something like that. You know, just really right away felt that it was a great marriage between the two different missions and the two companies. The opening of the Main Street Cafe is not only about inclusion, but it also offers great taste. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. Jillian Copeland is the founder of Main Street. She says the Soulful Cafe gives everyone the opportunity to nourish their mind, body, and soul. I got a crumb wrap and I got a double chocolate chip muffin. Our mission of creating a space for belonging, this is perfectly aligned, right? So bright spaces, um, air, the food and drink, really acai bowls and smoothies and coffee. Uh, uh, a small cappuccino. Soon, so we hope pedestrians will walk by. And we hope people will come and grab a cup of coffee and just, you know, say hello and be a neighbor and be a part of our community. And connecting with the community is what Main Street is all about. The cafe serves as a gathering place for county residents looking to support local food. What are you getting? A mean green foodie. An almond brother. And residents and staff of Main Street use the cafe as home base and time to check in and find out how things are going. So I think it gives them kind of like a feeling of community as well as a space that they can hang out and enjoy and kind of kick back, relax and, you know, eat a muffin, have a coffee and, you know, just enjoy the day. Council President Sidney Katz says the Soulful Cafe is not only changing lives, but it's shaping the future. And Montgomery County has such, is so fortunate, truly is blessed that we have every opportunity to meet people from every background in, in, every, in every sort of way. And that's what this is all about. We're all, you know, I always say that a community is like a family. And it is. And, we, and in our family, we have various personalities and people who have various uh, abilities and, 
and, and are good in one thing and not so great in another. It, it's really just a, a wonderful, wonderful feel. It's a place where people want to come and join. They don't want to be here because they're helping someone with a disability. They want to be here because they're stimulated and they're engaged and they're connected and they walk away and their life is richer because they filled their cup and they filled their soul. You can visit the Soulful Cafe at 50 Monroe Place in Rockville. The cafe is open every day except Sunday and Monday at 7 a.m. Reporting from Rockville, I'm Susan Kennedy. Desks by Dads is a nonprofit organization that was started by a mom. So Desks by Dads is actually a brainchild of my wife, Jessica. In August, Jess Burales partnered with PTA moms who were working on a virtual learning project. It was sort of in the mindset of thinking of, you know, about what do kids need to be ready to learn? And it just sort of occurred to me, well, what about desks? And Jess's honeydew weekend project for her husband, Al, was for him to build a desk. He said, sure. He watched a couple of YouTube videos and picked up some materials from Lowe's over the weekend and put a desk to together in about an hour. Just sort of took off from there. Took off it did. After posting pictures on Facebook, dads all over the county volunteered to help. Um, great to see how other people kind of take my idea and kind of ran with it and made it their own. That's really fun to see. We've had so many volunteers uh, improve on the design, you know, add their own spin on it. Uh, to be honest with you, each desk that we've received is a little nicer than the last one. So this is Mary Kate. And Women are also invited to this men's club. On this day, Mary-Kate Ryan delivered the desks that Dallas made. Kate painted the desk. The desks are, I mean, they're fantastic. I love the colors. And her boyfriend, Mike. He, he's the muscle. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I, all I did was load him. At the first stop, Santiago and his mom, Anna, met the truck, and Santiago got to pick his desk. I'll take this one. Which one, this one here? He was working on the table inside for where we eat. Now I could, I don't have to sit at the table and do my work. I could have my own little space right there. Councilmember Hans Reamer met the group at the next stop. How was it with the last family? It's fantastic. We bought two small desks for our two kids because mm -hmm. yep. creating a defined workspace, it's good for the parents, it's good for the kids. It's, they weren't cheap. Yep. Not everybody has 100, 200 bucks laying around. Generalmente tarda como una semana, pero es rápido y dan cuatro mil dólares. I'm also trying to share information resources about county resources that are available, like the COVID rent assistance program. Okay, gracias. He's gonna go call his brother. <laughs> so far, more than 120 desks have been built and distributed. This mom um, has some um, COVID symptoms, so we're not gonna have any contact. Each desk comes with a chair and a lamp. We're thrilled that we can help in a small way. We have no illusions that this is making a dent in all of the equity challenges that we face as a community. But it's making a real difference for the families that you serve, and that's yeah. what counts. Cheese! They, they really feel proud when they have their own space and they get to set it up and decorate it. It's really nice. If you would like to get involved with Desk by Dads, check their Facebook page for details. It may not be something that most people think about, but the end of daylight saving time can mean a rise in the number of pedestrian accidents. The time change happens this year on November 1st, and Montgomery County Police want pedestrians and drivers to be aware. We realize that uh, we're in a time of the season uh, where we do see a rise in pedestrian collisions. So we, we try to combat that with education, enforcement, um, and we try to go proactive with things like this. Last year in Montgomery County, there were close to 500 pedestrian crashes. 14 of those were fatal. Statistics show that pedestrians walking around dusk are nearly three times more likely to be struck by cars in the days following the end of daylight saving time. Everybody has a role in traffic safety, pedestrians, bicyclists, and vehicles. As far as pedestrians are concerned, um, some easy steps are wear things that might be more visible when it gets darker out. Um, even to the extremes of wearing a vest, it, that could help. And I get that those are tough things to sometimes do for going to work and things like that, but um, trying to remain as visible as possible is one thing. Two, use sidewalks uh, when they're available and, and walk there 
and not in the roadway. And when you do have to cross the roadway, try to get to a lighted intersection or a marked crosswalk. And third, avoid distracted walking. Councilmember Evan Glass says with the time change that is happening, everybody needs to be aware of their surroundings. If you are a pedestrian, you know, maybe take the earbuds out, look around and just be aware of when you're crossing the street. I always try to make eye contact with the driver so that I know that we see each other. And let's see what we got here. We have one car stopped and another's going to keep going. You need courage to be able to do this. And it is so important because uh, we can't presume that drivers are seeing everybody who's on, on the street. Um, it's unfortunate to say, but that's just a reality. The county and state have invested in improving intersections with the installation of Hawk beacon signals and rapid flashing beacons. McBain says that folks should be aware that police will be out on the roads enforcing traffic laws to keep our streets safe. We do do enforcement for not only the pedestrian moves, but also um, more often we try to address um, enforcement with the drivers. And so we, like the intersection we are here at Turkey Branch Parkway, we go out and we start monitoring whether vehicles are stopping at these rapid flashing beacons um, and also if they're uh, stopping at, um, at the hawk signals. Um, and so uh, in, in addition, sometimes we have officers posing as pedestrians and actually going out into the roadway. And when we see a violation, we uh, make the stop and cite it. So even though you're getting an extra hour of sleep, Councilmember Glass says to remember those extra Z's come with accountability. There is an extra responsibility, clearly, that pedestrians have to take. Um, but for drivers as well, please take your eyes away from your phone, away from your radio. Um, focus on the road and make sure that when you're in a heavily pedestrian area or anywhere, quite frankly, uh, that you are keeping your eye on the road and looking out for pedestrians. Reporting from Rockville, I'm Susan Kennedy. Yeah. The ribbon has been cut at a new affordable housing complex in Silver Spring for residents who are 62 and older. Willow Manor at Fairland is a $24 million, 121-unit apartment building located in the east part of the county that Council Vice President Tom Hucker says fills a critical need. Um, I'm excited about this for a few reasons. One is we have a, this is great for the county. We have a housing crisis in our whole region, in Montgomery County in particular, both in affordability and availability. And right here is our community space. And this is part of the solution right here. We need housing of all types. We particularly need affordable housing. We need senior housing. And we need affordable senior housing. In Montgomery County, 16% of our population is 65 and over. And many of them are looking to downsize and to leave their single family homes and, uh, and move into a place just like this. They deserve to have affordable housing options here in the county. They shouldn't have to move out of state or out of the county to find them. Willow Manor at Fairland will be a wonderful home for so many older adults who we want to keep right here in Montgomery County contributing to the county. Um, they've been taxpayers and residents for a long time. They deserve to stay here, and we want to keep them and their talents here close to their families and their loved ones. The coronavirus pandemic has revealed many inequities, one of those being in the area of mental health. School closures have affected all students, but for many of those young people, school is the main provider of mental health services. The council approved more than $860,000 to address the growing need for these services at elementary schools with high concentrations of poverty. Everybody's been working on this in their own space pre-COVID to say, hey, we need to do this, which is why we put forth special appropriations to do this and why it's so important to do now because it's gotten worse. The services to be supported by the appropriation are targeted at schools that have 80% or more of students who are eligible for free and reduced price meals. ESOL services at those schools averages at 56%. The funding will provide three school community health nurses and additional contractual support for mental health services. The time has arrived for us to then have a strategy that is completely strategic in terms of how do we grow that pipeline, but also how do we have uh, how do we take advantage of innovative um, models 
that um, that can, you know, have folks that could be maybe assistants or that can provide that intermediary support while we're growing uh, licensed uh, mental health practitioners that reflect our student population. What was once a gallery for local art is now a hub for food and supplies for up county residents who are in need of assistance due to the COVID-19 pandemic. At the Black Rock Center for the Arts, bags of food and supplies are being packed and delivered every day. I have signed an executive order which institutes a stay-at-home directive. Immediately after Governor Hogan initiated the stay-at-home order, the folks at BlackRock got on board with the idea of using their venue as home base for food and supply distribution for the needy. We started getting calls from families that had COVID. It all started with a call from street outreach workers in the Up County. They had a large donation of produce. Could they use the space to divide the produce for delivery to a local community? And within days, the hub concept was developed. This week alone, over 700 families. In, in these COVID kits, you have everything from the thermometers, the tissues, Grace Rivera Oven is leading the effort at what now is known as the Up County Consolidation Hub to help those vulnerable families get the supplies they so desperately need during this crisis. When COVID hit um, early in March, I kind of saw like a tsunami coming of need. And um, it was just very, it, it, it was a desperation kind of feeling because I knew things were going to get bad. and. Uh, especially with the minority community, the Latino community more specific, they, um, they are your essential workers. They're in the front lines. BlackRock has partnered with the Blair Foundation, the Latino Health Initiative, Nourish Now, the Healthcare Initiative Foundation, and other county partners to provide wide-reaching access for the families impacted by the epidemic. You know, it had been all along, everybody pulling it together. And, and it's really been through this partnership. So there's examples of when, you know, I've called Jackie at Mana and said, hey, I think we might be 50 boxes short. And so can we get some stay at home packs? And she's, they've been right there. Partnerships that are growing with the farmers, Red Wigla Farm, Madison House, and their farm project um, that are just, um, just growing um, exponentially. And, but the amazing thing is so are the number of families. And so that reality of taking this uh, idea of a regional hub and then actually making it the spoke <laughs> to where it's actually now sending out to all of the areas that need it is just a tremendous uh, sort of really response to the need that we're seeing in our communities. Yeah, so we then we bring it over here. The team has been diligent in bringing food, hygiene products, and diapers, a big need, to a mobile home park in the Up County where many immigrants live. There are no barriers in receiving this assistance. You need diapers, I'm not gonna make you like sign the Declaration of Independence for you to get diapers, like you will get diapers. You need wipes, you will get wipes. It's very culturally appropriate, especially because the largest population was serving the uh, Latino families. Which you have the maseca. Which is well, we need to have the maseca, which is the stuff you make tortillas with, and you need the rice and you need the beans. <laughs> <laughs> I know a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some comfort food, you know, to just, you know, when you're sick, you want to have comfort food. There's a steady group of more than 100 volunteers, which includes some local high school and college students who help deliver the food every day. Not doing a lot with my time. I'm a college student. I'm taking some online classes for the summer, but otherwise I've just been at home. Um, so it's a good way to feel like I'm helpful uh, doing something for the community. And um, it's a nice thing to do with my time. I also just got my license in last October, so it's a good way to get some driving practice in. You get a, a little bit emotional, you know, because there are, there are people that, you know, come two days in a row. Mango juice? You want water? Yeah. I do this every single day, and sometimes people learn about my next distribution, and I saw them yesterday, you know, and it's, you know, and for those people, you know, they, they really need the assistance, you know. 
They're, you know, and you can, I can see it in their eyes. Yeah, so that's an example of somebody walking up with the homeless people. We don't turn them away because they don't really have anywhere to go. The local business community has also stepped in with transportation assistance and the donation of space to store cold food. You know, this facility wasn't built to, to be a distribution center. So how do you handle once you get a, a large donation of chicken or a large donation of milk, right? So we had to partner with industries that maybe were underutilizing their freezer space at the moment based on demand to, to do that. But it's also been community members, you know, dropping off on the donation boxes, uh, seeing us as we're loading the vehicles and, you know, coming out and giving us $20 and saying, I heard you need diapers, go buy diapers. But probably one of the most amazing stories to tell is that of those who have been receiving help from the hub and who are now giving back themselves, including the very first family that was assisted. She now every Monday, I'm getting, I'm getting emotional. She comes back and she gets us diapers and she wipes every week. every week, every week she comes. She's like, I had no idea who to call, and if it wasn't for you guys, I really would have been really lost. And she goes, and I would have bent her. I would have gone outside. I would have gone to the store sick. I would have gone and got the formula because we needed that for my family. It's one thing to provide performances and the education, and, and we, we celebrate that. And creating this collaboration, creating the partnership, is allowing people to do something. And she is off to Gaithersburg to deliver to two families at a time when they feel helpless. Grace Rivera Oven says she has never been shy of a challenge and that growing up in this community has prepared her for this moment to deliver this effort. I have a roof on top of my head. I have a wonderful family. Nobody is sick. I'm able to go home to a safe place. But not everybody's as lucky in our community. So this is about, you know, all of us kind of coming together and, and just acknowledging our neighbors and saying you're not alone. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You're welcome. It's like a labor of love. It's like the hub is, is like pure of love. Reporting from Germantown, I'm Susan Kennedy. I think a lot of us are probably comfortable with ordering groceries online. It's kind of a new thing that if you're really tech savvy, you know all about but probably most people don't. And certainly I'm hearing that a lot of folks, it's, this is a, a concept that they aren't aware of. First of all, I think everyone should reach out to you know, parents, grandparents, neighbors. This is a, a critical issue. How do you get food? You need to remain in essentially shelter in place. You know, if you're, if you're over 60, you've got to be so careful right now. Uh, and if you have a health condition, you have to be even more careful. So whether it's family members that are actually shopping for you and bringing you your food, or if you don't have that ability, uh, you're ordering online. It's not actually that difficult to order online. And I think we as, as a community need to take some action to ensure that everyone knows how to do it. One of the really awesome things about Everyone could use a little fairy dust in their life. Looking for positive things to come out of COVID. And it's extra special when it's in the form of craft beer. Rockville lawyer Josh Beanstock and his wife Jen call themselves the beer fairies. Ready, run, 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 run. The plan is to ring and run so the fairies can stay anonymous. It first started when they decided to spread joy to friends during the pandemic by delivering craft beer. Then the idea expanded to first responders and frontline workers who have gone above and beyond the call of duty during the COVID-19 pandemic. What about all of these people who haven't had the choice to quarantine like we have? Let's get in touch with breweries throughout the state and see if we can't partner, get beer donated from them and you know, thank these people. They then realized they could help the local breweries by asking for donations for the beer, which has resulted in several thousand dollars in funds to drop some happiness at the doors of local heroes. One of the greatest joys I had was making a drop to somebody who works in the dairy department of a local giant and has showed up. And it just so happens that that person was working in the dairy department at Giant when I was a kid and was always friendly, but I have noticed that he has always showed up. 
The drops include a letter of thanks and four county brewed beverages. We headed with Josh to meet up with Council Member Andrew Friedson first in Bethesda. I said, all right, let's go spread some gratitude, crafting gratitude here. <laughs> let's do it. To the home of Alexis, a volunteer member of the Bethesda Chevy Chase Rescue Squad. Are you Alexis? No, Nancy. Nancy. Is Alexis around? She is not. She's not. We are from the beer fairies, and we are here thanking her for everything she has done for the squad during the pandemic. And he and his wife and their family started an effort where they just drop off a four pack of beer at local first responders just to thank them for all their service during the pandemic. And these are local breweries, all of them Montgomery County breweries. And really? so we get to put a little money into some businesses, pockets, keep their lights on and say thank you. We get to say thank you to people who don't get thanked enough. That's so nice of you. She loves to work at the squad. She loves her. She loves the team she works with. Since the effort started, the fairies have dropped more than 300 of the bubbly gifts. Their goal is 1,500. Have a good one. Thank you, guys. We moved on to Chevy Chase to play Ding Dong Ditch. Knock and then leave. Knock and then run. The home of two young rescue squad volunteers. who were visibly excited when they discovered what was at their door. This was unexpected. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's reactions like that that make That's awesome. all of this worth it. Those small tokens of appreciation that are important during these trying times and the work of the beer fairies is bringing joy door to door. We love helping you guys out <laughs> and uh, we appreciate everything you guys do for us yeah. as well. Uh, thank you guys, uh, you all were nominated by somebody. So we love what we do. You know, we love helping our community. It's one of the reasons why we do what we do. Uh, even if it isn't our full-time job, it's just something that we like to do yeah. to give back in these trying times. Those are all local beers, so you can... It's a community <laughs> effort supporting community craft breweries and providing a, a thank you to, to you for all the service that you've provided uh, us in these tough times. So. Gonna have to break into it. Thank you. Good. <laughs> yeah, Good. Thank you. Enjoy. Uh, every <laughs> night's a perfect night for local right. beer, but tonight is a particularly perfect uh, yeah, night. Most definitely. In a time like this where we're socially distanced, these community building efforts are so important just to make sure that we all feel like we're part of something bigger and it's easy to feel isolated. It's easy to feel alone. And this is one additional gesture to show that we are part of a community and that our community looks after one another, our community appreciates each other, uh, and that we're gonna make sure that we take care of the people who take care of us. And for Josh Beanstalk, not only does this effort give him the opportunity to brighten someone's day, but it's also become a lesson for his family, especially his young daughter, that he hopes will stick. The look on somebody's face when they deserve a thank you and they finally get it. Things that will come out of the pandemic. I hope that my daughter at three years old comes out of the pandemic with an appreciation for saying thank you. Run, 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 run. If you'd like to nominate someone for a drop from the Beer Fairies or you'd like to make a donation, visit their website. Reporting from Bethesda, I'm Susan Kennedy. McGee, uh, Packers coach Vince Lombardi. Shabby. Fred Bowen loves to tell stories. McGee looked around for his helmet. He had left it in the Packers locker room. Another reserve wide receiver handing McGee a helmet. With no sleep and the wrong helmet, McGee hustled onto the field and played the game of his life. Bowen writes the Kids Post column for the Washington Post, but he is also the author of 25 books about sports for kids. And he writes those books with a distinct purpose in mind. I see sports history as being a wonderful way for kids to be introduced to history. That whole idea of, oh, wait a second, you mean things weren't as I see them now? And I always say to kids, I say, who, you know, I'll be in a school and I'll say, who likes fantasy? Oh, I like fantasy. You know, because, oh, it's a whole different world. He says, well, I like history because history tells you about 
a world that is very different than ours, but it really happened and this is the real payoff. Bowen has just released his newest book, Gridiron, a look back at the last 100 years of history of the National Football League. He decided to write the book after being approached by renowned artist James Ransom. They talked, exchanged emails, and went to work. Like I remember I showed him some of the first chapters and he said, hey, this is good, this is a good start. But he said, tell more stories. So he got the ball rolling and did just that. The book covers 20 chapters of the history of the NFL, which started in an automobile showroom in Canton, Ohio. And one of the great stories in the book is that how much did it cost to get into the league? $100. George Hallis, who later became the owner and coach of the Chicago Bears, was at the meeting and he said, oh, nobody paid the money. He said, I doubt there was $100 in the room. I believe the last NFL team that was sold was the Carolina Panthers and I think it was for two and a half billion dollars. And as I say to the kids, that's a lot of hundred dollar bills. The book also includes history of some of the greatest games played in the NFL, including a game that will go down as the coldest in history, the Ice Bowl, the 1967 championship game between the Cowboys and the Packers in Green Bay. Minus 13 degrees outside and the wind chill was a minus 46. Here is a list of the clothing one fan, Bob Kaminsky, wore to the game. Long johns, flannel pajamas, work overalls, a t-shirt, flannel shirt, insulated sweatshirt, and heavy parka. On his head, a face mask with holes for the mouth and eyes and a wool hat. Then. Kaminsky climbed into a sleeping bag and sat with foam rubber at his feet and on his seat. Even while doing research for the book, Bowen learned some bits of history that surprised even him, like the 1932 championship game between the Chicago Bears and the Portsmouth Spartans that was to be played in Chicago. A blizzard forced the game to the ice rink where the Chicago Blackhawks played, which had just hosted a circus. And so they had you know, uh, what it appeared to be grass, almost like straw and stuff. And also some of the droppings that the animals had left. But the game was a hit. They had something close to like 10,000 people were there, which it kind of smelled in the arena. So when you write for kids, that's like, this is the perfect story. It's got everything. One thing he wanted to make sure he conveyed in the book was that football wasn't and isn't a glamorous sport. He included a chapter on chronic, traumatic encephalopathy, which he believes could affect the future of the sport. And basically, it's the condition that a boxer or a football player might get because of repeated blows on the head. The book also addresses the racism in the early days of the NFL when black players were not allowed. From 1932 to 1946, there was a gentleman's agreement among the owners that there would be no African-American players. But the first African-American to play was a guy named Kenny Washington. And Kenny Washington had been a All-American football player at UCLA. In fact, was in the same backfield with Jackie Robinson. So he was the one who broke the color barrier. Bowen wrote about some of the great coaches, like Vince Lombardi. And Vince Lombardi was, back in the 1960s, not only a great football coach, but almost became sort of this paragon of a certain kind of person. Mm -hmm. Hardworking, um, really dedicated to the task, willing to win. And Paul Brown, who invented the playbook and the face mask. Oh, by the way, you can tell the kids, that's why the Cleveland Browns are named the Browns. It's after him. Yeah, there's lots of stuff you don't know, and it's sort of like, oh, okay. Oh, I just thought it was just a name. But in the end, for Fred Bowen, in writing Gridiron, the end goal is simple.
sports history is something I've always been interested in. And so the idea of writing sports history books for kids to explain the games that they love and that they see and how it didn't just happen, you know, that all, there were all these people behind these games and how things developed over time. That, I think, would be a wonderful way to spend the remainder of my writing career, or at least part of it. Gridiron is available on Amazon, and you can read Fred Bowen's column every week in the Washington Post's Kids Post. It's a project that's been years of the making, and today the ribbon was cut not just once, but twice for the new headquarters for the Maryland Park and Planning Commission in downtown Wheaton. In keeping with COVID-19 best practices, officials were masked up for the event that took place with a small audience. But that didn't diminish the excitement surrounding the official dedication of this major project. To see this come to fruition, you know, to have been so intimately involved from the very beginning in terms of the design and what should be here, the pros and cons of having this building here, the ability to have community space, but also the plaza um, that has been, you know, aptly uh, named after Ms. Fryer, which is just so amazing. It, it, feels, it feels a little bit like a dream uh, in many ways. And I know that this will have such an impact, a positive impact for our community. Whenever you bring employment to an area, you're bringing so much more employment, so much more opportunity for every business, especially small businesses, to, uh, to service the public. And so that is exactly what this building will, will be, will be a, a great uh, employer for people uh, throughout Wheaton. The building will also be home to seven county agencies, making it a one-stop shop for residents looking to contact multiple departments. I think a home run for Wheaton what we've done here, we've preserved Triangle Lane, which is this very unique small road where there's a lot of small businesses right off to the side. We have the future possibility of developing over the metro site, but we have a civic space. We can have concerts and events and festivals and markets. And we've created, I hope, a place that will be a family destination and a community destination right in the center of Wheaton. And to have a headquarters that is looking at approving and overseeing smart growth and quality of life issues like our parks and our planning departments are in a place that is transit accessible, that is right on top of a heavy rail of our metro and in the heart and hub of one of the great cultural centers of Montgomery County is going to be just a massive asset. Located in the center of the Wheaton Triangle, the building will eventually be home to 900 employees. This is one of the few tall buildings uh, anywhere near Wheaton, uh, you have pretty much unobstructed view. Today, just a handful are on site, including planning board chair Casey Anderson. Uh, you can see White Flint, you can see NIH. Over there in the distance, there's the cathedral, you can see the Washington Monument. The vision is to eventually make the building open to the public for art shows and other gatherings. There is an urban park just across the street with a stage and plaza dedicated to the late Marion Fryer, a Wheaton resident for over 40 years who was a champion for the community. For Council Member Nancy Navarro, this day was especially meaningful. Throughout her tenure on the council, she has fiercely advocated for Wheaton, the community which she represents. And to see this project completed is a crowning achievement. Um, for me, it also marks, I think, a full circle, given the projects that I have spearheaded, like the Library Rec Center, but, you know, Wheaton High School. Uh, very soon to there, there's going to be also a community park. Uh, in the corner of Randolph in Georgia, and of course this particular project, um, I feel really good. And you know, it's my last term, so I want to be able to look back in terms of a legacy for Wheaton, and uh, and hopefully, you know, this can be a spark that will lead to many other amazing uh, opportunities and investment in this amazing area. Reporting from Wheaton, I'm Susan Kennedy. When you pay a visit to downtown Wheaton, it's hard to miss the Limerick Pub. So we're kind of like the local Cheers. We are the quintessential corner pub 
uh, right here on the corner of Elkin and Price in downtown Wheaton, and we're part of an arts and entertainment district. So a cheery smile makes life worthwhile is our motto. Stanton and his wife opened the pub in 2011. <laughs> And since then, it has grown to be a part of the community. It's steeped in history. Medals, armband from the 1916 revolution. A nice little cozy feel, which is what you want to get. And the Limerick Pub is known for its good food. It's really good. Conversation. A Guinness and Blue Moon. I'll be back with the Blue Moon and Guinness. And hearty beer. Mm. <laughs> That's good. But when the coronavirus arrived on the scene, things changed overnight. The Limerick Pub had to close its doors on March 16th, the night before its biggest day of the year. It was going to be our 10th St. Patrick's Day on March 17th. The whole country went on lockdown, and we had to immediately pivot to doing a, a whole different business model. Uh, not only no St. Patrick's Day crowds, but no crowds, period. And, and so the test now is whether an Irish pub is not just recession-proof, but is it pandemic-proof? And I don't know. I, I just don't know. There's so much uncertainty. With a staff and bills to pay, Stanton applied for federal, state, and county aid. Through the county's public health emergency grant program, the Limerick Pub was awarded $10,000, which they used to retrofit the bar with safety in mind. Local governments play a very, very big role, and I think that this is one uh, example of how we are quickly responding. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. Thomas Hansen manages the pub. It was quite a, a chunk of change. We were saving up to do some refresh work here in the pub get the bathrooms refreshed and some other things, but we had to divert that money for uh, tents and picnic tables, um, UVC lighting, you know, getting new filters for the HVAC system. Well, I think all of us here in this little corner of Wheaton are known, you know, historically, and us for the last almost 10 years as being, you know, the type of independent place that takes care of its people and the neighborhood takes care of us, and I think our local leaders also take care of us. So we appreciate that. The Limerick Pub has been able to keep its doors open during this pandemic thanks to the support it received. We're, we are always happy to promote the pub. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want them to, you know, to disappear. Seriously. With temperatures getting colder, both gentlemen say there may be hard choices ahead. But for now, they say this beating heart of Wheaton is here to stay. You know, we obviously want to see a turn, but, you know, safety is key. And, and, and being the pub here as long as we've been, we've got, I feel like that we've got a, a social responsibility as well for our neighborhood and our block. Uh, and my staff, you know, because we've got, it's not just them and their money, it's their mortgages and their rents and their families and, and everything else. So, so, I mean, hopefully we'll turn that corner, but I, I don't know, hopefully by next spring. You know, we love the place. It's really kind of, you know, become part of our lives. And, you know, to think about walking away from it would be really hard. Um, so we're going to, you know, fight through this. And, you know, that's the name of the game. Reporting from Wheaton, I'm Susan Kennedy. My name is Arvind Kim and the most important issue to me is equity. I am a firm believer in equality of opportunity and that everyone, despite their background, identity, or socioeconomic status, should have the chance to make it far. Being a student in such a diverse county, equitable education is something that I strongly support. Disparity is very present and more equitable systems can be put in place in every aspect of our education. There is no issue more pressing than the deep disparity that is faced today. Hi, my name is Quinton Mackwell, and I'm a student at Northwest High School. I decided to apply for the Council Member for a Day contest because I wanted to speak on the issue of ESOL students not being able to partake in any honors or AP classes. In my opinion, no one should be denied a higher education because English does not happen to be their first language. These students can do so much more. They have so much potential, and it's our job to give them a chance to prove to us who they are. 
Hi, my name is Nicholas Espirito, and I'm thankful to be selected as finalist for the Council Member for a Day Challenge. I applied to this challenge to discuss about the vulnerable homeless population during COVID-19, proposed solutions such as free COVID testing, and full-scale cleanings of shelters to make them safe for trustworthy environments. Thankfully, the Council acted accordingly and helped improve the lives of many. Moving forward, I just ask that they continue to invest in more sanitary supplies such as gloves and masks for these shelters in order to improve the lives further. Hi, my name is Lauren Campano. I applied to be council member for the day in order to raise awareness about the importance of school diversity and possibly influence students within Montgomery County to be more open-minded towards their peers. Richard Montgomery High School is filled with so many students of all kinds of races and ethnicities. Being a part of such a diverse school, I've experienced countless amount of benefits that comes with this opportunity. I, be I believe that it is crucial for every student within Montgomery County to be aware of what all a diverse community can offer them. Hi, my name is Stanley Skurlock and I wrote a paper about the public policy issue of education and how we can reform the system. I am passionate about this issue because from a young age I've never been challenged in school and I've always also thought that teachers are not paid enough and they work very hard so I wanted to as well as I've also been bullied a lot in school and I wanted to write a paper about that to help our government reform the system and make change happen. Hi guys, my name is Andrea and I'm currently a senior at James River Lake High School. I never thought I'd be honored to be part of this contest, but thankfully I made it and someone got to hear my voice and that just means so much to me, being able to like talk about the black community and everything that's been going on, including with Corona. So it's really, it means a lot that someone heard me and that other people should definitely sign up for this because you never know, so one word can change our whole life. Hello, my name is Amory Cole and I am a junior at Payne High School. I entered a council member for a day contest to express my knowledge and my concern on the topic of gerrymandering. I feel that gerrymandering can heavily impact the citizenship and voter participation in our elections, which can impact the country as a whole. Hello, my name is Denise Ramirez Cisneros and I'm a senior at Northwood High School. I decided to apply for council member for a day challenge because I felt that it was a great way to advocate for issues I'm passionate about, one of them being immigration reform. As a daughter of immigrant parents, I have felt firsthand the challenges that come with being an immigrant in America, which is why I constantly try and advocate and help run a student-led advocacy group called FAIR, standing for Fans of Asylum and Immigration Reform, in which we try and fight for reform of human detention centers and asylum policy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alan Gutierrez and I'm a senior at Paint Branch High School in Montgomery County, Maryland. The issue I wrote about in the Montgomery County Council Council Member for a Day Challenge was universal health care. I believe universal health care is a right for humans regardless of socioeconomic status. We live in a country where we have the resources to be able to provide not only health care but a good high quality health care for all regardless of their membership in a privatized system. Hi, my name is Samuel Lee and the reason I entered the council member for a day competition was because I thought this was a good chance to speak out on an issue I'm concerned about and propose solutions to the council to resolve this issue in the community. The issue I highlighted in my essay was that the middle class of all ranges was not getting enough COVID-19 relief and that there should be more relief programs and compensation for all the hard workers and risk takers in the workforce. Hi, my name is Nancy Vogo and I applied for the Council Member for a Day Challenge. I wrote my essay on racial equality in education, specifically the effects of systemic racism on the achievement gap between black and white children. I applied to this competition because I thought it was a good way to showcase and advocate for an issue that I felt was very important to me. It allowed me to shed light on an issue that I felt like local government could address or take care of. Hi, my name is Pranavi Kamana, and the reason I applied for the contest was because I thought it was a way that I could give my opinion and thoughts on issues that I felt were important to me. 
Um, the issue that I highlighted in my essay was um, non-citizens getting a chance to vote. I'm Manila Perez, a senior at Northwest High School in Germantown, Maryland, as well as an active leader and intern for the Minority Scholars Program. I wrote my Council Member for a Day essay on the lack of policy and structure for disciplinary conducts in school with a sub-focus on the inequality and disparities. My name is Divya Ba and I participated in the Council Member for a Day contest because I wanted to get more involved with local politics. I chose to write about the ongoing opioid epidemic. Current efforts to mitigate the crisis focus on rehabilitation and the administration of naloxone, also known as Narcan, the antidote. I believe that local governments should strengthen the existing prescription drug monitoring program to collect more data on risk groups, which would allow doctors to make safer choices when prescribing. My name is Jackie Kimi. I'm a junior in Northwest at Northwest High School in Jamaica. The reason why I apply for Council Member Day is that a very close me, a very close friend inspired me, and also because I saw in her connection we shared about public policy issues, which is something that cannot be changed overnight. For changes to happen, we need to speak up and let other people out there hear our voices. Hi, my name is Evelyn Troy and I am a sophomore attending James Huber Blake High School. I applied for the Craig Rice Contest because I was interested in perhaps pursuing a political career in my future. I take interest in current global and local social issues and want to highlight one that I believe to be especially critical for today's audience. School shootings are an issue faced by an abundant amount of young people in K-12 schools all over the country. I hope that my local leaders can achieve precautions such as increased mental health attention in schools in order to prevent these occurrences in the future. My name is Mudia Ihile and I apply for the council member for a day contest because I saw this as a way to present an issue I found in my community and specifically my school. The issue that I presented was on mental health in youth and schooling and how we can better improve the resources and support we have for our students to make school a more welcoming and inviting place to study and thrive in. Thank you. Hi, my name is Angela Dibari and I'm a freshman at Good Council High School. I applied for Council Member of the Day to understand the role and how it helps people in our community. The issue I chose is college tuition and how everyone should be able to go without getting in a lot of debt. Hi, I'm Susan Kennedy and welcome to In The Loop. This is our opportunity to sit down with council members to talk to them about the issues and what they've been working on during their term. And today I'm joined by Council President Sidney Katz. Welcome, Mr. President. And boy, we have a lot to talk about because your presidency has been one of a kind, hasn't it? Tell, it tell me a little is. bit about, um, you were inaugurated in December, yes. or voted in in December. That is unanimous, congratulations. And only a couple of months after that, we were ensconced in this COVID-19 pandemic. It's been tough, you've had to guide our council through this. Talk a little bit about how you've been able to navigate through this so gracefully. Well, thank you for calling it graceful, but uh, you know, when, when it first started, no one could have predicted that we were going to have a pandemic that would change our lives so dramatically. Um, but it happened, and, and that's what we have to deal with. You know, I always tell people that, that uh, I, I had read about Zoom, I had heard about Zoom, I now live on Zoom. <laughs> that's, that's what happened. We were very, very concerned that we needed to, you know, I always say call the county office building the people's building. This is, this is where people come to, to for government, uh, local government. This is where people uh, come to talk to a council member. This is where they come for a public hearing. And, and the building closed, the people's building closed. So we were very concerned about, about what does that mean and how are we going to have our public involved in, in their government? And what we did was, we immediately came up with a system for, for Zoom. It had to be tweaked a couple times so that they could, we could have public hearings. 
The county council has traditionally had six committees where much of the work is actually done. Uh, we couldn't meet in committees, so we had to immediately go to everything being a committee of the whole. All nine of us had to be on every topic, on every, on every uh, discussion, but we did it. Yeah, it, it was a quick change, wasn't it? And we're still virtual at this point. Yes. We are not sure when we're coming back, taking it month by month, waiting to see how the cases go here. An update on, uh, on uh, the COVID-19. We have weekly briefings testing. with we Dr. Travis Gales. Family gatherings and large gatherings continue to be affiliated with case transmission. And Dr. Earl Stoddard, talk a little bit about that guidance and how that's played into, you know, your votes as far as these health orders and all the other items that you've had to take on. Well, and of course it gets confusing with that. They are truly uh, wonderful people who do a lot of work. I, I always tease them that 24-7 is not enough, uh, not enough for them. They, they need 25-8 because that's what they seem to always be working. And, and there's so many people with so many different opinions and want to have discussions with them so that they understand the concerns that they have. Listen, we've affected every part of every person's life, not just in Montgomery County, but throughout the United States, throughout the world in many cases, that, that uh, businesses had to close, that, that schools, I mean, no one would have ever assumed that we would have schools that were not going to be open. Today is Monday, September 21st. And then they had to change to the, to the virtual uh, learning. And so there certain things that we're going to try are not going to work. I mean, and, and we have got to understand that that's not exact. I mean, that's not a failure. 80% mm -hmm. is, is still a successful rate. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people look at you, well, you, that worked, but, you know, that other part didn't. Well, we're going to have to, if it doesn't work, we're going to have to massage how it does work. Yeah, that, that's well said. Uh, and now I know that we know the county received a large pot of money from the federal government through the CARES Act for us to, to use during this time of crisis. And we have so many needs. And we have colleagues who represent different parts of the county who see those needs. Talk a little bit about how you decided where that funding should go. How did that work? The president just before me, uh, Council Member Navarro, uh, we had passed the day that I actually became president of the county council, we signed the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act. And I remember joking to the crowd, it shouldn't go unnoticed. So my first day as council president, can you imagine this? Look what we've done. And now what are we, you know, what's going to happen for day two? Who knows what's going to happen? Well, and of course, we need to make certain that everything we do it has an equitable side to it. For And, and the, the dollars were no different for that. And of course, we do have tremendous need. And we continue. To have tremendous need. You want bread? I can give you a whole thing of bread. We have people that that need food. We have, you know the food inequities. Thank you. Buddy. Thank you. You're welcome. We have we have people that need money for rent. We have people that need money for child care. We can keep that list going, and we did receive from the federal government, which was a huge help, 183 million dollars, which is a lot of money, mm -hmm. except when you're talking about a budget that's six billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And and so the, and that 183 million had to last has to last until the end of the year, mm -hmm. and so you have to figure out how we're doing it. We've pretty much allocated every every dollar of it, but we we've we've had so much that we've needed to do. We've had people that have never needed government before, so as much as we were concerned about the the the, the time we were living in that moment we were even more concerned about next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. And so that's the next concern. God bless you, ma'am. And you know, we Good day. had a continuity of, of uh, continuing services uh, for our budget this year, and, and hopefully we can do the same services that we've done. And, and right now we, we're pretty much being able to do that. But we're concerned about how that's going to work for next year. And, and one of the things that you initiated were your business briefings. We were just talking about business and, and how tough it's been for the many businesses here in Montgomery County. And we've learned an awful lot. Tell us about, you know, why this was something that you wanted to do. You know, I, from my background, I was a small business owner. My grandparents had started a store in Gaithersburg in 1918. And I ran that store, owned that store for, for many years. Uh, my family uh, uh, business. And so knowing that is my background and, and the, my, the staff that of my, my staff from the uh, county uh, council staff 
uh, said, why don't you have a, a business briefing? I said, well, let's try it. I mean, I didn't know how, how successful or, you know, how many people would be interested in it. But it really has gotten some really very interesting uh, discussions. If, is that a business plan that could even keep somebody in business? If we can save these businesses mm -hmm. um, and keep them in space and open, um, then, you know, a year from now, we won't be looking at mass vacancies, which would, of course, translate into loss of tax revenue. So We've uh, had some, you know, pretty good attendance, people watching it, and then they'll watch it after the fact if they can't get there on that Friday. I learned quite a bit, and we know that we need to continue to work together to make but sure. It was really something that I wanted to hear directly from people who are doing or are trying to do uh, their businesses in a different way. And, mm -hmm. and there again, we've, we've proven time and time again that, that small businesses especially understand how they need to be flexible mm -hmm. and how they need to pivot literally on a dime. Mm -hmm. And if it's not working this way, they need to be doing it in a different way. Yeah, and it's been good because I think a lot of people have been able to bring some resources and ideas to the table during this discussion, which I know have helped some of the viewers, which is part of the reason that you wanted to do this. People could share their ideas with others who might be struggling. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and of course, it lets us know firsthand for the COVID money or for, you know, the CARES Act money, what, whether or not with that, that program has worked or it hasn't worked and what it means. Let's shift gears. You are chair of the Public Safety Committee. And um, boy, there's been a lot going on in that area as well. That hasn't been a quiet subject here in Montgomery County. Marcus Jones. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. We have a new chief in Marcus Jones, and, and now we have a police advisory commission here in Montgomery County that's made up of a group of residents and, and other citizens and officials who are helping us reimagine our police department. Talk a little bit about this as far as chair of the Public Safety Committee goes and, and your work behind all of this. Well, first off, let me, let me just say how really pleased I am that, that Chief Marcus Jones is the chief. He's, he's a person who's very down to earth. I've known him for years. I've known his family for years. I, I always say that I saw his daughters play basketball in, in high school. I mean, you know, I, so I, I, uh, I, know, I know what a wonderful uh, community member he and his family uh, are for all of us. And that's very important for someone who's in that line of work, that they, that they know the community and that they truly love the community. So that in itself has been comforting. We, we really are going through turmoil. What do we want, George? When do we want it? Do I mean, it's want? never been easy to be a police officer at any time, whether, you know, and, and I've known many, many police officers over my, over my life. But, but um, right now, it's probably the toughest of times. The, the vast, vast majority of police officers do an unbelievably good job. They risk their lives. For, for us each and every day. This is a, a, a time for us to have to understand we have to come together to work with our community to gain to continue to gain the trust and for those who don't trust us at all in order to obtain their trust. And then of course that doesn't mean that a hundred percent of, of uh, the time that every every police officer has, has done a perfect job. And to me, you know, I often say that, that government work has to be a puzzle. Yeah. Here's my card. I work in the community service office, so okay. if you guys have any like ongoing concerns that you want us to address. Um, that all parts time. need to fit together, and that's what we are trying our best to do. Never underestimate someone who has autism. Things that are working, we need to make certain that they continue to work. We need to make certain that the resources are there for, the, for people to, to be able, for the police officers and, and firefighters and anyone else in public safety, have the resources necessary to, to save people's lives. But we also have to make certain that the way we're doing it is the, the way that the public feels comfortable and that we need to make certain that the dialogue, that we have good uh, conversation and, and, uh, and work together to, to have a better life. One of the other things you've done over the past couple of years has, <laughs> is getting youth involved and finding out what they think, which is really terrific. You, you feel like there's a lot of talent here in Montgomery County that we can tap and use their ideas and their thoughts. Give us some background on that advisory group that you have and, and what you've heard from them so far. Well, the, the youth advisory group that's for my personal office and, and uh, that we have 
really has been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, uh, we uh, have gotten people from the instructors from both Montgomery College and, and uh, University of Shady Grove to, to give us some suggestions for young people that might want to be involved in one that, that committee. And, uh, and they've been very, very helpful to us. They, they'll tell you exactly what they think because I mean, we want to hear that. They'll give us their views. I, you know, throw out a question and they'll, they'll um, pick it up and go with it. And, and we do it every couple months uh, to, to get uh, additional information. There again, we started out in person. I would say, you know, have, you know, have some pizza with me. Let's, let's have this discussion. Right now we can't do that, uh, and especially this academic year. But we continue to, to want to hear from, from them. Getting a chance to vote. Global and local social issues. Mental health and youth. College tuition. Not getting enough COVID-19 relief. If you're going to be in a representative government, which is what we're in, you need to hear directly from the people you're representing. What is MCPS in Montgomery County doing to raise more awareness into the issue of climate change? And so that's what we're trying to do. And that's what the, with our young people who are the mo um, very uh, important part of our, of our obviously our future. We had more than 300 questions come in tonight during this town meeting. That we all need to work together to make certain that they realize that there is a future and we need them to help us uh, in Montgomery County. And you'll be passing the gavel on very soon within the next few weeks and when you leave what will be your biggest accomplishment that you're the most proud of uh, in your year as president of the County Council? You know, that's always a tough, I, I, a tough question. And of course, I think what I am most proud of is that my colleagues and I all worked together, did not always agree on every topic every time. And that's actually probably okay, because if everybody agrees, and you, you don't necessarily get all the viewpoints. But that we didn't always uh, agree, but we always worked together to make certain that, that the public was involved in what we were trying to do to make certain that, that government is something that's not just for us individually, and that carries unanimously, but it's for everyone in Montgomery County. And I guess if I had to have a, the, my legacy would be that, that, I was, that I was able to work with them so that we actually ended up in the best place we could possibly end up during a crisis. Yeah, that was a big task to take on, and I think you've done it quite well. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us, Mr. President. I think a lot of us are probably comfortable with ordering groceries online. It's kind of a new thing that if you're really tech savvy, you know all about. But probably most people don't. And certainly I'm hearing that a lot of folks, it's, this is a, a concept that they aren't aware of. First of all, I think everyone should reach out to you know, parents, grandparents, neighbors. This is a, a critical issue. How do you get food? You need to remain in essentially shelter in place. You know, if you're, if you're over 60, you've got to be so careful right now. Uh, and if you have a health condition, you have to be even more careful. So whether it's family members that are actually shopping for you and bringing you your food, or if you don't have that ability, uh, you're ordering online. It's not actually that difficult to order online. And I think we as, as a community need to take some action to ensure that everyone knows how to do it. So today I am leading our Bake with Sharon class. We do it for all of our Main Street members and it's really been successful over the summer. Welcome to Bake with Sharon this week. We are making the best ever banana bread. This is our Rockville City Chief of Police and Deputy Chief of Police, Chief Brito and Deputy Chief Lanham. And we are so excited to be welcoming them to bake with us. And I think it's a really good example of how we are one big community supporting one another and how exciting to be able to share something that brings people together like cooking and baking um, together with our really valued police force that keeps us safe and protects us. Take a quick look and see who we've got. I see Danielle and Faith. Yay, we've got all of our peeps together. This is awesome. 
So today we're going to be baking in a baking dish that is nine inches by five inches. Swath around, great. Parchment paper is your friend. Would you like to pour half a cup in there and we will get that going in our wet mixture. How many police officers does it take to, to pour the buttermilk in the mixture? This is so... It's half, so it's gonna be a little... The pressure of measuring, the pressure of doing all this is something I've never experienced before, so it was very unique to me. Um, I love the pressure, but it was, uh, it was great. I learned a lot. I, I've never baked before. And you can peel the bananas. Any questions while I'm waiting patiently for my support to, to help me out? This is so awesome, by the way. In this particular group, we do have a fair amount of people that have disabilities. You, there's, you know, the, the, the order of things can be stressful. And what, what, what ingredient did you set? Flour, brown sugar, white sugar. So we always have a few people who want to make sure that they're on track and they're doing it in the right order or that their looks right or that they are, you know, on the right track. And so we had a couple questions today just clarifying, is it okay that I put my cinnamon sugar in my mixture, for example? You're sifting the flour? And you put a little cinnamon sugar in it. You know what? That's going to make it more delicious. So sometimes there are happy accidents. And it's always okay because unless something is really like a from a science perspective going to ruin a recipe, usually those happy accidents end up making something more delicious anyway. And I'm going to let my special helpers. This is the big job here. This is why you get paid the big bucks. Pour the mixture. Wow, it's it's so professional. It gives us an opportunity to connect with our community. I haven't done, ever done anything like this before in 31 years in law enforcement. And now I'm going to put it in my 325 degree oven for one hour and 20 minutes. I have to tell you, un underneath this mask is a huge smile. Um, this is really wonderful. So I, I am so appreciative we are, uh, we are invited. To Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. That was awesome. Woohoo! At One Acre Farm in Dickerson, farmer Mike Protus is a big believer in composting as a method of enriching his soil and delivering healthy food. But getting that compost material hasn't always been easy. So up until this point, I haven't been making as much compost as I would like to just simply based on labor and time and, and access to materials. It's harder, it's harder, harder, harder to find materials to make compost with. But a new proposal introduced by council member Evan Glass might just be the answer to Farmer Mike's dilemma. Uh, happy to continue those conversations. Montgomery County produces about 147,000 tons of waste each year. Zoning text amendment 2004 will create a greener local economy by increasing the amount of organic waste farmers can use on their property to produce and manufacture compost and mulch. Right now, farms are limited at only accepting 20% capacity for off-site composting, which means the other 80% of what they're composting has to come from their facility, their own farm. Uh, but now we're going to increase it to 50%, and that way we're able to accept more food waste from residents of Montgomery County, means less waste in our landfill, less waste in our incinerator, and it's good for the farms and good for the earth. The main thing is we need, as farmers, we need as much organic matter in our soil as possible. So by expanding the amount of material we can compost in this zone text amendment, we can then create more compost, which we can put on our fields. At, at the moment, there's never ending supply. We could use an unlimited supply of compost. Now, of course, in 20 years, that's a different story. But for right now, we have a lot of work to, to build up our soils back up so that they have enough organic matter to grow the healthy plants that we need to furnish healthy people. Despite its name, One Acre Farm sits on 34 acres in Montgomery County's Agricultural Reserve. One of the ways farmer Mike practices organic farming is through using compost provided by the compost crew, a locally owned food scrap recycling business that currently serves more than 5,000 customers. At One Acre Farm, the compost crew has set up a zero waste operation. Um, so you'll see we have an IBC tote here. This is actually also used uh, IBC tote. So this is used for food grade material, um, meaning that it's safe to apply to our compost piles. So we have a used IBC tote here, we have a used shipping container, and we are taking material that would otherwise go into the trash. 
So this is really a whole, you know, zero waste project here. You know, the compost is the finished product that we're using, but we're also incorporating elements um, that, you know, this material, like I said, would otherwise, you know, pop, probably end up into the trash, so. Farmer Mike would like to be able to expand this operation. However, current zoning restricts the amount of organic waste farmers like him can take into their facility. Both he and the compost crew say council member Glass's ZTA would be a welcome solution in protecting the environment, supporting sustainable farming, and creating more green jobs. So as we continue to grow, we continue to collect more food scraps, and we will need more places to process those food scraps and right now the region is reliant on just one or two pretty large facilities that are far away and that's a negative because it increases the risk to the industry as a whole because if we're relying on just one facility what happens if something goes wrong with that facility or if they run out of capacity so we definitely need more capacity in general but also we need more capacity closer to the source of waste generation because that allows us to minimize the overall environmental and economic footprint of of the collections but moving forward with this compost crew being here i'll be have the ability to use a better product than what i can make with the materials the the free materials i can get access to at the moment so the beauty of growing comp with compost is that if we create a healthy soil it creates a healthy plant just like our kids in school if our kid isn't healthy it, he or she gets sick more often. It's the same thing with plants. Plants are left alone if they're healthy. Nothing bothers them. Bugs don't bother them. Disease pressure doesn't bother them. Montgomery County has committed to significantly reducing its carbon footprint by 2035. Councilmember Glass says this measure is a big step in reducing the waste stream that exists here. If we're going to meet those goals, not only here in Montgomery County, but nationally and globally, we have to start taking more bold action. Uh, and, and this is just one little step to really help with our managing our food waste so that we can better utilize the farms that we have here in Montgomery County and encourage more entrepreneurial growth within this space and that's where compost crew and other types of small businesses really come into play uh, the small businesses working with the farmers helping our residents i mean that 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 is the circle of life right here the council is scheduled to hold a public hearing on the measure december 1st reporting from dickerson i'm susan kennedy in an effort to address disparities in distance learning for vulnerable students, the council has submitted a proposal that would provide $1.8 million to support those students by adding educational enrichment and equity hubs. The funding was proposed by Councilmember Craig Rice, who chairs the council's Education and Culture Committee. And so it was incredibly important for us understanding that we're in a distance learning model now, that we needed to do more for these families for these children, uh, making sure that they have the ability to get the additional help that's needed, the additional resources, because it is hard. And it's one in which we see a lot of children struggling. And so having these hubs to be able to just provide that additional support that's necessary, whether it's homework help, whether it's just the guidance, whether it's just the comfort of being around somebody in person, all of those kinds of things are needed for some of our students who just are struggling with the distance learning model and it's really not working for them uh, that are going to help them to bridge the time until we can get our kids back in school. The Children's Opportunity Fund and the Black and Brown Coalition have partnered with county child care providers licensed by the state to deliver services in schools to implement educational enrichment and equity hubs. Currently there are hubs in nine county elementary schools the funding would expand the number of hub sites by at least 20 to those low-income students while schools meet virtually. This is going to be a very big deal for us um, because, again, when we're talking about our outreach, one of the things we know is that there are pockets of kids of need throughout the county. There is not one area. They're not just in Silver Spring or in Wheaton or in Germantown or in Montgomery Village. The reality is, is that they're spread all around the county. And so by setting up these hubs, we can look at where our students are struggling the most and make sure that we can give them the resources that they need. This funding reflects the county's commitment to racial equity and social justice. The goal of the hubs is to provide virtual learning support to those vulnerable students who have been negatively impacted by the challenges of distance learning. Reporting from Rockville, I'm Susan Kennedy.
We're now going to talk about how the national trends we're seeing in youth sports are playing out in local communities. I think it's a it's a challenge that we're going to face across our country, and it's really how do you feel safe again letting your kid participate in sports, especially in a sport like football where they're on the field with a bunch of other kids, and there's not really an option for six feet of space when you're playing a, a contact sport, if you will, um, be it flag or tackle football. So I think it's really about how do we safely get back to play, and so we've we've tried to address that. Uh, we also felt like a major challenge was what happens when a family is struggling to feed their kids, right? You've got to be fueled to be able to play, and so that's where our commitment through our foundation for our food relief program came in because we said, let's start with feeding and let's start with getting food in some homes and then let's address the exercise and activity component since kids are home. So that's really what I feel the challenge is and how we're trying to help address that challenge. Great. Gabe, what are, what are the challenges in Montgomery County? Well, thank you. I very much echo the concerns raised in the respective communities in Miami and in San Antonio. We're experiencing a lot of that here in Montgomery County. I think we're very concerned about the social and emotional well-being of our children and youth right now. We are all virtual and kids are not able to exercise in the way that they were before. They're not able to socialize in the way that we they were before. And there were challenges prior to the pandemic with youth being able to access different leagues and programs and services depending on what zip code you live in Montgomery County. And those handful of organizations that go above and beyond to be able to provide those that support structure for kids and communities that just don't have that same access are crumbling right now. And so my concern is, is that post-pandemic, those organizations that were trying to stand up programs and services where they are severely lacking are not going to be able to survive. So it's going to compound the challenge of the social and emotional well-being of our children and them not having the same level of opportunities post-pandemic that they had prior to the pandemic. So as we go about allocating resources, whether it's uh, dollars for a youth uh, sports program or it's building out a trail system, what we're doing is focusing on uh, how we can uh, redress those disparities uh, based on the historic um, inequities that existed. Uh, so, uh, you know, with regard to how we measure success, it's about over time ensuring that those, um, those health measures begin to change. Uh, but the, the, the work is comprehensive and it's not just about uh, youth sports. And how we measure success is on outcomes, whether or not the child poverty rate decreases whether or not the, the obesity and diabetes rates decreases. And the disparities that are most significant are those uh, zip codes that correlate to high poverty areas, uh, areas with lower access to education and, and uh, economic mobility. So everything we're doing is to attack those inequities. And, you know, and, and one of the, the measures of that is racial injustice, the inequities that have been built based on long ago um, laws that were were long since uh, ruled unconstitutional. We have to continue to address those inequities that have um, been created as a result. Yeah. Gabe, how about in Montgomery County? What, what racial inequities do you see in relation to youth sports or physical activity? So, so that was music to my ears. We just recently passed the same, a very similar racial inequity framework here in Montgomery County. So from a budget lens, from a policy lens, we're taking a moment to see how this will, you know, whatever we do will impact various communities. And so sports is, it was, it was easier for us to be able to move forward these funds during this difficult time, because when you look at sports through that lens, it does very clearly show that those communities that have more resources, have more recreational activities, have more organized youth sports. And what we have found, particularly in the sports sector, is there's a missing middle. Uh, you go from zero to elite and club with almost nothing in the middle, and that's exasperated in communities that can't afford and have those challenges and barriers I mentioned earlier to be able to access sports. And this is a profound problem um, because those, inequity, those inequities, you know, will, will proliferate these children's lives, if they don't have access to the same quality programming that benefited probably everybody on this panel, 
and they don't have the, those same opportunities, then it will impact their lives. And so it's, it's incumbent upon our community and our public sector to help fill in those holes through those public-private partnerships, because if we don't, it's going to have a, a long-lasting negative impact. Yeah, and we've seen in um, national data uh, for kids ages 6 to 12, sports participation is higher for white youth um, than it is for um, people of color, than it is for uh, blacks, than it is for uh, Hispanics. Roshana, what, what do you see in South Florida with racial inequities? So I think we have the same same issues and the same challenges. I think that in South Florida, you know, there there is a, a gap. I think that we're trying to work to fill from from where we sit as a professional sports team. And I think the thing that we've really tried to do is we have a program called our Football Unites program, and it does exactly that. So we truly believe that sports can be a catalyst for change, for changing perspectives, for changing hearts, for changing minds. And so that's really what we're trying to do is focus on how do the inequities that we see in sport, how can we try to get everybody to an equal playing field at some point, right? Like that's the long-term goal for all of us. And so through our Football Unites program, we've brought together about 60 organizations that represent different segments and categories within our market. We bring all of these organizations together and we provide programming for those organizations so that the first step can at least be knowledge. So we think, we believe that education is really the first step to tearing down some of those walls of inequities. And that's what we're doing through football. I also hope that families take a step back and reflect on this time where they're home for dinner more often, where they're not rushing around from league to league, from game to game, having their nine-year-old go to tournaments across the country. I think we need to really look back at the sports climate and environment and reflect on what's the most important. And that's our families, that's our health, that's our wellness. And, you know, we spend $60,000 over the lifespan of a sports hoping for a $10,000 scholarship uh, to some of our colleges. I think we need to put that in perspective and, and have youth focus on what's important, and that's playing and having a good time and hanging out with their friends. Well, thank you all so much. We really appreciate you joining. This room tonight have come from people like you who have reached out to us through social media, NC311, as well as emails and telephone calls. Of course, there is no way we can answer all of the questions in 90 minutes, but the idea is for us to address the most frequently asked questions that we have received as of today. After today's program, we will post the questions and the answers on our website for your reference. We also want to remind viewers that this discussion is being broadcast live on Facebook, YouTube, and on County channels, County Cable Montgomery. Immediately following the live broadcast, you can view the recording on Facebook and YouTube as well. We also want you to know that this is not your only opportunity to get information. Over the next few weeks, we'll be hosting additional conversations like this one. Y para aquellos residentes del condado de Montgomery de habla hispanoparlante, sepan que esta transmisión tiene traducción simultánea por el canal Condado TV Eh, también por Comcast y en nuestra página de Facebook. With that being said and done, let's get started with County Executive Mark Elrich for some opening remarks. County Executive. So, so first of all, I want to uh, thank all of you for being here and also thank anybody who's either tuned in now or is going to be um, listening later on. Uh, this is our second community briefing. We think it's important to try to give folks in the community as much information as we possibly can. And as, as Lorna said, we'll be doing more in the future. Uh, I want to start by saying that uh, today or um, late yesterday, Montgomery County lost its first employee, Michael Miller, who worked at the ride-on um, bus depot in uh, Silver Spring, was 60 years old. He leaves a wife and two adult kids behind. And we just want to express our condolences to the family. And this is a loss for everybody. And it's... It's not unexpected that this happens in Montgomery County. It's, it's happening everywhere, but it's tragic every time it happens. And I just want to convey that, you know, we all share in this sense of loss for not just Michael, but for everybody else that uh, is undergoing this. Uh, we have been working diligently 
to manage this crisis. And uh, I would say that I, th I think that uh, because we did sheltering in, space, in place, because we took steps like masks and things, I said those are the things that we knew were necessary to turn the curve on the virus and minimize its spread. And I think the actions that were taken in the state of Maryland have probably helped minimize the spread in the state of Maryland. And I've um, been grateful to the governor for his cooperation and for the fact that he's actually been willing to lead and that uh, the basis of his decisions are being made on science. And I was on a conference call with him today and when he was asked the question about when he was gonna open up, he was very clear that we would not be opening up in a way that wasn't safe for the residents of the state of Maryland. And it's good to hear that from a political leader. I wish all political leaders uh, took that approach. But I was, you know, glad that we're doing that. We're able to, we've been able to work with them. We're trying to coordinate on supplies. I think everybody knows that supplies have been in short supplies, particularly personal protective equipment. And uh, I have to thank the procurement staff because I can't even imagine how many rabbit holes people have gone down when people have offered us stuff <laughs> and it, at either amazingly good prices or astoundingly horrible prices. And, and then you come to find out that it's either not available, not available, then you want it or not the thing that you thought it was. Mm -hmm. And trying to sort out through all that to find what we need has been a challenge, but we're getting there. We know the state has more equipment coming in. We're gonna to continue to supply. I've told our procurement people that uh, you're to continue to buy as if another crisis was coming. So that when, in the likelihood that there's a rebound from this, a second step, we are not gonna be in the situation that everybody in the country found themselves in, which is trying to find supplies on the fly while the virus, um, the extent of the infections were growing. So we're gonna make sure we have the things in place and it'll be better to be safe. And sorry, I'd rather have too many gloves, too many masks, and too many other pieces of protective equipment and too few. And so I want to assure people that we're going to continue by until we get to the point that we, that we feel safe. Um, we will make our own decision about opening based on what the governor does. So we will not be acting um, independent. I think it was okay for us to get out front on taking some of the protective measures, but I am not going to get out front on, on um, relaxing protective measures. I think we need to let the scientists and the doctors make those kind of decisions. I'm well aware that the economy is suffering. Um, our program went live, the financial help for the small businesses went live yesterday and we had, I've heard a number as high as over 3,500 applications. Uh, we, I don't want to get anybody's expectations up, $20 million with a maximum of $75,000 is not gonna cover all those applications, but we're gonna cover as many we, as we can, give as much aid as we can. Um, look at the possibility of doing a second tranche of assistance, not only for that, but also for the money we've said we were gonna put out to individuals in the community. And uh, my last plea from this is, uh, if, if you normally do charitable giving in Montgomery County, or even if you don't, look at the organizations, go to our webpage, um, go to the COVID page, and there's a place about community organizations, which where you can donate and volunteer. Find somebody you can either give time or money to. Um, I know in the world of um, charitable organizations, this was a big fundraising season for them. They're not raising any funds. And a lot of them depend on these events in the spring to fund their operations or fund significant parts of their operations. They're not gonna be having those events. And so what I've been asking people, I know none of us go to their events for the chicken. We go there because we wanna support them. So even if they're not serving chicken this year, um, please give them what you would have given them anyway because they really need it. They're not only hurting, but they have more people in this county that they're serving who are hurting. So anything you can do would be a big help. With that, I'll... Thank you, Cam. Cam. Give to the rest. Let me go ahead and introduce some of our speakers tonight. So we have Dr. Jack Smith, who is the superintendent mm -hmm. of Montgomery County Public Schools. Also, Chief Jones, Marcus Jones from our police department. Over here on my left, we have Heather Bruskin, who is the executive director of the Montgomery County Food Council. 
and we have Dr. Travis Gales, who is our Chief Health Officer in Montgomery County. So let's get started with you. Uh, can you give us just a general overview, Dr. Gales, of the cases in the state and the county as of today? Sure. Good evening to everyone at home who's watching. And as always, I'd like to say thank you to all of our first line responders, however that is defined, who are working on the front lines to continue to provide the services to the residents of Montgomery County. So thank you to, to all of you. Uh, as it relates to the cases uh, or, or residents who've tested positive for COVID-19, uh, we are now over 2,000 cases in this uh, county, Montgomery County um, and over 10,700 cases across the state. Um, if you recall from our very first meeting, again, I'd, I'd like to talk in terms of how we progressed. We talked about the different markers and measures that we would use to determine our response. We went from talking about cases hypothetically in terms of preparing to the next week, our first three cases, to now obviously the case count has increased significantly. And as the county executive mentioned, a number of uh, provisions and precautionary measures have been put into place, including sheltering in place, closing of non-essential businesses and social distancing. So we stand now over 2,000 cases. A number that I also want folks to look at is we've been following is the percentage of those who are hospitalized. Um, of the, the 10,000 cases in the state of Maryland, about 22 to 24% have been hospitalized at some point. That number is important because we use that as a measure to determine what will be the impact on our healthcare system. Uh, and so something else that we have spent a lot of time since our last town hall to today is working very closely with our hospital and health system partners to ensure that we have adequate bed space to absorb the need if we see more people needing hospitalization. And even when they come into the hospital setting, making sure that we have the adequate provisions to provide critical care and intensive care to those who are our sicker patients. I'm happy to say that that partnership continues to work very well together and we are meeting the needs of our county residents as it stands. Now there's lots of people who ask about, well, when is the peak going to happen? Is the surge happening now? We don't really know for sure. Uh, we continue to look at the information as it comes in. We've got lots of predictive models. We are preparing and have been preparing from day one that the surge is happening imminently and, and right away. And so we continue to respond nimbly to our hospital partners to meet their needs in terms of making sure they have the necessary equipment to provide the services that they need. So I'll stop there and happy to and look forward to addressing questions throughout the evening. Thank you very much. Um, let's talk to you, uh, Chief Jones. Um, this is an, a question that we have from a county resident. I am really confused by the stay at home order. Where can I go and what happens if I'm out? Will the police stop me? I work for an essential business, so can I still go to work? What documents do I need to have? Please clear this up. Uh, so good afternoon and uh, that's a great question. Um, we want to let folks know that particularly those who are part of the, the essential uh, businesses and uh, that the governor has noted, um, is that you are free to go to your business to and from, um, but that you also are free to go to uh, stores such as grocery stores, um, to the drugstore, um, to get uh, vital medicines, or also to go to get food to eat. Um, and so that, um, uh, that allows you, and you will not uh, be stopped by Montgomery County Police or any other law enforcement. That is not our, uh, that's not our motivation and we are not um, focusing on individuals by stopping cars randomly or stopping people as they're walking randomly asking them um, uh, where they are going. Um, and uh, if you do uh, by any chance in, uh, are um, dealing with a law enforcement officer by uh, being stopped for uh, for a law enforcement reason, um, you can simply state you don't need um, documentation that states uh, where you work, uh, but simply just be uh, just provide the information um, of your employment um, and, and where you are going, and that will be sufficient uh, for you to proceed and go about your and about your business. 
Chief, just to follow up to that, are the police officers required to wear face coverings and what else is being done to keep them safe? So, so officers are, uh, we are giving them the ability to wear face coverings. Uh, they have specific uh, type of face coverings that they wear. If they are going into stores and anything such as the governor's orders, we are requiring them to have their, their face coverings with them, um, as everybody else is abiding by the, by the order. Um, and uh, we are also, because of the amount of equipment that they have, uh, making sure that they use their, their equipment when they're out in public um, in a rational and smart way. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Dr. Smith and CPS is still serving meals? If so, where do I go and how does it work? Also, are workers who are distributing the meals being protected? Yes, absolutely. To all of those questions, I uh, just want to say hello to all of my partners here, and I want to be very clear in how much we've appreciated the partnerships here across the county uh, to meet the needs of all of our students and our families. Uh, we are serving meals. As of the end of last week, we had served 629,000 plus meals. We serve three meals and a snack each day to any child age two through 18 or enrolled in Montgomery County Public Schools because you might be 19 or 20 and be enrolled. And so we'll continue that service for as long as it's needed. Uh, it's, we have 41 different sites plus seven mobile sites and we also work with our partners in um, the county to provide weekend uh, supplements to people's diets and meals. Uh, you can go on our website and find all of those sites. You can see a, a map of them and we just want to encourage everyone to take advantage of this who needs it across the system and we don't ask questions or ask you to sign in. If you need it, then we want to provide it. We will tell you that starting Monday, starting next week, we'll serve Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. And on Wednesday, we'll serve two sets of meals. So Thursday will be covered. So starting on Monday, April 20th, we'll serve Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. And on your Wednesday visit, you'll get enough meals for two days each of those times. Thank you. Um, let's go back to you, Dr. Gales. I'll be with you in just a minute. Lately, there have been a lot of questions about the masks, the face coverings, and gloves since you issued the order. Can you explain to the order regarding face coverings and when people should wear a mask or facial covering? Are people required to wear them where, whenever and wherever they go out? Okay. So I want to make sure people at home understand why we're using different terms, so face coverings versus masks. Uh, in the, the, the directive that was put out, we will prefer to use the language face coverings because face coverings can be a host of different materials. Uh, we're working hard to preserve our mask, including our surgical mask and N95 mask for first line responders, including our healthcare providers. It's important that they have access to those because they add a level of protection needed based upon their level of exposure in working in high risk places and areas. So when we talk about face coverings, that can include a cloth mask that you have made, kind of like this one that I wear, um, or some other type of household, a t-shirt or bandana, something like that. The, the directive that we put out uh, and the directive that the governor has since put into place with his executive order that will go into effect on Saturday requires that it, uh, residents wear face coverings in a host of places, uh, pretty much in essential retail spaces. So our grocery stores, our pharmacies, uh, laundromats was included, um, also public transit, including the bus systems. Uh, and it also requires that employees, for example, in grocery stores, pharmacies, and larger retail spaces that have been deemed essential uh, businesses are required to wear them as well. The goal of wearing face coverings is to protect others in the event that you are an asymptomatic carrier of COVID-19. It adds an extra barrier to if you're coughing or expelling droplets, you know, if you're breathing and talking, it helps to block those and keep them from coming into contact with surfaces that others may come behind you and touch and pick up. So as uh, we move forward, there may be other opportunities where there may be other venues that are added to that. But as of now, uh, the governor's directive builds on what we put into place uh, to require face coverings in those spaces. Thank you. Uh, Heather Bruskin from the Montgomery County Food Council. 
As more and more people have become unemployed, the need for food and meals is a growing concern in the county. Where are the best places to go for information on food assistance resources, and where is food being served? Thank you so much. And as a resident, a parent, an employer, and somebody with underlying health conditions, I uh, thank all of our leaders uh, who are here um, and the many uh, thousands who are working tirelessly to uh, keep us safe. Uh, and so the Food Council is a community-based nonprofit uh, who convenes all these different stakeholders in our county's food system. Uh, and so we have the opportunity to work with lots of organizations and agencies that are, uh, f that are feeding our residents. So before this uh, pandemic, we had over 60,000 residents who were at risk for food insecurity in Montgomery County. So for years prior to this crisis, we've been steadily building a strong network of over 70 food assistance providers. These range from large organizations uh, to some small faith-based pantries. And they all have been quickly adapting their service models to distribute meals and food uh, staples to residents, both at pickup sites um, and delivering to homes. Now, it's important to know that um, when visiting all of these different sites uh, to uh, practice social distancing, just as you would at, at grocery stores, and, and that's important to protect both the health of the volunteers and the staff that are distributing the food, uh, as well as uh, those who are receiving the food. Uh, but these providers have seen over five times the demand um, that they had prior uh, to just a month ago, the services that they were offering. And many of these recipients are people who've never used food before. And so it's more important than ever to make sure that residents are aware of the resources that are available. And so on the Food Council's website, and so that's www.mococfoodcouncil.org, each day we're updating an interactive map that's searchable with information on all of these food assistance sites. There's also information on the MCPS sites. Um, and so we encourage you to search using your zip code or other uh, special resources. Do you need delivery? Do you need special diet accommodations and the food that's available? And these resources are also available in our website on, in Spanish, or you can call 311 um, if uh, that's easier than using um, web access. It's important to note that our farmers markets are also open and we're entering that season where it's a terrific opportunity to support our local farms and food producers. And Crossroads Community Food Network uh, is doubling the value of SNAP uh, for market purchases through the end of May. So those are also good places where you can use benefits programs like SNAP. And the grocery stores are adopting their models, many offering delivery and curbside pickup. And restaurants are offering those services as well um, for those who um, have the resources to make um, purchases for their food. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Mr. <coughs> County Executive, you were uh, talking about the small uh, business community. I am a small business owner, and unfortunately, I had to lay off a number of employees. What benefits will they get through the county? How do they apply for unemployment? Are there services for undocumented workers? That's a good and complicated question, so I may ask you to repeat pieces of it. Okay. Um, so if they're laid off, they're eligible for unemployment. And the change in the unemployment law is significant. There is no waiting period, so you're eligible on the day you were left, you were um, let go. There is, um, there have been problems with processing things through unemployment, but they will get through it, and when they get through it, you will be backdated to the day you were um, laid off, which is good news. And probably the best news of all is that for a period of time, uh, the checks that people get in unemployment are being increased by $600 across the board. So whether you are getting $300 in unemployment or $430 in unemployment, you're getting another $600 on top of that. That is a significant difference. Uh, they said it, it provides an income for as short as it would be, but it provides the equivalent income of somebody earning about $57,000 a year. So that's pretty significant. And that, we're hoping, helps people make the rent payments, continue to be able to buy food and get the things their family needs. The county is, uh, has $5 million right now that's going to go toward individual assistance. We're going to add another $5 million to that. That'll get us up to $10 million. I'm anticipating we need, may need to do more. There are programs of housing assistance that are available to people regardless of 
their immigration status. And so county programs you don't have to worry about. And the governor sent us a list of social programs, including housing and other programs that the state has that do not have requirements for documentation. So we have on the website, uh, the COVID-19 website, a list of programs at both the county level and the state level that uh, people are eligible for. We know there's a problem with unemployment because if you're undocumented, you're not eligible for unemployment. Um, that is, I think, a really grave oversight because these people are good enough to work here every day and to, you know, do all the work and take all the jobs that, that they fill in Montgomery County. And then to say that if you're unemployed, you're out of luck, I think, is a little bit cruel. And we think the federal government ought to be willing to step up and treat them like they treat everybody else who's been employed and no longer finds himself with work. And the truth is, helping them, that money's going to wind up going back to Montgomery County business, Montgomery County landlords. It's all part of a package that's going to help us recover. Thank you. Dr. Gales, I am concerned that African Americans and Latinos are disproportionately I don't know how to pronounce that word, testing positive for COVID-19. Why is this happening and what can be done to flatten the curve? Sure. Desproporcionadamente in Spanish. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so that question actually uh, touches on, even though it's not a long question, it touches on a lot of important topics. Uh, and I think it's important for folks to understand at home that we have seen uh, across uh, society, across demographic groups, cases of COVID-19. Where we've seen significant disparities is in terms of the disease course, uh, the fatality rate, and the morbidity associated with COVID-19 in a number of different jurisdictions. We're starting to get more data from the state and gathering that data on a local level to understand how those dynamics play out in our transmission factors. We can speculate, but we don't, can't say definitively that there are a host of factors that may influence transmission. One is the fact that we know that uh, communities of color are disproportionately in jobs that can't telework, don't have the luxury of having administrative leave to be at home and are continuing to have to come out into public uh, and to work and access public transit, those types of things. Uh, and so we are working to be able to translate the messages and the directives in ways that resonate with communities so that folks understand the impact of the different directors, directives in place. Now, when we talk about the differences in outcomes, a lot of that can be framed around, when, you know, for example, when, when Heather mentioned underlying medical conditions, it should not surprise any of us at home that when we look at the information, when we say that if you have diabetes, heart disease, or asthma, you are at increased risk for having a more adverse outcome. The data has shown for decades that black Americans ha and Latino Americans have uh, higher rates of those particular illnesses. Now, I don't want to blame morbidity associated with COVID on them. Instead, I'd like us to pivot to a larger conversation to talk about the social determinants of health that drive that. We should be talking about the systemic policies as it relates to housing, food security, transportation, access to education access to edu uh, employment opportunities, and the impact that all of those factors have on predisposing certain races and communities to having a disproportionately higher number of those underlying conditions, which are setups for unfortunately having um, higher COVID-related uh, illnesses and, and uh, outcomes. So hopefully within this, we will continue to develop short-term strategies to increase testing capacity, and I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to talk about that later, but really have a genuine discussion to talk about these long-standing health disparities that didn't just show up today or didn't show up when COVID came around. They've been present for decades, but talk about the systemic factors and create the systemic change needed to address those issues so that we're not talking about this, God forbid we have a COVID-26 or COVID-35 in the future framed around the same constructs. Thank you, Dr. Gales. Dr. Smith, there are lots of students who have parents that have to go to work or don't speak English so they can help their, ch their children with uh, the assignments. What support does MCPS have in place for those students? Are there tutors or translation services for them available? Yes, uh, among our 166,000 pre-K through 12th grade students, 
we have about 30,000 students who receive uh, English language support and services, ESOL support. And among those students, uh, they of course range from pre-K through 12th grade uh, in terms of the support. And so we have been doing um, a lot of translation for an interpretation for students. We have our ESOL staff members working directly at the elementary level with the teachers of the content areas and doing those online classes. We have many of our paraeducators contacting students uh, and families and talking with them about how we can help them. Uh, whether we're talking about connectivity, digital tools, understanding the lessons, accessing paper lessons in addition to digital or in place of digital. Uh, at the secondary level, many of the ESOL teachers are the direct teacher for the students. And so they are running classes uh, each week and holding office hours each afternoon for the students. Um, so there is a tremendous amount of effort going on around that. But I in no way want to imply that is the same as regular school. It's not. And it's not the same for any of our students, whether they're receiving ESOL services, special ed student services, uh, regular curricular uh, support. Uh, it's a very different environment we're in, and we're continuing to build it out uh, as we go forward and, uh, and learning every day as we go forward about how to better meet the needs of students and families in this very strange circumstance we find ourselves in. As a follow-up question to that, this is another question from a county resident. I am particularly concerned about students who don't have a computer or access to the Internet. Is MCPS still distributing the Chromebooks? Yes, we are. We, uh, as of the end of last week, had distributed about 55,000 Chromebooks. Right now, we're working, and within the next three or four days, we'll distribute another five or 6,000 very targeted uh, Chromebooks where we've reached out to families and said, we've noticed you haven't signed on is our reason why. And so we're working with them both for those digital tools and for the connectivity, whether it's through Xfinity or some other system to make sure they are. And certainly one of the things I hope come, comes out of this whole situation is that we begin to understand that digital tools like Chromebooks and iPads and all of those sorts of things and connectivity in every home, every we have it in every classroom, but that we are able to treat that in the same way we used to treat textbooks. So. We used to, every child used to have textbooks. Now they all need those digital tools and they need that connectivity and that needs to change. And I certainly hope in the next federal stimulus package that's being discussed that they, f they go forward with that plan to help create connectivity and digital tools across this country and including Montgomery County for every child. Thank you. Chief, this question is sort of a follow-up to the first question regarding the stay-at-home order. Uh, we have received a number of questions about undocumented people and what happens if they're stopped during the stay-at-home order. How will this be handled by law enforcement and is it mandatory to carry a letter from employer stating that someone is going to work? So um, as uh, we have here in Montgomery County, um, our policy in dealing with undocumented individuals is that we do not ask questions um, in any police engagement about whether an individual is undocumented. So if an individual is stopped for a traffic violation, for example, that there would be no, the officer would not be asking for any documentation other than the person's driver's license and registration for that vehicle. Um, as it relates to uh, it being mandatory, for anyone to carry uh, paperwork? The answer is no, it's not mandatory. But we do suggest in some cases, um, you know, for example, like uh, individuals who are contractors, uh, maybe for the government or for essential uh, services that, uh, that uh, the governor has noted um, in his order, we do suggest that um, that uh, the, the business owner or the business provide a letter that an individual could carry um, in their vehicle and present to a law enforcement officer should they, uh, should they be stopped to provide uh, proof that they are essential in their duties. Thank you. County Executive, you mentioned uh, during your opening remarks about the public health emergency grant <coughs> that the county is offering and the fact that the application opened online yesterday. Now, I have heard, this is another uh, question, 
that the federal government, the state of Maryland, and the county are all offering help. Is there any coordination between the application processes for these funds, and can I get money from all three? So theoretically, you can get money from all three, except the state program is now closed. Um, the payroll protection program, which is one of the federal programs, I heard ran out of money today. So that program will be closed unless the federal government puts more money back into the program. Uh, the SBA grants appear to still be viable, and the SBA grants offer long-term loans, and they offer them at a, at a relatively low interest rate. And that has, uh, I think a lot of people have applied for them because of the long-term nature of the loan. I know from talking to business people, they are very worried about um, getting assistance and then discovering that the loans were going to be one or two year loans and they'd be forced to pay them back very quickly because most businesses don't have the kind of margins that would let them pay back for all the losses they had in the this, in this space of a year or two. So the federal program with SBA, I believe, is still open. Our program um, maximizes grants at $75,000. There are a thousand businesses that will get anywhere well, anywhere from as little as they ask for um, up to $75,000. Um, we are immediately processing everybody's request, whether it was for $2,000 or $75,000, and sending out 10000 up to $10,000 checks. And for the ones that were above $75,000, we're also reviewing them. Um, and they will be getting additional money as soon as the reviews are complete. We anticipate the, that one check will follow another pretty quickly. And we also recognize that in the county with tens of thousands of small businesses, depending how you count them, but many, many small businesses, more than 30,000, well more, um, a thousand businesses is just a fraction, which is why we've talked from the beginning about um, the importance of people applying for the federal programs. We knew that the limits of the federal programs, though there are limits, were broader than what we could possibly do in the county. And we didn't want people thinking that the county was going to be the only salvation. I mean, I, I know a couple of businesses who alone two months worth of lost rent would have been more than $75,000 or having to pay two months of rent with no income. Uh, so we've always tried to message that it's important that you apply. Um, it's not a mandatory condition of getting money from the county, but I think that it's a wise decision to apply for additional funds if you know that our limited funds won't cover your entire needs. Thank you, County Executive. Dr. Gales, I have read that the state is not providing information on COVID-19 cases by zip code. In the count, is the county providing that information as well? Yes. So if you go to the county website, uh, we actually have a link to the state website that now makes provisions so that you can follow along and see the number of cases by zip code uh, that was released, or at least the first introduction to the zip codes was released on Sunday. Um, and since that time, that information has been made available. So if you go to the county COVID-19 website, you can access the state map there and look to see how many cases are in your zip code. One thing that I will caution you and what we have tried to, the message we put out this week, is looking at cases in the context of the population. So for example, in the tweet that the governor released on Sunday, it mentioned that there were three zip codes in the Silver Spring area that were in the top five in the state in terms of number of cases. Well, when you take that into context to the fact that each of each, all three of them have nearly 50,000 or above in terms of population, it starts to give greater context. So for example, two, zip code 20906 has over 70,000 residents. And so when you talk about 150 cases in the context of 70,000 residents, the percentage of residents involved is like 0.2%. Compare that, you shift to other zip codes where that may be more impactful based upon the number of residents there. Now certainly any case of COVID-19 is concerning and alarming, but I just want to put that into context for folks when they go looking at the zip codes to try to mitigate some of the anxiety that they may have based upon the raw numbers. 
Let's talk about the big question, which continues to be testing. Where can I get tested? Why aren't there more? When will testing facilities be additional ones opening in the county? Sure, so this is, as we mentioned, we, we're pretty sure we get the question tonight about testing. Uh, so the testing remains based upon individuals who meet certain criteria, um, including whether they are symptomatic, uh, or they have histories concerning for coming into contact with individuals who are known cases of COVID-19 or highly suspicious cases of COVID-19. And so testing to this date has been tied to receiving a provider referral of some sort and either getting it directly in a hospital setting, an emergency room, a primary care office, an urgent care, or utilizing a provider referral. Now, over the last several weeks, we have seen other non-traditional, non-clinical sites come online to be able to provide those services, such as our vehicle emissions program site at White Oak. We've now conducted two weeks of testing uh, where we have tested over 200 individuals across the county who've utilized that space. We recognize, and this actually gets to one of the earlier questions related to uh, disparities in outcomes by race. We recognize that even though we see high numbers of cases pop up in communities of color, we know that we haven't tested everybody. And so we don't have a real sense of what the true burden and impact of COVID-19 is in communities because we know we need to test more folks. And we recognize that access to a provider, whether that's to a primary care provider to get that service rendered directly in their office space, or access to a provider to provide that referral to one of those other sites is limited. So what we're working on, and we're not ready 100% to announce it all together, all the details, but what we've been working on is creating an alternative source that can get people, uh, residents of the county, linked to a provider to be able to triage their symptoms, determine if they meet that criteria, and provide them with a referral to either our deep testing site or a couple of other sites that we hope to bring on live next week to provide additional resources. So that will be live next week. That is the plan. That is the plan. That's what we're working on. <laughs> uh, Heather, this is sort of a follow-up. You mentioned earlier the SNAP program. Mm -hmm. How do I access SNAP benefits or other special benefits during the pandemic? Who is eligible and how do I apply? And once again, are undocumented people eligible for any food or meal programs? I think you touched on that previously. Yes, thank you so much. It's very important to be talking about SNAP because there are some special benefits um, that are specific to this time. Um, so just to um, clarify, so SNAP, also sometimes referred to as food stamps, is a federally funded supplement for food purchases. And there are a variety of factors that determine whether or not an individual or a household is eligible, um, but it's primarily based on monthly income. Um, in addition to U.S. citizens, most documented immigrants who have lived in the country for five years or more and or received disability-related assistance are SNAP eligible. Children who are 18 and under who were born in the U.S. are eligible, even if their parents are not. And it's important to note that Montgomery County, um, when compared to all the counties in the state of Maryland, has the lowest enrollment of those residents who are eligible for SNAP, um, but not currently enrolled. So we have a lot of um, work to do to take advantage of these resources um, for those who are eligible. Um, there have been some um, specifics, uh, uh, changes to the program. Uh, there is a temporary suspension of the able-bodied adult without dependence restrictions, and SNAP recertifications have been waived for the next six months. Um, so those are specific to our current times. Um, to apply, typically uh, you could go to an in-person um, site that's run by the county. Those are currently closed, but you can still call the Department of Health and Human Services to request an appointment to get support uh, to enroll or to determine if you're eligible. And so that's, uh, you can call 240-777-1003. I also wanted to share a little information about some of the specific uh, relief package as aspects of SNAP. Um, so specific to COVID-19, an estimated 50,000 SNAP recipients in Montgomery County will receive the SNAP emergency allotment. And so what that means is no matter what uh, minimum benefit you are currently receiving, for example, in a household of one person, that's $15 a month, you will then receive the maximum um, benefit for that month um, for your household size. So that person who is receiving $15 a month can now receive $194 a month. For a household with four people, 
people, that's $646 per month. That's just for the months of April and May, and there's nothing special that needs to be done if you're already enrolled in SNAP to take advantage of those resources. Um, there's also another benefit um, called Pandemic EBT, um, and what that will do is provide debit cards to the families of students that rely on free or reduced price meals um, that can be used at grocery stores to purchase the food that the family needs while schools are closed. Each student will receive about $100 per month, and so that's estimated to be equivalent to the cost of breakfast and lunch. So students whose families are already enrolled in SNAP can have that PEBT benefit applied to their existing SNAP card. Students that are eligible for free and reduced right meals but aren't enrolled in SNAP will need to be contacted and issued a special card. Um, and so again, you can call that number 240-777-1003. Um, and if you aren't eligible for SNAP, um, there are many other resources through our amazing food assistance provider network in the county um, that can provide additional support. Thank you, Heather. Uh, County Executive, now that the PPE have become so important for people and workers to have in public, what has the county been doing to procure PPEs for county workers and others? Uh, we've been trying to buy as much of it as we can get without limit. You know, I, I made a point of saying we're not thinking about buying for a two-week timeline or a four-week timeline. We are just buying. That's what we're in the market for. Uh, the state also has said they're expecting a large shipment of PPEs. But, you know, the governor said that we're told about these large shipments, but then when they actually come in, they're not. Um, we're hoping that this is actually a large shipment and that allocation will come to us and it would be a pretty significant allocation. Um, but that's not going to relax our efforts because we know that we'll go through this. It's not possible not to not go through it. So we're going to continue to buy even as we get cooperation from the state and even with our own successes here. Um, there are some local people who are doing masks, which is great. There are folks who, um, some of the distilleries that stepped up and turned the alcohol production into sanitizer production, uh, we're buying that. Um, we are we're dealing with a range of vendors we've never dealt with before. And it does require a lot of due diligence because a lot of the offers that come in are not from people that are on the normal vendor list. But when you can't find anything, you start looking at things, anybody who's offering it to you, because the important thing is to try to get these supplies here. And uh, we're paying a lot more than what the old face value of these things used to be in some cases, but that's the reality of the market. Unfortunate, but it is the reality of the market. Dr. Smith, I have heard about Zoom bombing and online safety. What is NCPS doing to protect students online now? Yes, yeah, so that's a, once again, a national conversation around so many students on, on digital uh, platforms right now. Uh, NCPS does use Zoom. Uh, after the governor announced on March 25th that students would not return to school at the end of the two-week emergency closure, we swung into action and uh, got involved with Zoom. And we've been able uh, for the past uh, two weeks to have a secure Zoom system where if you don't log in with an MCPS login, you can't get in the class. So we've essentially eliminated Zoom bombing from our uh, experience. And I watch this closely. Uh, and uh, we've also been able to put in some features working with the, the company that teachers have a default waiting room. So everybody waits to come in and then the teacher can see if the student who's trying to come in is a student that belongs in that class or uh, a hacker out there in the digital universe who just hacks into platforms. Uh, this has happened for major corporations, for universities, for all sorts of people, but we've been able to eliminate it by having a restricted system, having waiting rooms, giving the teacher control over the muting function, the student uh, having the full class function so the teacher has to give me the ability to talk to my whole class or demonstrate something or show something. We've disabled the private chat so students cannot be talking just to one other student in the class while it's going on because that can be uh, difficult if students uh, act in an unkind or inappropriate manner toward one another. 
And we've also uh, really pushed on Zoom around student data privacy and gotten assurances from them about the data that might be available uh, for students. So it's, it's a national problem, uh, it's a state problem, it's a local problem, but we are uh, feeling positive about the steps we've taken to make sure that our students are safe and they're in an environment that is conducive to learning and uh, appropriate for them. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Chief, a number of people in the Asian community have raised concerns about discrimination uh, from the very beginning of the COVID-19 crisis. What do you want to say to them and the residents in this county? So, yes, I think that's a, a very um, important issue. Uh, we have shared with the Asian community um, our concerns um, in regards to um, any events that may be occurring to them that are incurring in such a way that um, it is a biased or, or hate, hateful type of incident. Um, to this date, we've, we have two um, reported incidents um, from the Asian community in relation to the COVID uh, crisis that we've been going through over the past few months. Um, what I have stated and I will continue to state to the Asian community is that if these events are occurring, we are highly encouraging you to contact the police department so that we can investigate. We investigate all hate crimes and bias incidents in Montgomery County, um, particularly based upon race, but on a, ver a variety of other types of issues, um, such as uh, uh, race, religion, um, sexual orientation, gender, um, and beyond. So, but it's vitally important. The only way that we know that these are occurring is that we must be notified um, that these events have occurred. We will document um, these events. We, um, we make sure we investigate and follow up um, to make sure that these individuals who are responsible um, are held if they committed a crime. Um, we are pursuing criminal charges against anyone who commits a hate crime against anyone in our community. So again, we take these very seriously. Thank you, Chief. County Executive, what is the county doing to assist the homeless population? Well, we're continuing and expanding our programs. You know, Montgomery County, unfortunately, has had a historic policy of not housing the homeless, I think, after March until November. So we've kind of been absent from that field for many people. And uh, as a result of this, the shelter that we had to use as an emergency shelter when the other shelter failed in the fall because of um, issues with the landfill, um, we stood up a shelter on Taft Court. We are now opening up other shelter spaces so that we can provide social distancing space. Um, the rooms are to anybody who's been in the shelter knows people are too close together. So we are using these other facilities to house some of the homeless so we can create more space between people in their beds and they can have the opportunity to walk around and socialize without necessarily being in close proximity to each other. We've provided people with equipment that, that they need and we continue to, um, I believe it's both people who are vulnerable and people who are in quarantine, who we've provided hotel rooms for. So people most, most at risk are the people in the midst of this. Um, if they're not in the hospital, we've got them in a, in a hotel room, recovering if I'm saying that right, and Travis, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we're trying to make sure that we can isolate um, the homeless population in general from people who get infected within that population and that their circumstances allow for the kind of spacing that we're asking everybody else to maintain. Thank you, Chief. Um, have you seen cases uh, among the homeless population, Dr. Gales? Ah, uh, yes, there have been at, at least one or, one or two, yes. Okay. I keep hearing about searches coming very soon to Maryland and DC. What is a search and are the county hospitals ready? So before I answer that question, I want to pivot back to the testing question because I want to clarify a couple of things for folks at home. The reason why testing is important is because there's three core fundamentals to pandemic management. 
early testing, early quarantine, and early treatment. We don't have treatment for COVID-19 at this point, but we do know that if we can get people to know their COVID-19 status early and get them diagnosed early, we can make sure that they are quarantining and isolating appropriately, cutting down on their potential risk of exposing others. And we know that for a lot of different reasons, if people don't have access to a provider, have mistrust in going to the health, health uh, systems, for a number of reasons, there may be individuals who are less likely to seek those sources and get access to those sources to be able to test and know their status and may unknowingly come into contact and transmit to other folks. So that's why we are emphasizing increasing testing capacity to get folks to know their status early on in the diagnosis period to cut down on the risk of transmitting to others. Now, as it relates to surge capacity, or not really surge capacity, but to your question about surge capacity, <coughs> So when we talk about surge, that means that there is a significant increase in the number of cases. And when we talk about surging in hospitals, that means there's an increase in cases, but a correlating increase in the number of people requiring hospitalization. So if you can imagine, going back to one of the first things I mentioned, we follow the number of the percentage of people hospitalized. So let's say overnight we see 500 new cases and 25% of those are requiring hospitalization. So that's 125 folks. So you can imagine if that number increases every day over a sustained period, there's a lot of people who are going to require hospitalization. And so they're going to need somewhere to go. And so as part of surge planning, we work with the hospitals to identify and make sure that we have enough bed space, staffing, equipment, critical care, and all of those types of services to be able to absorb if we do, not if, but when we see that number increase. Now, the challenge is, is to know when a true surge happens, it takes multiple data points. So for example, last week, there was a day where we had been going along averaging around for the state about five to 600 cases a day. There was a dip, dropped down to I think it was 325. So there were some folks celebrating and saying, we finally got it, we've reached our peak, we're done. Those of us in public health took a, sigh, a, brief, uh, a deep breath to say, let's see. The next day we had a thousand cases. And so to really know what the true surge is, again, it's going to be sustained over a couple of days at least. Uh, we are preparing for that surge to happen right now through the end of the month. There are different models that predict our peak could happen as early as this weekend to as late as early May. The reality is we don't know for sure. We're continuing to plan to make sure that we have the resources to meet the needs on a daily basis. And so I, as to, to your point in terms of hospitals being ready, uh, we are, have not reached capacity in terms of bed space. So we have room to absorb as those numbers increase. We monitor those number on, numbers on a daily basis. So we've got bed space. Now we do uh, wanna make sure that we have enough equipment to provide critical care services. So it's not just the question of how many beds do you have available, but what's the percentage of the beds? So for example, on an average, Get any given day in a non-COVID setting, uh, most hospitals have about 12% of their beds utilized for intensive care and critical care services. The expectation in a pandemic is that you should have approximately 25% of your beds and equipment to be able to uh, provide those services. The hospitals have been working diligently on their individual plans, their systems plans, as well as coming together as a collective unit to do countywide surge planning. And so I feel comfortable and confident that we have the, uh, the services and supplies to meet the need of our, needs of our residents today. But we continue to plan in the background, as the county executive mentioned, getting more equipment, uh, making sure that we have adequate staff so that when that number does increase and the surge is realized, we're not caught flat-footed. We can respond in the present and meet the needs of our residents. Thank you, Dr. Gales. You explained a whole lot um, in that question, but there's a follow-up on that same question. Is there is the county working with the state, obviously with the hospitals, to make sure that we're ready? Yes. So we uh, have had a series of meetings over the last month uh, with our hospital partners. We've been in constant communication with our partners at the state. In fact, earlier this week, uh, forgive me, the days mixed together. Sometime earlier this week, Monday or Tuesday, we had a call uh, with the uh, leaders of the, the state hospital surge task force 
to talk through the plans that our individual hospitals have submitted uh, and discussed and walk through those, discussed what services and resources the state could provide, uh, and discussed other strategies which we will be announcing most likely in the near future as to some of the specifics of that plan. For example, uh, for those who are familiar with the uh, Adventist Hospital that's in Tacoma Park, uh, we've been working with colleagues at the state and the Corps of Engineers to discuss plans to be able to uh, get the, the, the majority of the hospital ready. Uh, they continue to operate a number of services there and have already started to absorb some of the um, lower acuity, non-COVID patients, to be able to free up space in their tertiary care centers at White Oak and Shady Grove. Thank you. Um, Heather, about food services and meals, um, there are a lot of seniors in Montgomery County and many are at home. They cannot move. Are there services uh, for them? Absolutely. Uh, and so it's important to remember that even before COVID-19, there were a lot of food access challenges for our seniors in the county. Uh, and so there's a lot of issues related to social isolation um, and inability to get to a retail opportunity for grocery stores. Um, and so, like Dr. Smith shared, our school system is running an amazing program um, feeding children and our senior nutrition program in the county is uh, doing a fantastic job as well of administering um, a meal program for seniors. So previously there had been a senior congregate meal program uh, where there were meal sites that were offering lunch to seniors every day. Um, obviously in times of social distancing, this is um, a program that's been discontinued for the time. Uh, so instead they're offering a grab and grow program instead. Uh, and so any eligible person, so who's 60 or over, um, can has the option to pick up seven frozen meals um, each week at one of the senior uh, rec centers. So they don't need to be an established participant in any of these programs. Um, rather, um, any senior can, can call up and, and get registered to receive those, those resources. Uh, deliveries are currently being made to two locations, uh, Damascus and Holiday Park. 